I'm going to talk about the focus of our course, Mastering Python for Beginners in Data Science. So let me explain uh, what kind of areas in this particular course we are focusing the most. Um, in fact, because this is a course for beginners, that's a beginner level course, we are not assuming the, the course taker to have any experience whatsoever about any computer programming language before. Not even, not even the prob problem solving paradigm that lies in computer science. So uh, we, will, we will focus on problem solving for a bit and we will actually start from the very beginning what problem solving is, particularly in computer science. Um, the second focus of this particular course is mainly uh, telling you why we are choosing Python, why Python is so important, um, particularly for data science problems. The third focus and the main core focus is to learn Python, obviously. Uh, once we know what is uh, what, what are the techniques uh, to solve a problem, and once we know that the Python might be a very good language to, to go with, then what is Python? How to learn it? Well, the Python is the main core and main focus of this course. Obviously, we will start from the very beginning, very, very beginning, which means we will start from how to install Python. For example, we will start from there. And then we will see what are variables. I mean, very, very beginning. And then progressively, we will be moving on and on and on to data structures, to complex structures. But that transition from zero to onwards, that transition will be very, very smooth. I mean, whatever you know so far in the course, that will be helping you to gain more complex structures very, very easily, gaining the understanding of a lot of structures very, very easily. So in, in this Python, we will include all concepts of Python in general. Um, and and uh, one more thing, um, after, I mean, learning this Python, the way we, dis way we organize this course, after learning this Python, um, you will be having understanding of other languages as well. I mean, the contents here are explained in so general way, although with the Python syntax, but the, gen but, but, but the concepts are expressed in so general way, the problems that we pick to solve for practice are so generic that you will, after this particular Python course, you will be having understanding of programming languages in general. So data science is one other focus of this uh, course. Actually, the whole course is organized in a way that um, it, 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 it teaches you about Python, it teaches you problem solving, it teaches you something about overall programming languages and how computer can be used to achieve the solution of different problems and, and using Python, of course. And then uh, we will be introducing the data science packages that are available in Python because they are really, really fast, really fundamental, very easy to use, and very, very powerful to handle large amount of data very quickly for data understanding, for visualization, for cleaning, processing, and a lot of stuff. What we are not focusing at, because that's important, uh, knowing that what kind of things are, 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 are the things that we're not covering. For example, we're not covering OOP, object-oriented programming. Uh, we're not covering exception handling. We're not doing web development or any general kind of uh, tasks that are doable in Python. We are not focusing on those things. Everybody solves different problems every day. Some problems are easy to solve and some are difficult and yet some are impossible to solve. They are called unsolvable problems. But think about different instances of the same problem one needs to solve again and again. For example, um, sorting the sale records. And, and, and let's say uh, we are sorting the sale records with respect to the sale value, and we have to do it after every eight hours. If the number of instances if, if that number is huge, the optimal choice is to automate the solution if, if the automation is possible. But how? How to come up with the automated solution? To come up with a general solution that works for every instance of some problem, that is one thing. But to get that solution running on a computer is yet another thing. 
problem solving deals with formalizing a general solution for that works for every instance and programming languages like python deals with the running of that solution on a computer python as um, as we will see makes the transition from problem solving to the running solution much easier and quicker and that's one big plus of python um a lot of words i know a lot of words um let let me take an example to clarify what i said hold on till the end of this video and i will make everything what i said so far crystal clear so let's take an example let's dive into an example to see what i just said let's say you are a and your friend is b and your friend b is always willing to help you uh, let's say you found such a friend um and then um, a just said i want off just for some days but b said but what go buddy enjoy a said someone have to do my job in my absence and then b said that's it is that your problem i'm available as always go buddy enjoy then a said great you are a true friend okay i'm leaving wow and b just said hey wait what do i have to do what's your job at the end of the day i'm going to do your job what's your job what do you do and then a said after every 8 hours uh, pick the email of the customer with the maximum sales so that's what you have to do b said okay but from where i mean i have to pick that email of the customer from where where are the records a said oh there are sales records i mean at the job place there are sales records and you have to pick the email of the customer with maximum sales b said oh okay but wait what what should i do with the email that i just picked then a said oh there is another uh, record called priority records just write that email after 8 hours just write that email in priority records and then b said that's it that's all your job and a said after so relaxed a said yes that's my job that's all now think um a leaves and later that day receives a call from b and b said i don't really know what to do can you tell me step by step what to do focus on again i i'm reading this particular uh, sentence again can you tell me step by step what to do i have sales records with me having all the records for the last 8 hours what to do I, i just messed everything up i don't know what to do and then at the call a just described a procedure to be for his job that procedure or or a general solution let's see the solution a said number 1 start from the first record there may be several columns of the record the customer name the customer phone number the customer email the customer products that he buy and the total sales and the and the point one said a said start from the first record and focus just on the sales column okay then then after that go to each next record one by one and find the record with the maximum sales obviously once you have uh, focused on the sales column you are just comparing sales of different records with each other and will eventually come up with a record that have maximum sales number 3 if there are more than one records with maximum sales it is possible that the maximum sale value let's say is 100 whatever the units are and there may be two or three or maybe five records with the maximum sales 100 then which one to pick a just described here in step 3 that if there are more than one records with maximum sales then pick the first one from top to bottom 
and ignore the rest. I mean, whichever is the, so, so let's say you have five records with maximum sale value. Which record appears first from top to down? Just pick that one and ignore the rest. That might be a policy, that might, might be a tie-breaking policy, but just do that. And then the fourth step is, focus on the email column of the record you found in step three. In step three, you found a column with maximum sales. Step five, see the email address and write that address in the priority records. So that's for the eight hours. Then repeat this, see the step six, then repeat this procedure after every eight hours. I mean, repeat this procedure. I mean, you see the the, the solution A is communicating to B in in this in these kind of steps. It it gives it gives a precise idea of what to do. Still, there may be some there may be some questions that that B is maybe asking. For example, B may ask how to find out a maximum. B might be that person who don't know how to find out the maximum. And third, um, for example, another question B might, may ask is that when when I'm going to write the email address in the priority doc records, where should I write? At the very top or at the end or, or somewhere? Or, But at the end of the day, a solution, a step-by-step -step solution is required for communication. This kind of, if you see the solution, although it has some, it may be explained in, it, there may be, more steps that should be added. But if you see the solution, this step-by-step -step solution, this is general solution. This is general solution, much more general solution for every instance. By every instance, I mean, after every eight hours, you'll be having some records and you have to do this procedure on the records for that eight hours. And then after that, that after that eight hours, you will be having more records to work on. So after every eight hours, you have the same, the problem is the same, but the instance is different because the records after eight hours are different. But but the but the solution says whatever the instance you are right right now, whatever the instance is that you are in, just perform these these steps. A step by step solution, coming up with a step by step solution, um, is is kind of one module of the one module of the problem solving. And this step-by-step -step solution is called algorithm. Algorithm. Obviously, um, this step-by-step -step solution is not always required to be communicated in plain English or in natural language. You may come up with shorthands or shortcuts to explain these step-by-step uh, -step solution. So the the, the more shortcuts, the more precise and um, unique meaning keywords you use in your step-by-step -step solution, the more better communication of your solution takes place. And going from this step-by-step -step solution, which is just in plain English, going from this to a more concise and unique kind of um, procedure that 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 kind of one that one step that will take us from there to there that we will see in the next video will be called a pseudocode and from that pseudocode there will be a few steps that will take us to the second uh, major problem that the pro problem languages will solve the get the solution running on a computer so um just just in this video i i, I wanted to explain you that Solving a problem may not be that hard. I mean, coming up with a coming with coming up with a solution of a problem may not be that hard, but communicating that solution, or or writing that solution in a form of procedure that can solve every instance of that problem, that that requires a step by step treatment of the procedure, and those those steps they should be linked in a sequence, and they should be unambiguous. And if a particular step requires more elaboration, that step might be broken down to further steps. But that step-by-step -step solution at the end of the day is called algorithm. Now, that algorithm might be in English, but um, we will see in the later video uh, that uh, there are better ways of expressing algorithms 
better than English or better than natural languages. So, um, so if you have another problem, come up with a step-by-step -step solution of that. The, every instance of that problem should be solved by that step-by-step -step solution, which is called algorithm. And in the next video, we will see how to actually um, how to actually eliminate the need of having English with us and uh, how to incorporate the uniqueness of understanding of these steps or algorithm uh, using, using the concepts of pseudocode. And after the pseudocodes, we will see it will be very quick to, to jump to any programming language. And we will see that the Python is very close to what human generally think i mean it's very easy the transition will be very very easy so hope to see you in the next video and um, i'll be explaining algorithms in 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 a in a more kind of uh, keyword way and and in the same video we'll be focusing on pseudocodes um, which are basically a, a pre-step of of the actual code of in any programming language um, so hope to see you in the next video. Okay, in, in the last video, we were talking about the algorithm, what an algorithm is and how to express that any, any algorithm. And we saw that algorithm is just a step-by-step -step procedure, um, but, but how to express an algorithm may vary. I mean, you need not always to have uh, plain English to or, or any natural language to express algorithm. The reason uh, is that the natural languages are normally so expressive and each and every sentence, they may have multiple meaning. So it is, it is a good idea to come up with a structured way to express an algorithm such that each and every statement is completely unambiguous. And one such way is, is to express algorithms using flowcharts. Flowcharts are, are graphical ways of expressing algorithms. Here we are taking, um, the, the problem here we are discussing is, uh, is computing pay of different employees of some company. And the procedure of, I mean, if there are several employees, let's say employee one, employee two, employee three, um, and so on, let's say there are several employees in a company and having each employee has name, um, phone number, email, and, and all the credentials. And then uh, let's say the pay is computed uh, on hourly basis and each employee has worked certain hours, for example, eight hours, and each employee has an hourly rate, might be let's say 100 units, whatever the units are. Employee two might have worked, for example, seven hours, uh, but the hourly rate of this employee might be 200. Um, different employees, they m might have worked for a different number of hours and each employee can have a different hourly rate depending upon the capacity of the employee or the or the job nature the employee is doing and so on. So, um, so, so if we want to compute pay of all the employees one by one, the procedure of computing pay is stays the same. The instances they differ. For employee one, the value of hour is eight, the value of rate is 100. For employee two, the procedure will stay the same. The, the values of hour and rate, they will differ. So what should be the procedure? The procedure might be that you take the, take the input of, let's say, employee one or whatever employee you are going to compute salary for, take the hours, hours value um, in, in, a, in a placeholder, call, that placeholder, call that placeholder as hours. A placeholder or a variable. Why this is called a variable? Because for different employees, this value will different, will be different. Hours will take value eight for E1, employee one. This, this variable, this placeholder will take value seven for employee two and, and so on. Similarly, once whatever employee, whatever employee for which you are going to compute the pay, if you have taken the hours from some uh, records, from some uh, working records, then take the rate for the same employee as well. So input this, that's step one. Input two, that is step two. The steps, the sequence of these two steps may change. For example, you take the, uh, the, you take the rate value first and the hours value later than that. But either way, that's one way of, that's one way of um, expressing this, this procedure. And then um, you compute the pay by this formula. Uh, so hours multiplied by rate. 
So maybe this is confusing, writing a star. Maybe, maybe we should write this cross symbol because that is more common in mathematics. Or maybe this whole line can be replaced by, by this particular line, maybe. So pay is equal to multiply uh, hours and rate. Maybe this is more expressive, but it completely depends. I mean, when you start writing pseudocode or whatever pseudocodes you're writing, what kind of keywords, begin is a keyword, end is a keyword, what kind of keywords you're using? and stay with those keywords. For example, if the keyword input is to use to take, uh, to get the values to, to process on, then input should stay everywhere wherever we want to do such kind of operation. If, you, if you're using, for example, the value get rather than input, then use get always, but come up with some set of keywords that are expressive as well as concise and then take the sequence of those uh, statements. Each and every statement should be, should have a unique meaning. It should not be ambiguous. And the sequence should be in a, the sequence describe the flow of what is happening, what is going on. So first we take hours, then we take rate, these two values for, for, a, for any kind of employee. And then we will just multiply them. And after multiplication, whatever decision we want to make based on this pay, we will do that. We may, um, we may record this value, uh, this pay value at, at some other records register. We may, uh, we may print that value on a print slip. We may have emailed this value to some other department, whatever decision we want to make. But the procedure really is still here. Then based on pay, whatever action we are going to do, that, that may differ. Similarly, if, if we go, this is, this is, I mean, some kind of structured example of, of the, of the expressiveness of an algorithm, which is called a pseudocode and what kind of keywords you're going to use. There are no general keywords. I mean, um, uh, uh, some people may use get, some people may use a different kind of keywords for it, but it is good to come up with a set of keywords to, to describe the, describe the solution of the solution of the problem in flowchart for example um, everything every uh, every uh, statement here that is here in uh, in pseudocode every statement is described as a shape different shapes for different kind of statements if you want to take input then you have to describe that action using a parallelogram if you are going to do some computation you have to express that using a rectangle um, the start symbol and end symbol, the start and end of any procedure in flowcharts, they are described by the ovals, for example, this oval and that oval. Normally the flowchart sequence is from top to down, but it is always good to just uh, print the arrows to describe uh, the, the flow because in complicated flowcharts, there are, uh, there are loops, there are if conditions, there are so many things. So it is good always to describe the flow using using arrows. So now the question is um, flowchart or pseudocode because uh, flowchart also looks like a um, very cool way of writing, um, expressing an algorithm and pseudocode is also a way of expressing an algorithm. Well, converting flowchart to actual programming code is somewhat tedious. Writing a pseudocode beforehand, which is readable, which is precise, concise, as well as unambiguous, then converting that pseudocode to code of any programming language, that is not that hard, that is simple. And writing flowcharts for very complicated problems is somewhat tedious because then it, it also requires another transition from flowchart to the actual programming code. Um, that's why writing pseudocode is more feasible if the goal eventually is to convert that pseudocode to some code of programming language. So um, you can go with flowchart, you can go with pseudocode, either one is fine, but a uh, more feasible way of expressing algorithms is, is pseudocode. Um, th that was just a very simple example. I mean, computing, computing salary of an employer, writing a procedure for that. Um, 
I mean, this is so simple. Nobody may care uh, writing that kind of uh, writing solution of this kind of problem as a, as an algorithm or as a pseudocode or as a flowchart. But the basic idea is 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 the same. Even if you have a complicated problem, if you even if you have a problem with uh, maybe many more steps, the the idea is still the same. In the in in the next video, we we will we will see uh, a procedure how to how to make tea, for example. Um, that might that may look look to you funny. I mean, do we really want do we really want to know the procedure to make tea? Well, the idea is not to learn how to make tea. The idea is to learn how to express the solution of this problem. Making tea that's a problem. The solution of this, how to how to express solution of that problem, as as a pseudocode, and we will see one more example of flowchart as well. So hope to see you in the next video. Okay, um, in the last video we saw flowcharts and um, pseudocode. We just took an example of uh, we took a very simple example computing salary or pay of employee of a company given hours and rate. And I also described whether flow, the, the comparison between flowchart and pseudocode. And I said that pseudocode is closer to the code of some programming language, which eventually we need. Because eventually we need uh, automation of a, of a solution of a problem. And for that, we need a code of the, the, the code for the solution, the general solution in some programming language. So flowchart and pseudocode and then the code of some programming language like Python. It is somehow um, and sometimes handy to to break the problem or to devise the general solution of any problem for in first step in a flowchart because that is uh, more expressive uh, and more generic, more general, maybe in a graphical way. And then once the proof of concept is clear, once it is clear that this is indeed a general solution, it has no bugs inside, it has no errors, it will work always, then we can take another step to convert that flowchart to pseudocode, and then pseudocode can be converted to uh, the, the code of any, the code in some programming language. But writing pseudocode um, right away, I mean, from the very beginning without flowcharts is also a common practice. Either way, whichever way uh, suits you. Uh, in this particular um, video, I'm going to talk about a problem. The problem is making T. Um, you might be thinking, what are the different instances of this problem? I mean, making T is making T. Um, what, what kind of different instances are there? Well, uh, one person may be liking T with for example, 1.5 uh, units of sugar, whatever the units are. And another person may want a tea with, let's say, um, two units of sugar. One person may be, uh, may be needing a tea with, for example, 0.5 units of milk. And another one may be a different units of milk and so on. So the, the procedure of making tea should stay same. And the instances, which means the different people want T in a different kind of combination, that may vary. So let's, let's, li let's see a procedure first in flowchart and then in, in pseudocode for, for making a T, for making T. So let's start, that, that might look like, to, uh, that might look, you, look to you a kind of funny kind of uh, problem, but uh, that, that's a genuine problem. For example, if you want to make T, what is uh, algorithm for this? So first we start and then the first step we do is we put tea bag in a cup. That might be a first step. Um, you can argue, should this be a first step? Should that be a, the second step and so on? This, the sequence of, by the way, solving one problem, you can have multiple algorithms for that. And two different algorithms may just vary because of the sequence of statements, even if you have the same statements. So I'm not talking about that the algorithm or the general solution is unique. You can have multiple different general solutions or procedures. Um, so for example, putting a tea bag in a cup, that might be first step, or the first step might be the boiled boil the water and pour the water in, pour the water in, in the cup and then put the tea bag. Both are fine, I mean this way or that way. 
Um, so let's start with putting a tea bag in a cup. So that's an that's an input. We take a tea bag from somewhere. That's our input. Uh, last time I told you that input is taken as parallelograms. Um, put a tea bag in a cup and then um, um, forget about that cup and boil the water. Somewhere there is a water. I mean, take the water from somewhere and boil it. And see uh, if uh, after let's say five or six or seven time units, whatever the time units are, see if the water is boiled or not. Assume that there is a test that tells you that the water is boiled or not. So there is a test available to you. So you apply that test and check that the water is boiled or not. If it is not boiled, then keep on boiling. So boil it again. Um, and assume there is a procedure of boiling a water. In, in, in normal case, boiling water is just happened by, uh, I mean, keeping the temperature high or um, putting that thing, putting the pot of water on, on fire or something like so. But that, that itself is a procedure. So um, boil the water again and uh, boil the water again. Check if the water is boiled. If no, then boil it again. If n boil again, then check. If no, then boil it again. This is called a loop. This is called a loop or repetition. You are doing the same kind of stuff again and again until there is a particular condition that is that is met. So in this case, the condition is when, while the water is not boiled, keep on doing the same procedure again and again. This is called repetition uh, or loop. So you boil the water again, check the condition. If the condition is true, for example, the water boil, yes, then come out. Then, you're, then you can exit this loop and come out. Then pour the water, pour the water in, in the cup. Here we should here we should describe that is that the same cup or a different cup? Well, the C U P cup here is acting as a, a as a placeholder where this tea bag and the water is going in. So we have a cup. We put tea bag in it. Then we put the boiled water in in it. But before uh, pouring the boiled water in it, we just boiled the water. Okay, then after we have uh, water in a cup and a tea bag in a cup, what should we do next? We actually um, uh, we we actually first test want sugar or need more sugar. If yes, then then add sugar. So th let's apply some arrows. If yes, add some add sugar, and then again ask, do you need do you need more sugar? Uh, want sugar now? Yes add sugar want sugar yes add sugar that is again a loop that is again a loop while while the while you want sugar i mean you test that the sugar is okay or not here you test that the sugar is okay or not or whatever sugar you need if is that okay or not uh, until that condition is not met you keep on adding the uh, sugar add a teaspoon again then test at a teaspoon. That is again a loop or repetition. Once the condition is met, want sugar? No. Then exit this loop and ask, want milk? Because some people just take tea without milk. Maybe somebody wants a milk, maybe somebody don't. So want milk? Yes. So add milk? So that's a, that's a mistake. This, this loop should go there. There, right there. And this line shouldn't be there. That's that's wrong. Uh, add milk, and then ask, want milk? Yes. Add milk. That's again a loop. Once you exit the loop, then you ask, need to steer? Yes. Steer. Then ask again. Um, this line again shouldn't be there. Um, so that that's another loop. Once you exit this loop, then the tea is ready. You serve that tea. Finish. You are done with the procedure. Now let's see the same procedure in, in pseudocode. Program is a keyword and that's what program name is. Program make tea. Put is a keyword. Put tea bag in a cup. While water not boiled. While is a keyword. While this is not, uh, while this condition is not satisfied, keep on doing this. Whatever written in while and end while is is the body of this repetition or called loop. So 
while water is not boiled boil water then again check water boiled or not no boil again uh, i mean keep on boiling so this is repetition once the water is boiled which means this condition is becomes false water not boiled becomes false so water boiled then you exit this loop you pour that water in cup that's again a keyword you in a cup and then you ask okay need sugar yes add sugar need sugar yes add sugar so you keep on doing this until um, you don't need sugar anymore so that's again a loop um, so so you might be thinking that why we are writing this add sugar and this boil water uh, to write her to this this uh, wh why we are really indenting this that's a style of pseudocode to just display that this is inside this this is this particular statement or set of statements are called the body of the loop and this end while should be here in this alignment here in this alignment so there is a there is a bug in this slide uh, this should be here okay once this condition is false sugar needed no then you can exit this loop uh, and you go here while milk needed yes add milk check again milk needed yes add milk add milk needed yes add milk once this condition becomes false milk needed no then you can exit this loop you can just go to here while need a steer need to steer steer t need to steer yes steer t need to steer yes steer t once this condition is false get out and your t is ready do whatever you want to do this example was so simple but it expresses a very powerful tool um, in in the pseudocode as well as in flowcharts and that tool is sometimes called loop which is there to repeat a particular procedure whatever procedure you want to repeat again and again um, to until there is a particular condition that is met that is loop loop is there so um, the 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 purpose for of this slide is ju was just to um, just to make you make you convinced and make you comfortable with this pseudocode and and flowchart. Um, we, we will not be talking about flowcharts any further from here on. Um, we, we we will be just talking about pseudocode in just one or two more videos, and then we will be directly going towards from we will be. Uh, we will be comfortable enough with pseudocode uh, for solving certain kind of problems that we will then eventually be moving from pseudocode to actual python code um, and and i bet you i'm going to tell you that uh, the pseudocode in the next video i'm going to explain that will be very very easily will be converted to the actual exact python code so in the next video we are going to actually solve uh, a problem uh, of finding out minimum value from a list of values uh, sometimes called the searching problem we're going to solve it by first using pseudocode and then in a later video we will see how to write the actual python code for that problem so hope to see you in the next video okay um, let's dive into a real problem um, let's say you are given you are given a list of numbers let's say let's say l is some list with numbers let's say uh, we define list by these uh, these square brackets let's say the list contains 23 let's say that's a value minus 4 that's a value 0 that's a value 73 that's a value and maybe maybe minus 10 that's a value maybe 13 that's a value so let's just take an example that we have 1 2 3 4 5 6 um, values in a list so and, and the list uh, is basically we, we took the list here as L and we just uh, described that let's say the list is declared by or expressed by the square brackets and the elements of the list they are separated by comma that is just our convention for this kind of problem for this problem just for this code um and 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 i'm not talking about any particular programming language yet this is just a list of numbers um, and let's say um, we want a procedure that finds out the minimum value of any list well first of all why this problem has multiple instances 
Well, we need to come up with a solution that works for any list. For example, if the list is, if the list has these six values, then the procedure should find out the minimum value in this list. The minimum value in this list out of all the values is minus 10 because minus 10 is smaller than every other value. Um, 23 is bigger, minus 4 is smaller than 23, uh, 0 is bigger than minus 4 because the the value with negative sign, it is smaller um, with the value of a positive sign. But if you have two values with negative signs, the, the value with a bigger number uh, in terms of magnitude is, is actually smaller in negative sense. So if you compare minus 4 and minus 10, minus 10 is smaller uh, in, minus, in minus domain. Uh, in positive domain, the, the result is different. So I was talking about why uh, this problem has multiple instances, why you need a general solution for that. That's a list. Just go and find out the minimum. That is minus 10. Go home. Happy. Well, we need a solution that works for another list another list with different numbers um, and maybe different number of numbers. Maybe in this list we have six numbers. Another list may have 74 numbers. Another list may have one trillion numbers. We want to come up with a procedure that always finds out the minimum value in, in that list. Um, obviously, uh, the minimum value may repeat. Uh, I mean, the minimum value may occur more than once in a list. So what is a minimum value rather than knowing uh, how many times it occur? What is a minimum value? That's a problem, finding out a minimum value. And we want to find out, we want to come up with a procedure that finds out the minimum value regardless of the list. Whatever the list is, this procedure should actually return or end up finding out the minimum value. Um, so in this particular case, again, for, for this particular example, the minimum value is minus 10. And we will take an uh, example of this list and we will see how to code um, a procedure for that. So, but but before starting this procedure, what kind of things uh, we we really need to, 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 to write a pseudo code for this kind of uh, problem? We, we may start by writing that program like in the previous video program name as search and then we take input or input uh, list then we take input uh, the number of values in the list the total number of values and then we move on as as we want to move on but um, writing out a procedure in terms of pseudocode it is always good to to avoid these input statements inside the pseudocode and always supply whatever whatever needed always supply the instance from outside and assume that the instance is supplied and then just work on that instance rather than reading the instance rather than taking the values of instance a particular instance from inside the code it is always a good practice to to, uh, to supply the instance from outside. So supply the list from somewhere and this n is really the size of the list. In this particular case, let's say, if this is the list, then that list will be there, uh, supplied from somewhere. We will see how to supply that. Uh, and this n value here, in this particular case, the n value is six, the total number of values in the list, one, two, three, four, five, and six. These are six values. So it is a good practice to, rather than writing program and then this, just write the name of uh, the problem you are going to solve. In this particular case, the name is search minimum from list. And then this particular, we are talking about this list L with the total number of elements as N. Whatever the values inside the L is, we do not know. Um, uh, and, and this N may take a different value. This L can be different. This N can be different for different instances. But um, uh, it is not a good practice to take input from inside here. Um, then uh, one more convention uh, is that, let's say uh, list of two represents the second element in the list. In this particular case, L of two is basically, L of two is basically the second element in the list, which is minus four. Uh, L of, let's say uh, three, is the third element in this list, which is a zero, um, and so on. So let's let's take a convention that whenever we want to access the elements of the lists, but whenever we want to read the elements from the list, we will read 
the element number by giving the element number here let's say whatever the if you write l of i that means it means the ith element of the list um, so first we take a variable we are assuming here that the list is supplied to us the total number of elements in the list is supplied to us so we first take the minimum value we which we really want to compute the minimum value we want to compute but any list can be supplied in this procedure so what's the procedure the minimum value that we want to compute we just consider the very first value of the list in this case the very first value is 23 we consider that is the minimum value obviously that is wrong this is not minimum value minimum value may be somewhere else or maybe this one may be somewhere else but we are not sure that the first value in the list is the minimum value but let let's just hold on for a moment and move on let's say the minimum value is this here this is called the assignment um, assignment this min value is a placeholder or a variable and I have assigned this value L1 to it. Now, uh, from here onwards, the min value will, will, be, will be having a value which is 23 in this particular case. Okay, so min value is this, which is 23 now. Let's declare, let's declare another variable, which is called counter. We may need this counter. And let's declare this with two. Why we are declaring this with two? It will become clear later on so now we so so min value right now for this particular list the min value takes the value 23 so and counter takes the value 2 these are two things for these two variables now we apply a loop while counter is smaller than n smaller or equal to n remember the value of n for this particular example is 6 and counter here is 2 so because counter has value 2 while 2 is less or equal to 6 first check whether this condition is true or false because if this condition is true then you will go to the body of the loop then this whole box will execute if um, this condition becomes false then you will exit the loop and will go out so now counter is 2 so 2 is smaller or equal to 6 true false that is true so the condition is true. 2 is indeed smaller than or equal to 6 that is true so we will go inside to the box and see what happens then what we will do we will pick and pick a value from at the index counter right now the counter has value 2 L of counter means pick the value because the counter has value 2 pick the second value which is minus 4 and pick that value minus 4 from the list pick that value and copy that value or assign that value to a variable v uh, that's a new variable v may be needed somewhere okay previously the min value which is a variable it was containing the very first value which is 23 now we have picked the second value the counter value is 2 so we have picked the second value from the list which is minus 4 now we compare if the value now which is minus 4 is that value smaller than our minimum value so far the minimum value so far is is 23 so minus 4 is smaller than 23 yes the condition is true if the condition is true we will go into this block otherwise we will go into this block so right now the condition is true so we will go in this block and minimum value will just be replaced by the new value and the new value right now is minus 4 so because a minus 4 is smaller than 23 so we are here in this body the if condition becomes true we are in this body and the minimum value becomes whatever the value is in v and right for this example the value in v is minus 4 okay so if 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 you go into the if condition then you're not going into the else part either you're going to if part or in the else part one of them okay so then we move back oh there's a bug here we, we need to add the counter we need to increment the counter here after after this 
before this there is another statement increment the counter increment counter that's another statement increment counter um, so now increment the counter after this if part increment the counter and the counter will become 3 now we will repeat the procedure and check 3 is smaller than 6 yes we will go inside and we will pick now the counter value is 3 we will go and pick the third entry and now the third entry will be in v the v will now contain 0 previously it contained minus 4 now it will contain 0 min value is containing minus 4 now so 0 is smaller than minus 4 no if 0 is smaller than minus 4 then do this but 0 is not smaller than minus 4 then go to the else part and else part is just saying just go on do nothing I mean don't do anything so when you are here don't do anything exit if condition increment the counter again now you increment the counter the counter value will become 4 and the value at 4 is 73 first of all check 4 is smaller or equal to 6 yes v will contain the value at index 4 which is 73 73 is smaller than minus 4 no do nothing increment the counter check the if condi uh, check the while condition now counter will be 5 5 is smaller or equal to 6 yes pick the fifth entry because counter is fifth the fifth entry is minus 10 minus 10 is smaller than minus 4 yes okay replace min value with the new value now the min value will contain minus 10 okay because if has executed else will not execute you exit the if condition and then you increment the counter the counter will become 6 now 6 is smaller or equal to 6 yes because 6 is equal to 6 hence the condition is true um, now you go and pick the sixth entry which is 13 check 13 is smaller than minus 10 because min value is containing minus 10 so far no that is false go to else condition go to else part just go on do nothing increment the counter now the counter will become 7 and you go back and check the condition 7 is smaller or equal to 6 false exit the loop okay exit the loop go to this condition go to this statement now now you're out of the loop and return the min value and see the min value here is containing the actual min value which is minus 10 so um, that's how we search the minimum this return is also a keyword so um, which means if we if we just if we just if we just use that function if we if we just use that pseudo code with uh, if we just use that pseudo code for this different kind of lists with with its sizes whatever the list this is this was just one example if we change the list uh, the procedure will work uh, one one bug in the in the code was the increment counter statement was not there it should be there after the this end if and before this end while here um, so this that was a pseudo code of searching minimum in the next video we are going to uh, use this pseudo code and we will we will see how to rearrange the values of a list or sort the values of a list such that all the values that are smaller they become earlier than the bigger values and the problem is called sorting so in the in the next video we are going to talk about um, one more problem very famous problem called the sorting problem and after that problem we will be going towards python because um, after that problem you'll be having a fairly good idea how to solve a problem how to write a pseudocode for a problem and the way we are writing the pseudocode is very close to the actual python code which will become so clear to you so um, hope to see you in the next video okay in the last video we talk about uh, we talked about this how to find out a minimum value from a list of values and we came up with an algorithm with name search min from list um, here we have just made a little modification that rather than just returning uh, the minimum value we are also returning the position of the minimum value in the list so for example um, if the list is uh, one seven zero two four let's say in nine let's say that's our list uh, there, there are seven numbers in the list the minimum value is zero so the value the minimum value itself is zero but that appears in position three so when when this procedure will end 
the min value will contain 0 and the idx which is uh, the position at which the value the minimum value was achieved that will contain 3 so not only we are not only we are finding out the minimum value but also we are finding out the position of the minimum value um, this procedure or pseudocode actually describes a very simple uh, very simple concept you consider the very first value as a minimum value and the very first position as a position of the minimum value and then uh, traverse the list element by element and and see if you find any value that is uh, smaller than the minimum value so far if that is found then replace your minimum value with the new minimum value and update your uh, position number and then keep on moving till the end of the list um, so so that's what um, that, that's the concept behind the behind this uh, algorithm searching minimum from the list and to traverse the list we use this loop uh, while loop so next we solve a problem called a sorting problem very very famous problem in uh, computer science uh, so the problem really is let's say we have uh, a list well, let's say one four zero three five and seven let's say and um, the sorted order the ascending sorted order is the order in which the list is presented so that um, uh, the minimum value occurs first then the second minimum then the third minimum and so on so the sorted order for this particular list will be um, this so this is the result this should be the result of the sorting procedure so let's see how can we uh, solve this problem we name this algorithm as sort list and uh, sort list contains this uh, l uh, in this particular case the l is simply this and this n is the size of the list in this particular case the size of the list is six so six and right now l2 is empty so although we have to populate l2 but right now it is empty and counter again we initialize the counter with one and as as long as the counter is smaller than six we keep on we keep on moving inside this uh, this block that's the that's the body of the loop so what we do is we pass the list and the size of the list uh, and we use the previous algorithm to find out the minimum from the list so the minimum from the list will be found as 0 and its position will be found as 3 so min value will contain 0 and idx will contain 3 then what we do we pick this minimum value and insert in l2 l2 was initially empty so we insert in l2 we insert the minimum value which is 0 so far and then just in the original list l we delete the value at the position index so for example the index position is 3 so we delete this particular value so what we really do is we delete this value we delete this particular value and the list now becomes with size 1 2 3 4 and 5 so what we do is we decrement the size with with 1 and then we move on now the counter is 1 again uh, the uh, n value rather than 6 now the n value is 5 so 1 is smaller than 5 but the list has no zero now in it because it was deleted we search the minimum again and we insert the minimum in the list now the minimum will be one in the new list and we delete that value from the list and we decrement the size we keep on moving eventually the list l2 will be populated like so and once uh, and once this um, value of n becomes negative which is minus one we we will exit the loop and we will return the sorted list but see how this sorting procedure actually uses the algorithm uh, that we that we defined in in our pre previous video um, i'm not talking about that this kind of sorting algorithm is the most famous sorting algorithm um, there are efficient algorithms very great kind of algorithms for sorting uh, but the idea here is not to actually teach sorting the idea here to actually uh, come up with a pseudo code for this sorting problem and also to show you how you can use the pseudo code 
how you can use existing pseudocodes as uh, as instructions in in other pseudocodes so that's all about problem solving um, if if you really understand the selection sort and all that procedure really well you're actually very good in problem solving at least the problem solvings that we encounter in uh, uh, the, the logic that we need to solve different kind of problems in computer science. In the next video, I'm going to actually convert these uh, pseudocodes to Python codes. What do you need to do to write this sort list procedure in actual Python programming language? And how will you change this search minimum from list in actual Python programming language? We will see the Python details bit by bit in detail, starting from right zero and ending at the very high details of Python. So uh, in, in the next video, I will just be showing you how to convert this code. But when we will start learning Python, we will start from zero and we will see each and everything of, of, of Python in, in, in detail. So don't worry uh, in, in the next video if you see uh, I mean, um, things uh, like uh, lengthy codes uh, in a very beginning. These are just because we have arrived at a pseudocode. It is very, I am just want to show you how the pseudocodes, which are uh, very express expressible, how they can be easily converted to Python programming, just to show you the power of and simplicity of Python programming language. So in the next video, I'll be converting these uh, pseudocodes to Python code, actual programming code, so hope to see you in the in the next video. Okay, in the previous video, we just get a flavor of uh, problem solving by using this selection sort or the sorting procedure. The idea was just to use this procedure uh, to solve this kind of problem. And we saw in detail, um, not in that detail, just, just brushed up, but we saw how to write a pseudocode for solving a problem of sorting which requires actually a list to be sorting in ascending order for example uh, in this video i'm going to convert uh, first this code uh, search minimum from list you see that code you know that code completely we are first going to convert that code in python code and then we will convert this code in python code so see step by step what changes are there first of all in python that we will see in detail uh, when you define procedures, different kind of procedures, they are called functions in Python. And rather than writing this, we have to write a DEF statement before it. And then whatever name we want to write out, the rest of the thing stays the same, except at the very end, we have to write a colon. That's the syntax of Python. So the changes from here to here is a DEF statement, which defines that is uh, used for defining, DEF for define. And then at the end, we write a colon. Next thing that we will see in detail, don't worry if you, uh, if you're, if you just see that why we are messing up with lists so early, we will see that things in detail. But just to compare, um, the in, in pseudocode normally, the lists are index, the indexes of the list, they start from one. But in Python programming language, the first index of the list usually starts from zero. So there the minimum value was the first value of the list. Here the first value is actually the index in Python is zero. Rest of the things are same. You declare the variable as in pseudocode, the same goes exactly in Python. Um, there, the because the index was one, and so the counter was one more than whatever the index was. Here the counter is simply uh, one. Uh, we need to write here idx, idx equals to zero. That we just missed uh, in the previous, the idx is one, so here the idx is zero. That's okay. Okay, then uh, next we, we write while counter is less or equal to n. Same thing, while counter is less or equal to n here. So here we just write the uh, the colon at the end. We, we might have written this equal sign here, this equal sign. Um, we, have, we just missed the equal sign. The equal sign is there. So now, but see the, see the difference. Here the while it goes that way. Here we have a colon at the end. Rest of the things are exactly the same. Now, v is equal to l counter. v is equal to l counter. The same thing. If v is less than the minimum value, the same thing if v is less than the minimum value in the pseudocode, Python is exactly the same. Just see the colon at the end. We have colon at the end of the while statement. We have colon at the end of the definition. 
we have colon at the end of the if statement. The other statement in pseudocode in Python, exactly same. Now, uh, in pseudocode, we have else statement. In Python, we have else statement. If we want to write an else statement, we have to write a colon at the end of that. Then in Python, in, in pseudocode, we have a pass statement. In Python, we have a pass statement. Same things. In pseudocode, we have end if just to describe that this f ends. In Python, everything is described by the indentation style. So if this indentation goes on, if we uh, if if you're here, then this if is goes. If this if goes out. So we need not write ends everywhere. Similarly, the while body has this indentation style. This is all the while body. Whatever that is that is uh, earlier than this is not in the while body. So rather than writing the tokens end while end if the Python handles everything using indentation. So no need of end if, no need of end while. Oh, we haven't write, we haven't written a counter here. So we have to write a counter plus plus here. So counter. So the, the same statement, we missed this statement in the Python code. So the same statement, exactly the same statement goes here. Uh, that's it. Uh, but the rest of the story is same. We do not need an end search here. The goal here is to show that the pseudocode is, I mean, the way you write the pseudocodes, they are, they are highly, um, they, they highly resemble with the actual code in Python. Python is that expressive. Python is very, very high level language. I mean, the way, the, you, the way you think the problem in, in the pseudocode the actual Python code is much similar to it. So learning the Python is very, very simple. The simplicity of Python is really a great property of Python. And that's one big reason of popularity of, of Python. The return statement is same and everything is same. Uh, then we move toward the sorting. Uh, again, we have sort list. We have to write the define, def define. And then we have this um, colon out there. We have to write the colon there. Uh, then list two is defined like empty. It's empty in Python as well. Counter starts from zero because uh, there the list starts from index one. In Python, the list starts from zero. So we write zero. While, same as this one. Here we have this colon, maybe, uh, maybe an equal sign. Maybe an equal sign should appear here. I guess we are missing an equal sign. Uh, but either way, the, the code is more or less the same. Rest, this statement, exactly same as this statement. We have insert in L2. Here we write append, append function. I'm in Python. Here we write delete this. In Python, we have a del statement. Rest of the story is exactly same. So you see, converting pseudocode to Python code is, is way more easier. Um, this is this is not a this is not a formal introduction to Python. I mean the the goal here in this video in these kind of session of videos is just to introduce you with problem solving. But um, I I I found this I mean um, I found this beneficial to show you that the pseudocode actually resembles to the actual Python code a lot. Although we will be dealing with variables, lists, while loops, if conditions, all these kind of stuff in a in a in a big and huge detail uh, when we uh, in in the upcoming videos when we will introduce the python syntax and variables and all that kind of stuff uh, actually you'll be mastering each and everything in python and and further you need not to write these lengthy codes to do stuff in python i mean the whole that thing is just you write l dot sort and you are done um, I mean, you need not to write a lot of lines of codes in, in Python. Here I, just, here I just showed you that if you have a procedure, you can, if you have a pseudocode, it looks like much like the same as Python, which, uh, which actually um, tells you the, the expressive power of Python and simplicity of Python and how it is closer to what you think. But the actual problem solving um, uh, in, in Python does not require so many lines of codes. I mean, there are so many functions, so many powerful procedures. For those, you just write one line and a huge amount of work is done for you. And there are very good one-liners for Python. I mean, in for, 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 for programming in Python, 
you need not to write a lot of lines of code to do some stuff. I mean, a few lines of code, even a single line of code does a lot for you. And for that, you need to know the, the, the features of Python, the feature of the features and the different kind of syntax and features and libraries and uh, the packages and what what is available with Python. I, I tell you, almost each and everything is available. Just you need to know what is available. Once you know the what 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 are the things that are available, you need not to write lengthy codes. You need not to build a lot of logic on yourself. Things are prepared there, waiting for you. You just have to figure them out. What are these things to do? What what kind of features are there in Python? If you know that, you are done. So you need not to be writing these kind of codes and lengthy kind of codes. Although knowing that all knowing that is a is a uh, is at a huge advantage but doing a, a bigger and bigger and bigger stuff uh, python will give you a lot of features a lot of functionality that you need not to go into and you need not to write a lot of code for it and that's the second power of python one is simplicity second uh, it gives you a lot of features a lot of functionality a lot of built-in stuff ready for you you want to do something it will be probably there in Python. You need to know where it is. And for that, we have whole future series on Python to know Python each and every step in Python and to know important packages in Python. Um, because knowing important packages and knowing how to code in Python will save a lot of time for you. So spending some time on learning Python will be saving a lot of your time to solve the actual pure problem, whatever problems you are doing, you are going to solve. And Python is a real programming language, trending programming language. Knowing this language is almost enough. So hope to see you in, in the next videos where we will start Python from exactly zero and we will see each and everything of Python in detail. Hope to see you in the next video. If you're new to data science, um, you may stuck in choosing the best language for data science and in this video i'm going to i'm going to talk about python which is the greatest language so far for data science um, to to explain the features of python uh, let me first go back to a little bit history of uh, python from where it started it basically starts um, in 1980s it was introduced first in 1980s but with constant improvements and a lot of bug fixes, it was officially launched in 1989, nine years later. It was created by Guru Van Rossum and it is open source, which means it is accessible to everyone. Even though it's open source, um, it can be used for commercial purpose. The main goal of Python was to keep the code easier to use and understand. Its huge library enables data scientists to work faster with the ready to use tools. It is dynamically typed. So the variables that you are defined, that you are defining, they are, they are defined automatically. You need not to set the type. Whatever the contents entering in, the type will be defined automatically. It is more readable and uses lesser code to perform the same task as compared to other programming languages. It is flexible, portable, and can run on any platform easily. It is scalable and can be integrated with other third-party software easily. Python programming is uh, easy to use and has a simple and fast learning curve. New data scientists can easily understand Python with its easy to use syntax and better readability. So, so that's what this point is. Basically, it's, it's really a beginner friendly. If, you, if you're new to programming, well, Python offers you very easy environment to go on. It also provides plenty of data processing tools that help in better handling the data. Python is important for data scientists because it provides a vast variety of applications used in data science. It also provides more flexibility in the field of machine learning and deep learning. It, it has it has a lot of packages like uh, TensorFlow, Keras, Theano that is helping data scientists to develop specifically the trending deep learning algorithms very, very quickly. So basically the sport, the sport of machine learning and deep learning is huge in Python. 
That's huge. Um, as, as is the case with many other programming languages, it's the available libraries that lead to Python success. Around, around 72,000 available packages in Python package index, sometimes called PyPy, Python, PY, Python package index, PyPy. Around 72,000 packages are available and they are growing constantly. So huge number of packages, mature packages are available. It is free, open source, and consequently, any can, anyone can write a library package to extend its functionality. Data science has become an early beneficiary of these, particularly pandas, the big daddy of all of them. The other great thing about Python is um, there are millions of users who are happy to offer advice or suggestions when you get stuck in something. Chances are someone else has been stuck there first. So a lot of community is there, a lot of packages are there, it's open source, it's, it's easy to use, it's easy to learn, um, it's simple, it's readable, more close to human language, it's high level language, you code less, you do more, I mean, you write a very few lines of codes and you achieve a lot of work. Um, um, so, uh, I mean, I've spoken a lot of words here um, to, to, I mean, explain that Python really is best suited language for data science. But let me, let me introduce you some statistics about Python, the popularity of Python with respect, to, um, with respect to its use and with respect to the job opportunities that are there in Python. So for example, if you see this uh, chart, uh, uh, in, in the ranking of top 10 languages, Python stays at the top. So that's the latest statistic collected in um, 2019 February 2019 um, and out of the out of the total share of the languages I mean around 26 percent just goes for Python and the trend is moving up which means the people are more interested in Python I mean the trend of using Python is getting larger and larger as compared to several other languages like Java JavaScript C sharp PHP C R objective C Swift and MATLAB I mean, many of them are used for data science, but Python stays at the top. I mean, this is that popular language. Um, and, and further, if, if you see, for example, the uh, job opportunities uh, in, in Python, so, so that says, I mean, different companies like Facebook, Twitter, and, and, and I mean, Google, and, and several different companies. Um, this, this actually graph shows uh, from 2014 onwards that the job opportunities and job postings are in, in different languages are at what amount. And you can see the graph of uh, Python, although starting a bit low, but then stays up and stays up, uh, which means the 80, uh, if, if you see the numbers, 85% of the total jobs, uh, they're just for Python. And not only, I, I mean, Python is not just for data science. It's a general purpose programming language. It's open source. It, it, can be, um, it can be used to perform any kind of task for embedded programming, for, uh, for, for posting, uh, I mean, codes or embedding code on Raspberry Pi for web development and whatnot. Uh, you, can, you, can, you, you can do the desktop development on it. You can use the web development on it. You can use the data science. I mean, I mean this is general pur purpose programming language. In other disciplines too, it is performing very well, but data science, for data science, it is almost the default language today. Um, so, um, I mean, if you're going to learn data science really, um, we need Python. I mean, Python really is the choice, the default choice, and we need it. And in this particular course, we are going to, um, we are going to introduce Python to you with all aspects. I mean, we will start from the very beginning level and we will gradually move towards um, the very advanced programming in Python including the introduction to the data science packages like uh, 
uh, pandas and matplotlib for visualizations and numpy for handling pneumatic data and stuff like so. So um, in, in this particular course, we are really going to teach you Python and we are not assuming you have any programming experience before. So, uh, and, and this is one plus of Python. I mean, whether you're an engineer, you're coming from health sciences, you're coming from biology, you're coming from arts, humanities, or from wherever. Python is something that is very easy to get hands on. So um, if you're not assuming that you have any programming background, you have any data science background, nothing. So we will start from the zero and we will gradually move to 200. So, uh, and, and including the introduction to the data science packages. So um, Python is the best, it is a default. If you're going to work in data science, Python is the default and we are going to um, we are going to introduce you Python from the very beginning to the very professional. So hope to see you in this course. Okay, before actually discussing um, the best uh, IDE um, for Python and particularly for data science, uh, let's first discuss what an IDE is. As you start your coding journey, many of you prefer coding in a text editor, maybe like uh, Notepad++ where you write the code and then open a terminal window to execute your code. Uh, when there is an error detected in your code, you switch back to the text editor, correct your errors, typos, and run the code again in the terminal. Everything is fine. Typically for large scale problems, however, uh, you not only have to code, but you also need to make sure your code works in all scenarios, which means you also need a testing module. Many times you have multiple coding and testing files. And switching between editor and terminal often becomes both confusing and inefficient. So an environment is needed where you can write, you can run and play with your code all at one place. So the one that provides you with the capability of not just coding, not just writing the code, but, but also testing your code, running your code, highlighting your syntax, bracket matching, auto-completion, debugging your code, code suggestions, and, and many more features. That is called an IDE, or Integrated Development Environment. Now, uh, there are several IDEs um, for different languages. For, for Python, there are several IDEs. For example, Jupyter Notebook is an IDE. PyCharm is an IDE, Spider is an IPE, IDE, and Thought Canopy, Vim, Atom, and there are a lot more. There are several of them. Now the question is, for data science in particular, what IDE is, is the best, or, or what people suggest to be the best? So um, before actually showing you the statistics that which one is the best, before actually showing you the actual numbers, the statistical numbers, that shows which one is better over the other. Let me just go through a few of them, few of IDEs and their features and stuff. And then we will move to, move to uh, statistics and some numbers that will show that which one is better over the other. So let me start with, with this Jupyter Notebook. Um, for the past couple of years, Jupyter Notebook has been gaining a lot of popularity in terms of coding and debugging. Notebooks have been redefining the concepts of an IDE and are adding more and more features onto it. Jupyter was introduced in 2014 after its predecessor IPython and from that date, it is really considered to be a bliss in the coding community. Uh, Jupyter stands for, I mean, some people say Jupyter stands for Julia Python R, but that acronym, that acronym uh, um, does not mean just this. I mean, Jupyter Notebook today is supporting more than Julia, Python, and R. And by the way, this Julia, Python, R, and R, all these are um, open source languages for, and, and they are best suited for data science. Um, this Jupyter Notebook, it has Markdown Editor. It allows you to write HTML code. It allows you to write LaTeX in it. I mean, a lot more. Further, this Jupyter Notebook, it's a web application based server client structure, which is easy to use and allows you create, analyze and manipulate documents. And all these documents are in the form of notebooks. 
Since it's a web, web interface, it can integrate with many of the existing web libraries, for example, for data visualization. Jupyter has so many functionalities. You can write formula using LaTeX, run a Python code and visualization, for example, a raw audio signal using matplotlib plotting library, all in the same notebook. Jupyter Notebook is not just an IDE, but it's widely used in an educational tool for presentation and even for writing blogs. You can export your notebook from IPython notebook format to PDF or to HTML or even to .py, which is the Python file. The user interface of Jupyter makes it a favorite tool, especially amongst the data science community. And one plus of this Jupyter is it's, it's very quick to start. I mean, very easy and very quick to start. I mean, not much rocket science to write your first code. You, you want to write your hello world, it's very, very quick in Jupyter to go and do that. PyCharm, if I discuss PyCharm, however, if I discuss some of its uh, properties, um, let me just discuss uh, first that um, the, Py, the PyCharm is by the company JetBeans. And if you have never used JetBean, JetBeans other IDEs like Java IDE, then running your first code successfully can eat up a little bit of your time. Actually, a lot amount of your time maybe. Such as, I mean, setting an interpreter, PyCharm. PyCharm, however, is, uh, is, is much better for, for working with multiple scripts, handling vertical files and linking them together and huge large scale coding projects. The good thing about PyCharm is it supports Anaconda and uh, as a result, all the packages that fall under Anaconda are supported by Char PyCharm as well. And those packages in, including NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib and so on. Just like other IDEs, PyCharm has a powerful debugger with a graphical interface. It offers JIT integration. It has secure shell terminal and variant control system. Python IDE is customizable which allows you to choose between different themes, color schemes, and key binding, and, and whatnot. Additionally, PyCharm lets you um, add plugins for non-Pythonic files, and these plugins take care of indentation, highlighting the errors, and keywords just on the fly. So, so PyCharm is also providing, I mean, a huge support for coding Python. Uh, but, I mean, the, the one bad thing about PyCharm, which is not that bad, but one bad thing is it is memory intensive. It eats up a lot of memory. It's a heavy thing. And secondly, um, I mean, getting 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 started with PyCharm is not that quick. I mean, it takes a lot of time uh, to just go with that. Spider, however, is a lightweight open source ID. Oh, by the way, this Py, but this PyCharm is um, is is not. I mean, it has professional edition and and the community edition and it is not open source completely. Spider, however, is a lightweight open source IDE that comes pre-installed with Anaconda. And it was built mainly for data science practitioners and engineers. Its look and feel is much like MATLAB. Um, so if you're a MATLAB programmer, if you've used MATLAB before, you switch to Spider and you get, I mean, much look and feel the same. Uh, Canopy, by the way, the Anthot Canopy also has roughly the same look and feel as MATLAB. So, but Spider was built for data science community. It is integrated with essential data centric libraries like NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, Pandas, IPython, and whatnot. The built-in capabilities can be extended further by plugins and APIs. Spider contains features like text editor with syntax highlighting, code completion, static code analysis, debugging, variable exploring. It also has profiler that recursively determines the runtime and number of calls for every function and methods called in a file. And, and I mean, there is Anthot Canopy, there is a Vim, there is Atom, there are a whole lot of IDEs 
uh, ju just for Python language. But but the question really is, being a data scientist, which one is which one should you choose? Being a beginner, which one should you choose? Even even for professionals, if you want to stay in data science, which IDE will you prefer over the other? I mean, there are so many of them. I have just described three or four of them. So let's see some stats based on popularity of different IDEs for data science and then decide which one is better over the other. So for example, uh, this data, this, this analysis, uh, the, the chart I'm showing here, this analysis by what was done by KD Nuggets, and this is the link for that. And it shows that um, uh, the most popular uh, Python editors uh, till December 2018. And you can see that the Jupyter is at the top. The second is PyCharm, then Spider, then Visual Studio Code, then Sublime Tax, then Atom Wim, and there are so many others. But um, Jupyter is at the top. And this is for, uh, I mean, these uh, all are <coughs> listed with respect to the data science community. So in the data science community, which Python IDE is best over the other? And, and Jupiter, Jupiter is at, at the top. I mean, it is, it is way out. And one reason to this is its simplicity. Um, it's, uh, it's supporting to so many different formats. It's, it, it makes an interactive document. It, make, it makes a web page that is interactive. You can just change the code. You can make another web page and so on. Uh, you can you can run it on a local system. You can run it an online as server-based system and and whatnot. I mean, it has so much flexibility, and very quick start and easy to use. Um, if if you for example see the popularity of Python IDEs with respect to the employment, uh, then then you can see overall the the Jupyter is winner winner uh, as compared to PyCharm, Spider, <coughs> Visual Studio Core, and Sublime. If you see company or uh, self-employed, still the Jupiter is way out, it is winner. If you see for in a student perspective, Jupiter is the choice. If you go to academia or university, Jupiter is the choice. If you are working with government or nonprofit, Jupiter is the choice. I mean, Jupiter is, uh, I mean, Jupiter is kind of outlier. It is, it is staying at the top everywhere. Um, Further, if you if you analyze um, the popularity of uh, Python IDEs with respect to regions, for example, again, overall, Jupyter is a winner. If you see US or Canada, Jupyter is most popular, mostly used. Europe, Jupyter is the winner. Asia, Jupyter is the winner. America, Jupyter is the winner. Afer Africa and Middle East, Jupyter. Australia, New Zealand, Jupyter. I mean, these numbers are suggesting that <coughs> Jupyter is is at the top, not just at the top, it's easy. I mean, and, and, and maybe that, that's one reason why Jupiter stands on the top for the data science. So um, these numbers and these all statistics suggest that we should use Jupiter notebook for Python, and we will be doing that. In fact, for this particular course, we'll be working on Jupiter for all kind of coding. Um, and in the in the next video, I'll be just showing you how to install um, Jupyter environment, how to install basically Python and how to run Jupyter for the first time from it. So hope to see you in the next video. Okay, uh, in this video, I will show you how to install Python. There are multiple ways of installing Python. You can go to python.org and install Python from there. I would recommend to use Anaconda distribution. It has Python, it has a lot of packages pre-installed, it has Jupyter Notebook as well. So installing through Anaconda is easier as well. So if, for example, if you're working on a Windows system, you should download the executable for Windows. We will be working with Python 3 rather than Python 2, so you should be installing, you should be downloading Python 3 point, whatever the latest version is. Um, further, uh, if your system is 64-bit, you should be installing 64-bit version, otherwise you will be installing 32-bit version. So let's say you have downloaded uh, the executable file for Windows, then after the download, you just run that exe file and follow the steps, and you'll be able to install Anaconda. Once the Anaconda is installed, then in the search bar, you just type Anaconda prompt, and the Anaconda prompt 
kind of symbol that my mouse is pointing at. This will appear in front of you. You just run it. You will see a command prompt like so. Then in that, just type Jupyter Notebook and press enter and you'll be having Jupyter running in front of you. Uh, let me let me show you that on my on my system how to do that let's see for example this is my search bar let me type anaconda prompt so this is the anaconda prompt so if I click it it runs um, then I just type for example Jupyter note book and then I just press enter um, for the first time it will take uh, some seconds to run so let's wait for it so yes it runs and it will show you kind of a browser in front of you and that's what the Jupyter inter interface is uh, we will see then how from this Jupyter how to write the code how to make the code files and stuff but that's how uh, from Anaconda installing after installing Anaconda that's how you will launch the Jupyter um, so this is that easy, no problem. Um, then, uh, for example, uh, you can install uh, you can install Python if you're working on Linux and just download the version for Linux. And then, uh, uh, then uh, for example, let's say your um, your your file is downloaded in the downloads folder. Then run this command bash and this dot sh. That's the file name. Uh, the installer prompts in order to continue installation process this I mean these kind of commands will will appear press enter to continue then press yes and the installer will finish with the thanks message after that you just go to downloads folder and type Jupyter notebook and the Jupyter notebook uh, interface the browser based interface will appear in front of you you can have if you are if you're working on Mac you can you can in you can download the uh, Anaconda distribution for Mac um, then uh, you'll find an Anaconda, Anaconda navigator the launch pad you can launch that and then just click there there's a Jupyter icon in front of you just press the launch button and you'll be having your Jupyter running in front of you so um, in this video we just talked about uh, how to install Python uh, if you install Python using Anaconda you'll be having Jupyter notebook as well uh, in the next video, we will see how to actually uh, use that Jupyter uh, Notebook interface. For example, I work on Windows, so I'll be having uh, this kind of interface. Although the interface looks like the same because it's a browser-based, web-based uh, interface. Uh, in the next video, I will show you how to get comfortable with Jupyter, and we will be also writing our first Hello World program in Python. So, hope to see you in the next video. Okay, so in this video, I will show you uh, how to write the first program in, in Python, basically the Hello World program. Uh, before that, uh, uh, in the previous video, I, show you, I showed you how to launch Jupyter Notebook. So once you launch Jupyter Notebook, whether you are working on Windows, whether you are working on Linux or, or Mac, whatever, uh, when you will launch the Jupyter Notebook, you will see this web-based interface. And here you, in the right corner, you can see the uh, uh, button new. You just click it, you will select Python 3 and you will see a beautiful interface in front of you that will allow you to code here. There are a lot of um, file edit view, there are a lot of buttons, kernel and a lot of controls here. We will see them as we move on, but this is how you this is this is what the coding environment is this is kind of editor as well as i mean this is complete ide interface in front of you so let's see this interface a little bit step by step at least uh, um, the the controls that that we need first of all you are seeing uh, where my cursor is moving that's the file name or the notebook name you can change the notebook name or you can just write for example um, whatever the name of the notebook you want, for example, um, string python for beginners. Okay, so let's say that's your um, must string python, let's say. Uh, uh, let's say zero to hero, maybe. 
So let's say this is your file name. You just create that file and you see this mastering Python zero to hero that file is created with this file is renamed. Second, um, this is a cell in which you are going to type your code. The code, I mean, the, the two modes of writing is one is you can write the Python code. Another way is you can write the markdown. The markdown is uh, important in, in a way that if you want to describe your code, if you want to write other stuff other than Python code, you can use these markdown cells and they will be helping you. For example, if I select this markdown and uh, I, I just select this markdown and I type here, for example, um, this is Python tutorial and then I press shift enter it will appear as a heading um, and a new cell will be created down this is also a cell but this is a markdown cell as you can see now in this cell that's a code cell you can switch a cell from code to markdown by just uh, pressing an escape key when you press an escape key you will see the color will change here you can press escape key then if you press M it will change to markdown and if you press Y it will change to a code cell um, there are several sh I mean shortcuts the sh uh, that are available keyboard shortcuts if you if you just see uh, if you go to help and see this uh, keyboard shortcuts there are several shortcuts that will be available in front of you so for example if you press escape and then press F you can do the find and replace operation if you press enter then uh, that will go into edit edit mode if that's important if you press shift enter the cell will run and the new the the cursor will go into the new cell and there are a lot of controls you should be seeing uh, most of them i mean getting a good grip on these controls will help you uh, moving in this jupyter notebook very quickly so for example this is a python tutorial that's a markdown cell uh, you can also create this this cell also as a markdown cell and then you can type here for example um, this is our first program in Python it is it, it it is just started here for example and it just appears like uh, like a description and again a new cell is created it down and there you can write your code so let's write the first python code hello world so first of all you will write print print command will allow you to print anything on the screen parenthesis double quotes starts ends and in the double quote you write whatever you want to be printed on the screen so for example hello world and once you have written that code just press shift and enter and this code will execute in front of you so that's hello world uh, printed in front of you um, and that's our first program I mean writing the very first program in Jupyter Notebook is is that easy not only that this Jupyter Notebook will be created you can you can just I mean describe anything you can write the headings you can write HTML in it you can write math using LaTeX and for example let me let me write uh, LaTeX or math in front of you just just let's say you are making a notebook that requires some mathematics in it and it allows you to write mathematics as well for example a equals b plus c shift enter and that appears like a mathematical equation not just this you can write very complicated equations um, I mean and 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 this whole notebook will contain your descriptions in terms of uh, 
HTMLs or LaTeX or descriptions and code and all that mixed up, whatever. You, and at the end, you will you can you can just download this. You can just download this uh, this notebook as if you want a PDF file, PDF file. If you want a notebook file, it's a notebook file. If you want a LaTeX, if you want just a Python file, if you want slides, for example. I mean, you can download the same thing as slides. It, it will make slides for you. Uh, so there are a lot of ways of using this notebook. And that's a ready-made document. I mean, you end coding, the document is ready for you. Um, so this notebook is really, really powerful, Jupyter Notebook. And coding in it, it is not just the coding. I mean, it is preparing a document. If you want to prepare a document, you want to describe anything, you want to add images, and at the end of the day, it will be an HTML document for you. It, it can be shared on web. I mean, it's ready. Uh, nothing we, we want to further finish it. So that was our Hello World program in, in Python. Uh, we will continue to build this uh, by, uh, Mastering Python Zero to Hero uh, notebook. We will continue coding in that. We will describe the headings. We will write the markdown cells and all that stuff. Uh, and we will at the end of this course, you'll be having one notebook with all kind of descriptions and code in it. You can use that notebook afterwards. Um, uh, we will be building well, one notebook, one complete notebook for Python. So that's about it. That's the Hello World. In the next video, um, we will see um, how to, what are, what are the constructs in, in Python, what are variables and other stuff. But before that, I, I also wanted to show that this notebook is an enhanced version or the upgraded version of IPython shell. And I also want to show you IPython shell as well. So um, in, the, in the next video, we will just uh, see the IPython shell and we will see how can we, how can we view Python as just as a calculator by using IPython shell. So hope to see you in the next video. Okay, so in this particular video, I'm going to show you the IPython shell. Um, just open up the Anaconda prompt as, as before. Uh, like you want to open a Jupyter Notebook, then you just type here Jupyter Notebook, and you will be, you will be in the in the Notebook world, Jupyter Notebook world. But if you just type an IPython and press Enter, then a prompt is open for you in a, in a colored way and this is perfectly fine to write any kind of Python code in here. Actually the Jupyter Notebook is a more enhanced and more featured version of IPython. Uh, basically everything that iPod, uh, that is there in IPython is there in Jupyter Notebook as well but it has more features, more documentation and stuff. So for example if I just uh, write a Python code here hello world let's say it will work in ipython shell as well but remember uh, previously in in jupyter notebook we type shift enter to run a particular command here we just press enter and everything will work if you want to clear the screen here uh, whatever the whatever we typed here if you want to clear that just press control l if you are on windows control l will work on windows now IPython is uh, just like, uh, you can use the Python in, in this particular shell just like a calculator. For example, you want two plus three, press enter, that's five. Uh, let's say it's nine multiplied by seven, the answer is 63. You can write a complicated statement as well. For example, 45 minus um, eight is static, or multiplication, a static is achieved by, multiplication is achieved by a static symbol, seven. And then you can have this, minus 10 divided by two, and, and just press enter, and that's the answer, 16.0. If for example, by the way, I have just pressed the up arrow key and the last command just appears. Uh, I have pressed up arrow key again and the second last command appears. Uh, I press the up arrow key again and the third last command appears and now I'm pressing the down arrow keys. So for example this and uh, you may have whatever the result is, you may have uh, that multiplied by 10 
and minus or or maybe plus um, plus 15 so the result is minus 145 and so on so this python ipython shell uh, you can write very complicated or almost I mean the complete Python coding can be written in IPython shell and you can use this shell just for a calculator. Uh, now let, let's see for example you, you compute this result let's say 45 uh, minus uh, 45 minus 9 and let's say you compute this result whatever the result is and you save that result in a symbol let me call that symbol as a variable. Uh, in here the variable is a let's say you save that in a and then you have another variable let's say b and 3 static 45 uh, or maybe 3 static 2.6 that is saved in b now uh, you have you have done this particular calculation you know that 45 minus 9 is in a the result is in a and then you have this particular result that is in b and now you just want to add the two results together and you want to print the what what normal calculators does not have the support of saving the results and reusing them um, but here in Python even if you just want to use the Python just as a calculator you can declare as many uh, variables as you can and you can save the previous results you can retrieve the previous results and you can use the previous results save new results and so on these kind of symbols that are used to save the results and then they can be just used afterwards these are called variables and our next uh, video will be on variables what are these variables what are their types uh, what kind of variables the python supports one way or the other if you want to go beyond calculators you need certain results to be saved and retrieved, retrieved afterwards um, and, and the variables are, are, are the constructs, the variables are the features that, that actually do that. So um, the, the calculator is fine, you can use this uh, IPython shell just as a calculator, but if you want to do interesting programming, um, complicated programs, I mean, you want to achieve a task that involves much more calculations, one way or the other, you have to save certain results in somewhere, and then you have to combine the results together because the longer problems in normally are broken up into smaller piece of problems and each smaller problem has a result that should be saved somewhere and afterwards the several results they should be combined to achieve the result that we are after so these variables are required if you are going to do some interesting or complicated uh, calculations or, or computations um, so you uh, by the way before uh, before having these uh, uh, Jupyter Notebooks, which are just the enhanced version of this IPython shell. The iPod, IPython shell, just uh, people used to write a lot of Python programming just in IPython shell. And even even today, several people are writing their code, complete code, in, in IPython shell. But um, uh, the, the Jupyter Notebook, it is more enhanced version, more uh, uh, documented, more, uh, I mean, it has better interfaces and uh, several features that are better than just using IPython shell. So you have seen this IPython shell, it's very powerful, great, everything is fine with it, but we will be using uh, Jupyter Notebooks which are just the um, enhanced uh, variants of this IPython for our upcoming coding. So um, th the purpose of this video was just to uh, was just to introduce you with IPython shell and just to tell you that you can use Python just as a calculator and even more than that. In, in the next video we will be uh, introducing variables in Jupyter Notebook and we will see the Python or Python is really really much more powerful than just a calculator. So hope to see you in the next video. Okay, uh, in this video we will talk about variables and operators, the operations that you can perform on, on variables. Um, a variable in a very layman term is basically a symbol uh, that stores some data that can be used later on. Um, so for example this x is a symbol character or a symbol, y is a symbol, x, y is a symbol. Normally and these are called names of the variables. For example this is a variable name x, y is a variable name y, x, y is a variable name itself. 
Now, these variables, they can store different kind of data. I mean, whenever you want a particular data to be used again and again, it is better to save that data or label that data by a symbol, by a descriptive name, so that you can retrieve that name, uh, retrieve that data by using that label or symbol. So one way or the other, this, this variable actually is a description of the data that you want to use or store and, and you want to use uh, later on in your program. Uh, different types of data are there. Uh, for example, the integer type data, um, for example, if the data you want to store is uh, integer type, it's a number, and the number is just the integer number. It, it does not have a decimal point expansion. Uh, that is a type of data and that can be stored in a variable in that, in that case, the variable type itself will be integer. Uh, you need not to specify the type of variable when you are storing the data to it. The storing data to a variable is sometimes called assigning data to a variable or assignment. For example, if your variable is x and you are assigning a value, let's say uh, 2, then 2 is integer value. It's integer, it does not have a decimal expansion. And when 2 is assigned to x, based on the content 2, that 2 basically is an integer type value, automatically this, the type of x is set to be integer. And that is sometimes called the dynamically typed, Python is dynamically typed language or dynamic typing. You need not to specify the type of the variable, the contents that you are assigning to a variable, they, they will define the type of the variable on the fly. And the assignment, for example, in here I am storing two inside X, and next time if I want to print, for example, what is there in X, the, the print value will be two. Now, this kind of symbol is hard to write. There is no keyboard symbol that looks like so. So rather than writing this symbol for assignment, normally an equal sign symbol is used for assignment, for example, x is equal to 2, that means 2 is assigned in x. 5 is equal, y is equal to 5 means 5 is assigned in y. 7.2 equal, x, y equals 7.2. x, y is completely a new variable. It has nothing to do with x or y. And it is handy sometimes to, <coughs> to, to suggest the name of the variables that are too descriptive, that are very, very descriptive to increase the readability and management of the code. Because uh, later on you will you'll be seeing when you'll be working in data science and other stuff, um, the programs that you will be writing might not be very short programs, they might be lengthy programs. So readability of a program and management of a program becomes an issue if you, if you, if you do not assign the names of the variables uh, carefully. However, if you write the names very in a very descriptive way, uh, by just reading the name of the variable, by just reading the variable symbol or, or, or the name, uh, it tells a better look and feel of what kind of data inside and what should I do with that. So I was talking about this uh, equal sign. This equal sign is used for assignment. Here, for example, when 7.2 is assigned to a variable x, y, automatically the type of x, y variable is set to be a floating point, in t floating point number. A float is a data type in, in Python that describes uh, that the particular um, data is a real valued. It may have a decimal expansion as well. Uh, not just integer and floats are the only data types in uh, Python. There are several others. For example, you can define complex numbers if you if you want to. You can, for example, defining a complex number might be, for example, you write the name of C and you write 2 plus 4J. If you write the symbol J here, it automatically becomes complex. And now you can you can use this C the way the complex numbers should be treated. Um, similarly, there are other data types like fractions, decimals. Um, there are there are further data types. Uh, the objects called strings, for example, if you if you if you assign, let's say, s equals double quotes hello, then that s is also a variable, and the type of this variable is string. String is just a 
a sequence of a lot of characters where H is a character, E is a character, L is a character, L is a character, O is a character, W is a character. And when we will define anything, any sequence of characters inside the double quotes and then end the double quotes here or the single quotes, single quotes and double quotes either way, then the type of this S becomes strings and these characters should be treated as it is. Uh, like for example, if we have another variable S2 and we just say 1, 2 in double quotes. Now this S2 is no longer 12 as an integer. It is a sequence of characters where first character is 1 and other character is 2. We will talk about strings in detail in the upcoming videos but just to give you a look and feel that uh, Python actually supports a lot of uh, data types, a lot of interesting data types including the most important data type is integer, float and uh, string as well that we will see in detail. Further you can assign uh, you can assign more than one values to more than one variables in, in a single line that is sometimes called multiple assignment. For example if you write a comma b equals 4 comma 5.0 then 4 will be assigned to a and 5.0 will be assigned to b. Notice one thing although 5.0 looks like an integer but when you when you write a decimal expansion it automatically becomes float. So if you now type um, the type if you now check the type of a it will be integer and if you check the type of b it will be float. Um, once you have declared a lot of variables they stay in the memory they occupy a particular space in inside the memory. For example x is just a label to a memory the inside the memory there is two located somewhere similarly y is also located somewhere in memory and similarly x y is also located somewhere in memory and this is the data inside that memory um, these will stay in the memory and they occupy the memory if you if you decide to no longer use a particular variable in future in the, in the program then you can call this function del space whatever the variable name and it will delete the it will delete the variable from the memory like it was never there um, and once the variable is no longer in memory it is it is not accessible if you now access the variable again you will get an error um, let's see all these concepts let let's see most of these concepts in jupyter notebook and let's let's actually um, let's let's actually um, define certain variables, um, use them, print them, do some multiple assignment and see a lot of stuff in, in Jupyter Notebook. Uh, so let's go to Jupyter Notebook. Ah. So that was our notebook that we were uh, doing, la uh, that we were um, actually working on the last time. So let's say I define a variable x, let's say x is 2. Um, uh, why not, why not I, sh I should describe this as what we are doing here is let's say variables so just to give a heading that we are now in variables so variables uh, notice that now I'm in a code cell previously I was in a markdown cell notice this change in this particular cell this is markdown in this particular cell this is code cell um, see that code cell Okay, x is equal to let's say uh, 3, uh, let's enter this. Now x is assigned a value 3. Um, if you want to know how many variables right now are there in the memory, we can write this command whose, this uh, is a percentage symbol. If you write percentage symbol and then just type a command whos, it will tell you all the variables that are right now that are there in the memory. And right now the memory has a variable with name x, its type is integer, uh, and the data inside the variable is 3. That's the memory view that you're now seeing. Okay, if you want to explicitly check the type of x, you can print type x. So for example, this function type will, will actually find out the type of whatever variable you give inside and then this print function will help you printing that on on the notebook so if you see the type of x it the type is basically its integer type now um, if you for example uh, change the value of x as uh, 3 to let's say 5.7 
So you have same variable, but you just change the value from 3 to 5.7. So let's see what happens now. So if we call who's again, we have now the variable name is still x, but its type automatically, its type automatically changed to floating point number because, uh, because we assign a floating point number to it. And this is the data. If we want to explicitly check the type of this x, that would be class float now. Further, um, let's say we have another variable uh, a, B, C, D, that's a variable name, let's say, and we assign a value 556.32, that's that's a value. Uh, if we now call the whose function, whose command, we will be having two particular values, uh, one variable as A, B, C, D, its type is float, uh, another variable is X, its type is float, and that is there. If we, for example, do a multiple assignment, for example, a comma, when you write comma, first variable finishes, second variable starts, a, b, c, d, and f, let's say, these are five variables. And if you assign five values to five variables, again in a comma separate list, three, five, six point zero, seven point two, and uh, let's say, uh, minus three. So if you enter that and you now check the status of the memory because now all these values are assigned to their respective variables. If you now check the uh, memory view, A is an integer type variable with value three. A, B, C, D, uh, the old variable that we assigned earlier, it's already float. B is also integer, it has value five. C is float. C's float, although 6.0 looks looks much like integer, but when you when you write a point explicitly, it becomes uh, it becomes a floating point number. So D is again float with 7.2. F is integer, it's minus five, and X is the old old variable that we know already. Now, if we, for example, delete a particular variable, if we, for example we we no longer want to use A B C D variable, A B C D that's one variable that we don't want to use in future. And now if we see again the view of the memory, we don't have this. And if we now want to access this, for example, if we want to print this, A, B, C, D, we will get an error, we will get an error. And we should, we should get an error because this particular variable does not exist in the memory. Uh, it points to no data, it is gone. It is gone like it was never, it, it was never there. So um, that's about the variables. Uh, we, we just talked about integer and float. There are several other variable types as well. For example, let me just give you an example of, uh, an example of a complex number if you are really interested in. That's a complex number. If you print its type, so that the type is complex. Similarly, you can have a string variable uh, let's say, hello, how are you? That's a string variable. If you print type of this, you will get a string. We will, we, we have a whole set of videos just on string data type uh, because this is very important data type. We will, we will see that in detail. But the purpose here is just to tell you that there are a lot of data types that Python supports and uh, Python is dynamically typed. Whatever content you are assigning to a variable, the, that content decides the type of the string you need not to specify. So um, I end this video here. Uh, in the next video, we will be uh, talking about operators, basically what kind of, so once we have decided, one, once we have declared, once we have defined a lot of variables, what we can do with these variables. Can we add two variables together and get the results stored in another variable? Can we multiply two variables together? Can we have an operation like addition on mixed types? For example, one variable is a floating point number, another variable is an integer number, integer type. Can we mix up those? Can we add two different types of variables together and get a result? 
then what will be the type of the result and so on. So a lot of these discussions on operators, the very basic arithmetic operators on these variables, particularly the integer and float variables, we will see that in the next video. So uh, hope to see you in the next video. So in the last video we saw variables and we particularly saw integer type variable and floating point uh, variable type. We also saw very briefly on Jupyter Notebook we saw a complex and string as well. Um, so in this video we are going to talk about operators, uh, basically the arithmetic operators. Obviously if you are defining variables uh, you're not defining the, them, the variables just to, just to view them later on. Uh, most probably you'll be storing data to the variables and then you are you're applying some computation on a set of variables together, computing new results, saving that, and doing some stuff. Most probably you will be adding two variables some one way or the other in, inside a program. You may have to add two variables. You may have to subtract a variable from the other. You may have to divide a variable. You may have to compute. For example, these are arithmetic operators. Let me let me just, this, this plus symbol is used to add two variables. This minus symbol or subtraction is used to subtract a variable value from the other variable value. Obviously these all are operated on values, not the names. Uh, division, um, it, like, like the name suggests, it's if you want to divide this, this percentage symbol, it, when it is applied to two different variables, if X is on left and Y is on right, what it does, it uh, it actually divides x by y and checks what the remainder is. For example, if x is 27 and y is 5, then what's the remainder? What do you think? Um, if we divide 27 by 5, what's the remainder? The remainder will be 2, yes. So the result will be 2 here. So this computes the remainder. This multiplication, this star symbol is used as multiplication. Like in mathematics, we normally write this cross symbol. But in, in, in Python and in most of programming languages, star symbol is used to achieve multiplication. This double slash is like the division, but uh, it is division with the result floor to the quotient. Uh, what I'm saying is the following. For example, if you divide, um, um, let's say 10 by three, the result will be a floating point number and the result will be 3.33, something like so. But if you want just a quotient, not the remainder, uh, if you want the integer, that's the quotient value, uh, 10, you write the double slash three and it will return just the value that is, uh, that is there before the decimal expansion. So this value will be returned. So this is kind of the integer division or floor division. This double star is used to compute the power. For example, if you want to compute two, you write double star four, that means two raised to the power four. In mathematics, we write this as following. And the result will be 16. You can save that result in another variable, or you can just print it, or you can write that in a file or whatever. So these are most important um, operators. One thing that I want to tell you that these operator are not just for integers and floating point numbers. The applications of these uh, operators is much broader than these. Later we will see the objects or the data types that are collections and very, uh, I mean, uh, the data types that are beyond these integers and floats and still there, this plus minus division and all, some of these or all of these, they have their meanings there. Uh, even 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 this plus is used for strings. Now think for example if you have a, a, a string let's say hello and you have another string for example let's say this is string s1 and you have another string let's say s2 which is y then Python allows you even to add these kind of data types. Although some doesn't make any sense uh, with these kind of string variables, but we will see for different kind of data types, the, the definition of these operators, they actually change or adapt it accordingly. For example, in mathematics, we are much more fluent uh, for with plus, with division, with subtraction, and it makes sense to add two integers, to subtract a floating point number from another floating point number and stuff. 
but with data type that is unfamiliar to you right now, these operators may not make that sense to you, but there are definitions, there, there are ways to use these variables for the data types that are even that are even beyond than integer and floating point numbers. We will see all these details as we move on uh, as we move on to as we move on to the videos and uh, I mean as in, in in later on we will see all these things in detail but just to tell you that these operators are not just limited to integers and floating point numbers or complex numbers they can be applied to uh, several different data types. So um, a lot of words I guess you are bored now Let's go to Jupyter Notebook and have fun with these kind of concepts that we are dealing with. So, uh, yeah, here. So let's first uh, press escape, then M, just to change it to markdown, and then escape one for heading, big heading. And here I write, let's say, operators. And shift enter, it runs and automatically then go to code. Okay, now let's say I have a variable. So let's say what kind of variables I already have. Uh, in the previous video, we used that. So we already have these kind of variables with us. Now, what is, let me define a new variable. Let's say sum of, sum of a, b. That's a new variable, sum underscore a, b. That's a variable name. You can have a better variable name, maybe sum of a and b that might be a variable name um, it is good to have the variable names that are descriptive that describe what data is inside um, because in, in in programs the programs become manageable readable and a lot of benefits are there so sum of a and b let's say that's a variable name and you add a b you just write a plus b um, let me make the zoom level a little high so that you can see it clearly. So A plus B, let's say that's there. Um, if you press Shift Enter and now you print sum of, by the way, if you have written sum of, you need not write everything, just press Tab and it will automatically complete um, the remaining part of the variable. And press Shift Enter and you have eight. If you check the type of this variable, um, sum of tab oh, automatically completes tab. Com that is called tab completion. Wow, um, it's integer. The type of this particular variable is integer. That's a new variable. And why the type is integer? Because a was integer, b was integer, and integer plus an integer is an integer. What if we add an integer with a floating point number. What do you think? What should be the result? If I just type type um, a, that's an integer, plus uh, d, which is a floating point number. So a plus d, the result will be here. And type of that result, what will be the type of that result? What do you think? Let me pause here uh, for a few minutes and, oh no, 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 not for a few minutes, for a few maybe seconds, maybe two or three seconds. What will be the result? What will be the type of an integer and a float combined? Well, um, the types are upcasted, which means the floating point number, the result will be a floating point number. And the reason is every integer by default is a floating point number. A floating point number is, a, is an upper class or you can say a superset. Uh, so in Python, in Python by default, the types are upcasted to super supersets. So here, integer plus a float, the result will be a floating point number, and that's the result. You you might be thinking why we have why we haven't stored the result in another variable. Well, if we want to store the result in another variable, we can, or if we just compute the result and apply some operation on that, we can do that. For example, we we could do the following. For example, a plus d. That's whatever the result is, raised to the power three, whatever the result is, whatever the result is, um, divided by maybe four. And we just save that in a new variable. Let's say, um, let's say the new variable is V. Let's say we save that value in V. 
and now we print v and we have the result for v uh, wow so we can do a lot of stuff with these kind of variables let me show you a fancy stuff that we will see later on don't worry if you don't get it just s1 for example s1 is hello hello and let's say s2 is world and we have another variable let's say s which is s1 plus s2 what it will do is it will just concatenate them together we will see strings a lot later on but just to tell you this plus is not just for not just for numbers it is for other data types very fancy data types that are there um, one more thing let's say we define 10 and we divide it by 3 and we want a quotient the quotient is 3 however if we have 10 divided by 3 shift enter the result actually is 3.33 and so on you might be wondering we have not saved that result in a particular variable uh, so where the result is saved actually if you do not if you do not save the result if you do not assign the result for example in this way the result will be assigned to a variable r but if you do not assign if you do not store the result in a particular variable explicitly by default there is a variable in uh, python which is underscore underscore contains the last result that you did not store in a particular variable explicitly so if that underscore is basically um, one default variable for for the result if you want don't try to uh, update this underscore um, just just read it do not assign anything to underscore for example if you assign something to underscore assignment will be done but then the uh, properties of uh, underscore will no longer be there as they are in in python built-in properties okay so that's about it i guess um, so that was the operators uh, we will see the operators more and more later on but before ending this video i leave you with a question so the question is we, we saw the variable names like uh, sum of a and b x y variable name can be uh, can be lengthy can be descriptive can be short anyways so the question really is can a variable name start with a digit for example is it possible that the variable name really is um, is starts from the variable name starts from for example a digit is a 3x valid variable name uh, or for example at the rate of at the rate of y is that a variable name or for example this symbol times 2 times x is that a variable name what are the conventions to for variable names can we can we write anything in the left hand side we write let's say 3x is equal to 4 that means 3x is now a variable name is that true in python or are there conventions to define the variable names so yeah think about it i'll i'll see you in the next video with the answer to this so i hope you will you'll be having answer for this question hope to see you in the next video okay so in the last video i asked you a question um, about the naming convention of the of variable names in particular i i asked you whether 3x is a proper variable name or not in python so what's your answer yeah what do you think how many of say you how many of you say no how many of you say yes well by the way you might have tried that declaring that variable name in Jupyter Notebook and then you might have got this answer one of these well let me tell you the answer is no uh, a variable cannot start with a digit not with not with at the rate of not with hash symbol not with I mean there are several other the special characters are not there except a few characters one of those is underscore let's go to let's go to jupyter notebook and and check this so for example 3x equals 5 error 
invalid syntax let's say at the weight of y equals 4 invalid um, star t equals 4 error well an exception is underscore underscore e equals 6 that's allowed uh, starting a variable name with underscore is allowed it is different than the underscore that is built in underscore this is underscore e is different than simply underscore so it is good to not declare the variable names that start from these because you will be getting errors further variable names should be descriptive they should give you a look and feel of the data what they are containing and you're free to define variable names as as descriptive as you want so it is a good practice to to start writing the variable names in a better way one um, one better notation one better notation of defining these variable names even the function names we will see the functions later on uh, one way to defining those is to use camel notation camel notation camel notation is you start with the variable name with for example um, lowercase letters let's say your variable is uh, starting time of the course let's say that's your variable name so you write starting that's one word finishes then the next word should start from capital T starting time of the course let's say so this kind of notation is called camel notation and very famous particularly the Java developers they normally follow this and several other developers but you should come up with a notation that is one notation there are other ways of uh, uh, keeping consistently def keeping the consistent strategy of defining variables uh, there are several other ways this is one uh, way so starting time of the course is let's say 2.0 let's say so that's a variable name if you if you now check that's a variable name but now if you see this variable just just the name suggests the data inside is doing what so the names should be descriptive I mean and, and make that as a habit so yeah I guess uh, we have now answered our question very concretely that a variable name cannot start with a digit not with any special character other than underscore okay uh, in the next video, um, I'll be introducing uh, comparisons with, with variables. For example, what if you want to compare whether one variable is smaller than the other or not? What if you want to compare whether the two variables, they are containing values, they are same or not? Um, what if you want to do comparisons of the, of the data that is stored inside the variables? And based on the result of the comparison, you want to do something else. So in the next video, we will see a bool data type that is very, very famous and it is used in a lot in decision making. And we will see the comparison operators, sometimes called the relational operators in the next video. So hope to see you in the next video. OK, um, in this video, we are going to talk about a data type which is called bool. Um, that's very, very famous data type. Actually, it's the most famous data type because it is used in decision making. All the control flow, most of the control flow depends on this data type. Um, although it is very, very famous, very much applicable data type, it is very simple. It is a data type with just two states, with just two values. By the way, there are capacities of different data types. For example, in, in integer, the different kind of values that you can store are huge you can store any negative number in it you can store zero you can store any positive number the capacity of floating point number or the number of values that it can save is is even higher than even higher than an integer and the complex number is even higher than that and so on but the bool data type it has just two states one state is true it has just two values true is a value and false is a value just these two straights true or false in in some programming languages the, the true is denoted by one 
and the false is denoted by zero. But in Python, the true is just true, true, that thing, and false is false. That's it. If you, for example, define a variable, let's say any variable name, whatever the name is, let's say b, and you assign true, then its, it's default data type will become bool. Um, and if you have another variable, let's say c, which is false, then c is also bool. One thing that is important, uh, there are other operations other than arithmetic operators that we saw adding, subtraction, division, and stuff. There are other operators that we can apply on bool data type. For example, a true and, and is a keyword combining true and true. If, uh, if there is a variable, let's say, a, if there is a Boolean variable A with data true, if there is a Boolean variable B with data true, then A and B is also true. So let's say I've used this variable D in storing this A and B, the D will also be true. So true and true is always true. Further, true and false. This is always false. And this is uh, commutative. For example, true and true is true. True and false is false. False and true is false. False and false is false. So if you apply and operator and keyword to combine the two Boolean variables together, if both are true, then and will result a true. Otherwise, and will result a false. Um, other than this and, there are there is there is another uh, there is another uh, operator keyword or. So this results false if both are false, 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 false or false is false. If any one of these is true, then the result is true. Remember the difference between and and or and will result false if any one of the two operands, at least one of the two operands is false, then the result is false. If both are, or, or and will result true if both of the operands are true, otherwise it is false. Or will result false if both of the operands is false, or false, otherwise it is true. So um, you, you now know, true, uh, and you now know or, there is another operator called not. Uh, this is not. So not, for example, returns uh, not true results false and not false returns true. Great. So not is a unary operator. Unary means it just takes it just takes one variable and operate on that. And is a binary operator, like plus is a binary operator. It takes two variables to operate on. Or is a binary operator. It operate. It takes two operators. It takes two variables to operate on, and so on. So remember, uh, remember uh, these things. One and will return true if both of the variables are true. Otherwise, the result is false. Or will result false if both are false. Otherwise, it will return true. And not is not just flips the the state. So not true means false, not false means true. So these are basically, th that's how you can combine the Boolean variables together. Uh, in the next video, we will be seeing how to apply these comparison operators and the result will be Boolean types and how can we combine the Boolean types together to, to build a better decision making. So in this particular video, I just, uh, I just introduced the Boolean data type for you, with you. In the next video, we will see uh, where the Boolean data type actually appears and how it impacts our, our, our programming style or thinking style or coding style. So hope to see you in the next video with comparison operators that actually produces the Boolean variables. Hope to see you in the next video. Okay, in the last video, I discussed Boolean data type and uh, I discussed that a Boolean variable takes either a true or a false and we can combine these Boolean variables together uh, with AND or uh, operators. 
and then uh, we can apply a not operator on a particular variable and we we saw that a true and true returns true and and uh, otherwise returns returns false similarly a false or false is false otherwise or always returns a, a true um, uh, before before actually discussing these uh, comparison operators let's jo let's just go to jupiter and just just play with a boolean data type uh, just just for a, just for a moment um, let us just con convert this to markdown cell and just write bool that's a bool boolean variable so let's say uh, a is true and B is true and C is false false and uh, okay so these are our variables let's press uh, who's to see what are the states of so A is a boolean variable with value true B is a boolean variable with value true C is a boolean variable with value false so now a is true b is true c is false so let me let me print print a and b what do you think what was what will be the result uh, let me print a and c what will be the result and let me print uh, c and a so because a and b both are true the first result will be true because C is false, false, true and true is true, the, the, the other two statements, they will result false. So first value will be true, then false, false. So yes, true, false, false. Let's, let's check the or print. And by the way, let's store that or in another variable. Let's say A is true or C is false. So what do you think? What will be the uh, result here? because or gives false when both are false. Here A is true, so the value of D will be true. Further, um, not A, because A is uh, true, not A will be false. Similarly, not B, B is true, so not B will be false. Uh, not C, uh, C is true, C is false, so not C will be true. Similarly, not D, we can save the result in another variable, let's say T, and we can just check the type of T if we want, that's a Boolean. We can also check the value inside T, and that is false. Um, so, uh, yes, not only that, I mean, we can, we, can, we, can, we can combine at a higher level, for example, A and a and B, whatever the result is, or um, C or D, whatever the result is, and whatever the result is, not of that. I, I mean, we can we can combine them in a very complicated way if we want. A and B, the result will be some boolean. That boolean and that boolean, there are. The result eventually will be a boolean, and then not of that. So let's check what is that is. The result is false. Well, why the result is false? Um, figure it out why the result is false. Let me go to comparison operators. Uh, so the comparison operators, let me just uh, uh, go to comparison operators. This equal equal to, it compares whether two variables, whether whatever the variables are, whether they are integer, floating point, whatever, whether two variables are, are they have same data or not, for example, x equals equals to y that will be true if x and y they both have same data so for example if x has value 4 and y has value 4 then we are just checking x equal equal to y or not the result will be boolean because and x may not be a boolean variable y may not be a boolean variable if we want to compare the values of x and y then we write double equal without a space inside. Remember, if we write single equal, that will be an assignment operator. If we write double equal, that means we are checking whether the two values are same or not. 
Similarly, if we write this particular symbol that checks whether two values are not equal or not, for example, x is not equal to y, the result will be true if x and y, they both have different values. Otherwise, the result will be false. Remember, the result of comparison is always a Boolean. It is either true or false. Okay, next we check whether less than. So for example, if x is less than y, the result will be true if x indeed has a value that is smaller than y. Let's say x is 2 and y is 10. In that case, the result will be a true. Otherwise, the result will be false. Similarly, we can compare the two variables using greater than. We can compare the two variables by uh, less or whether, whether, the, whether one variable less or equal to the other. For example, if x is less or equal to y, the result will be true of this comparison. The result will be true if x has a value that is not larger than y. As long as x and y, they are equal or x is smaller than y in any case, the result will be true, otherwise false. Similarly, greater than or equal to. Okay, so uh, I end this video here. In the next video, we will be, uh, we will be moving to Jupiter and playing with these operators and seeing the return types of booleans and then combining them together with ands and ors and doing, doing uh, interesting stuff with that. In this particular video, I just uh, talk about um, the comparison operators, the Boolean data type, and combining them by and, or, or not. In the next video, we'll be first moving to Jupiter. We will see the comparison operators. We will write all these statements in Jupiter and just get a good hands-on grip on that. And then we'll be moving onwards. So hope to see you in the next video. So in the last video, I talked about comparisons, um, double equal to, um, not equal to, less than, greater than, less than, or equal to, greater than, or equal to. So let's go to Jupyter Notebook and see um, how they actually work. So let me just first enter a markdown cell and type that comparisons. Shift enter comparisons. So we can we can compare different uh, values by first assigning them to variables, and then comparing those variables. Or we can we can compare the values directly. Uh, for example, um, print two is less than three. What do you think? Two is less than three. Um, the result will be what? Remember, the result of a comparison operator is always Boolean. It is either true or false. So in this case, two is smaller than three. So the result will, because this statement is true, so the result will be true and true will be printed. Further, we can store that result in, a, in another variable. For example, two is smaller than three. Whatever the result is, the result will be true. The result will be saved in a variable C if we check the type of C, if we check the type of C, as long as let's print the value of C, so you can see the type of C is Boolean and C in this particular case is true. Moreover, um, for example, let's have uh, three equals to four. Is that true or false? Um, what do you think? Three equals to four. Three e double equals to four. That is false. Three is not equal to four. And let's save this result in uh, D. Remember three double equals to four. That's an operation. The result is false. This equal is an assignment operator that the false value will be assigned to the variable D. And here we can see print D and it is false. Similarly, what do you think? Three double equal to 3.0. What will be the result? Remember three is integer. 3.0 is a floating point number. And I'm comparing three double equals to 3.0. One is integer, another is a floating point number. So what will be the result? Let's see. The result is true uh, because they are comparing the values by discarding the decimal 
position. Um, further, let's see um, 3 is smaller or equal to, so let's say x is equal to 4, y is equal to 9, and z is equal to, let's say, uh, 8.3, and uh, r is equal to minus 3, let's say. And these are our variables, let's say. So what do you think? What will be the result here? x is smaller than y. What will be the result of that? x is smaller than y. The result will be true. And um, z is smaller than z is smaller than y. The result is again true because z is smaller than y. Or um, R, R is R is equal to, for example, x. So what do you think? What will be the result at the end after this? So let's see first, first this will be true. This will be uh, again true. And that is false. Okay, so this true and true will return true and true or anything the result final result is true so this will return return true but if i just do if i just switch the order for example if i just write this statement which is false this particular statement here and then i do this what will be the result now? Now see, um, x is smaller than y, it is true. r is equal to x, that is false. So this result will be false eventually. And z is smaller than y, that result is z is smaller than y. Let me just say z is larger than y. Let me just check z is larger than y z is larger than y just just to just to tell you so this is true this is false both and of these or or let me let me switch the let me switch the this thing r equals to x i just want to show you the precedence of r and x is smaller than y so now if you see this is false, this is true, false and true is true, true or uh, false and true is false, this is also false and the result overall is false. It should happen. But what if, what if this goes first, if this goes first, I, I mean, I want to show you whether AND and OR, which one of them will operate first. So in this particular case, the result is false, but it can happen. Let me, let me tell you this in more uh, AND true OR false AND uh, true OR false AND true. What do you think? What will be the result here? True or false and true. If true or false operate operate first, if true or false operate first, the result will be true. True and true, the result is true. If, however, let me let me just write a false here. If or operates first, if or operates first, then false or false is false, and false and true is the result eventually is false. And if AND operates first, then false and true is false, false or false. The result in both cases here is, is false. Um, so a better way uh, of, uh, of representing these kind of, sometimes, sometimes they can make confusions. Uh, sometimes they can make confusions. For example, um, if you have a true here, if you have a false here, for example, false and true, um, uh, oh, 
how can I so false false and false or true so in this case if uh, in this case if false or true that operate first the result will be true and false and false uh, false and true the result will eventually be false however if and operates first the result will be false here false or true the result will be true so here if and applies if if you apply if and is applied first then the result overall result will be true but if or is applied first then the overall result will be false so it it is it is good to know whether and will be applied first or or will be applied first in this particular case and will be applied first even if you even if you change this even if you change this order for example if you even if you pick this thing and apply here still the result is and will be applied first and or will be applied after it is always good rather than to one way is to remember the precedence and will be applied first then or I mean it is good to think about the precedence another good thing is to specify the order using parentheses for example now we specify this first or will be applied and then for and will be applied so it is good for readability to always apply these parentheses and and check the order in which ands and ors in the combinations will be applied. So uh, the in a, in any way the result of these comparisons will be booleans. Um, question: What will be the result here? So not two, not equal to three, and true or false and true. See this slide for a while. Even if you want to pause the video, pause the video, see it and answer. The print will return true or false. Okay, with this question, I end this video. In this particular video, we just saw the comparisons on Jupyter Notebook. Just see how the comparisons return true or, true or false. We combine the different trues and uh, different Boolean uh, values using ands and ors. And here is a question for you. Okay, I will see you in the next video with answer of this question. So I left you with a question in the last video. So that was the question, if you remember. So the question really was, what's the, what's the result here? So what's your answer? True or false? Uh, the result either will be true or false because these are all comparisons and combination of Boolean values. So let's see step by step. First of all, let's see this two is not equal to three. The result is two is not equal to three. Yes, it is true. Two is not equal to three, that's true. So not true. Not true is false. So this is false. Uh, so this whole thing is false. Now false and true, false and true, that is false. So this whole thing here till here is false. Now we have or, or, and then we have false and true. Now false and true is false. So this whole thing is false, this whole thing is false, and R between. It's false or false, it is false. So the result of this, uh, so, the, so the answer to this question is, is false. Let me, let me just convince you by typing this statement in, um, in Jupyter Notebook. So if you remember, we have print, print not, Two is not equal to three and then we were having I guess and false and <clears throat> yeah that, that was a step a different one and true sorry that was and true so this was and true then we were having or 
and then we were having these uh, false and true so the print ends here and the result is oh I have some I have some parenthesis mismatch so not true and this okay I should have this one I guess and this goes to there and this goes to there and I guess yes so the result is false the result is false um, the the purpose of uh, this question was not just to uh, the purpose of this question is to appreciate actually the the fact how we can combine different boolean values to 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 achieve the final boolean value and these kind of combinations will become very very helpful further in in control flow when we will see the if conditions and decision making and stuff so the answer to this question is false um, yeah and uh, I end this video here uh, in the next video we are going to see some useful functions of Python uh, and after seeing the some some kind of useful there are a lot of functions we will see just a few of them very useful of them and after seeing those functions then we will directly jump to control flow basically the if conditions and stuff where you will see these comparisons these boolean values in a much more applicable sense than than earlier so hope to see you in the next video okay so let's have a very quick tour over some some useful functions in python um, obviously there are a lot of functions in python but i will be covering just a few of them that i think uh, with the passage of time we will be covering more and more but let's start um, a function uh, or sometimes uh, particularly a built-in function is is basically a feature from the language that is supplied for the users to achieve particular task for example a round function if you give uh, round for example a round let's say 4.6 this 4.6 is a floating point number and rounding means make it as integer uh, and uh, what round does is it finds the nearest integer to 4.6 and the nearest integer in this case is 5 because 5 is more closer to 4.6 than 4 however if you call round for example on 4. Point, let's say 3 then the result will be 4 because 4 is more closer to 4.3 than 5 uh, so that's one use of round it rounds uh, basically uh, uh, rounds a floating point number to the nearest integer another uh, use of round is if you give another argument that that is called an argument to the function for example when you write print print let's say a this a is called argument to a function print similarly round is a function 4.6 is an argument round is a function 4.3 is an argument we will see functions in details and we will be writing our own functions as well but for now just just bear that just bear with me that functions are these kind of features that are available however we we will be writing our own functions later on so this particular function accepts two arguments so round has two different kind of uh, implementation one is when it accepts only one input argument it returns the nearest integer to that if it accepts a floating point number as well as another argument like here we have three that means uh, after, uh, after point after decimal go to three places only and then round up then round for example this 4.55 and then 8 will be rounded based on its next value if the next value is larger than 5 then 8 will go to 9 and stop if the next value is smaller than 5 then 8 will stay as 8 and the result will be three decimal places after this um, so uh, let's practice this round function just on a Jupyter notebook very quickly let's see uh, so here we are so let's say print round let's say 4.5 six and in this case the result will be 4.5 and the reason is 4.5 when it's rounded up it stays to 5 and the reason is this 4.556 it is more closer to 5 than 
than four. However, if you if you just print round four point let's say three four five let's say and the result will be four the reason is four point three four five is more closer to four however if you call this round function with more than one argument for example four point five five six seven eight nine let's say or with argument let's say two that means the result should be only two decimal places after the after the decimal point so in this case the result is 4.56 and the reason is this 5 is rounded based on the next digit and the next digit is larger than 5 hence it is rounded up so 4.56 if however um, I call this function for 3 then what do you think what will be the result it will be 4.55 and the 6 will be rounded up based on this 7 and it will become 4.557 yes however if for example there will be a value at, at the place of 7 if there is a value let's say 3 then you call this function then 4.556 and then based on the next value 3 the 6 will stay as 6 rather than going to 9 and the result will be 4.556 yeah so that's a, that's the that's the round function basically another function is div mode uh, div mode function basically um, divides and returns quotient and and remainder so in the next video we will be uh, seeing this div mode in detail uh, how it actually works and how uh, how it is useful um, uh, so in, in this particular video we saw round function in the next video we will see div mode and there are a couple of more functions that we will see in the upcoming videos so hope to see you in the next video so in the last video we saw round function that sometimes accepts one argument and sometimes accept two arguments and behave accordingly in this particular video we are going to see another function div mode and it accepts two arguments two different argument maybe same or different arguments and it, it returns uh, two outputs, two numbers. Uh, it returns basically quotient and remainder. For example, in this particular case, the quotient is 5 and the remainder is 2 because if 5 is divided by, if 27 is divided by 5, the result is 5, but then the remainder is 2. And the result is returned in a kind of an ordered pair um, and, and these kind of uh, collection in which we have two or more elements we call these collection as tuple that we will see in detail when we will see the data structures uh, module of this course but right now just bear with me that it returns two numbers um, two elements and the two elements are ordered in an ordered pair um, which is called a tuple. A tuple is not just an ordered pair. It can have three more, three, four, five, or seven, or maybe several elements. But right now, we will. Uh, a tuple is just an ordered list, which we will see in detail. Um, so uh, let's see the working of the stiff mode function in uh, in Jupyter Notebook. Let's see. So uh, let's say we have uh, uh, div mode. Uh, let's say uh, for example we have 34 and then we have let's say 10 or maybe let's say 9 so what do you think what will be the quotient and what will be the remainder so 9 18 27 so 3 3 is the quotient and the remainder is remainder is 7 so 3 is quotient and 7 is the remainder so um, and if you save the result, for example, if you save the result in a variable, let's say G, so if you see the G, the type of G, if you if you just type the type of, if you just print the type of G, it's a tuple, which we will see in details. And if you see the contents of G, if you see the contents of G, the contents of G are three and seven. And if you want to access each element independently, then you can access the ele first element because the if there are multiple elements in uh, in a variable normally that that kind of variables are called collections that we will see in detail later on and these are the indexing the the positioning is start by zero rather than one so g0 means the first element of g which is three in this case and the second element of g is one 
at at one, which is seven. So this is basically this is called the index or position of of elements or data in in this particular collection. We will see these indexing and and all these kind of collections in detail uh, in uh, in the in the data structures course when we will see arrays and strings and uh, different kind of uh, structures. But uh, and diff mode sometimes is uh, is basically uh, sometimes it is helpful. By the way, you can achieve div mode by uh, by another by another thing. For example, if you want to achieve div mode 34 9, you can do the same thing by let's say 34 divided by uh, double divided by 9. That will give you a quotient, and the quotient is 3. And further, if you write 34 remainder 9, and that will give you the remainder that you need. So you can call that function div mode or you can use these two. There are multiple ways of doing the same stuff. Okay, so yes. So, so I mean, sometimes it is useful when you're coding and knowing this kind of function that returns quotient and, and uh, remainder. Okay, next function that is more useful is is instance, um, and we will see this function in the, in the next video. So hope to see you in the next video. Okay. Uh, this function is instance. It actually returns either true or false, and it just checks that a particular given data value belongs to this type or not. For example, if you want to check whether one has type integer, so you can check that using this function. Um, by the way, uh, you know that one is of type integer, then you may think that why on earth one should be interested in checking the type of one if somebody know it is integer. Sometimes um, we have certain variables and certain data is stored in it and we want to check the data inside it belongs to which kind of type. And in, in several cases, the value to this variable is not assigned by us. It may be read from some file or maybe uh, through input, a user gives some number or something like so. So sometimes it becomes important to check the type um, of a particular variable. If, if we are expecting a particular type of the input and the input is different, then this function might be helpful somewhere. Uh, either way, this uh, is a function available in Python and it checks whether the given value has a particular type or not. So is instance one int returns true? Is instance 1.0 integer that returns false maybe because this is a floating point number? And you can check a particular value belongs to one of the several types or not. You can give several types in, in, a, in a tuple and you can check whether it belongs to this, uh, this or not. So um, let's go to Jupyter Notebook and see actually how it works. So, by the way, this is the same notebook that we have, uh, that we are populating. Uh, so uh, hold on with me. Uh, at the end of the day, we'll be having one notebook complete. So is instance, is instance, let's say three, is that instance of integer? The result is true in this particular case. If for example, we check whether, uh, is instance um, 3.4 is that an is that an integer the answer is no it is not an integer um, if for example we check if this is not an integer then maybe it is a float uh, the answer is yes or maybe we check that um, for example if that value is either float or integer if it is one of these then um, I mean check that a particular value in this particular case 3.4 whether it belongs to one of these types um, we can increase these types for example so let's say we uh, we gave a complex number here and check is instance let's say 2 plus 3j that's a complex number and let's say we ask whether it is an integer or float or not the result is obviously false and the reason is it is neither integer nor float or even if we give a string there str so it will still say no it is not not any of these but uh, maybe there is a complex data type if we see that 
that says yes because it is complex. So sometimes this uh, is instance becomes really um, useful. Next function is power. Um, so power, you can you can compute power by the way using using for example if you want to compute x raised to the power y, you can use double star and that computes exactly x raised to the power y or equivalently you can call the function pow x comma y and that will give you the the same result as this one but power sometimes take three arguments as well and in that case it it uh, it performs uh, the power function in a different behavior so for example if you supply three arguments what it does it it raise y to it it ra x raised to the power of y whatever the result is then it takes the remainder by z and gives the result so let's see um, the functioning of this power function in jupyter notebook so let's say power i want to compute 2 raised to the power 4 the result is 16 no problem 2 raised to the power 4 i can compute the result 16 this way as well but here is another way how can we use this 2 raised to the power 4 whatever the result is then I want to take the remainder by let's say um, I want to take the remainder by 7 2 raised to the power 4 is 16 then if we take the remainder by 7 the result will be 2 and that's the result 2 so that's how you can use this power function uh, I'm just introducing you uh, some built-in functions that are available. There are so many functions that are available. I'm just getting you comfortable with these kind of functions so that in future, if you see another function that you have not seen here, you'll be able to use it um, and, and, and apply it. Um, so um, uh, in, in this particular video, we saw this uh, is instance function and this power function. Um, in the next video, we will see one more function that will allow you to take input from the user. Uh, so far we are supplying values or assigning values to variables directly. What if on the fly we want to give the values and those values should be assigned to the variables. So in the next video we will see the function, we will see a function that will allow you to give input from the keyboard. Hope to see you in the next video. So in this video we are going to see a very important function called input. This function is uh, I mean, this is beneficial for taking input from the keyboard from the user. Um, and uh, the way to call this function is you type input and then you type a message that actually describes the expected uh, entry that, for example, enter something. If you want somebody to, or tell somebody to just enter, let's say a number, you can write enter number or any specification to help the user to enter whatever input the user want to enter properly. One thing is that no matter what the user will enter, the variable A will be having type string, str. Um, so even if you enter a number, let's say 12 or 34 or whatever, uh, that will be received as a string. And then there are ways to convert string to number if that really was a number. So whatever you receive using input function will be a string and then there are ways to deal with that string if that was a number how to convert that string to a number and and so on so for example let's see uh, let's see on the jupyter notebook how it works so uh, let's see for example uh, x is equal to input enter a number let's see and then, then if I press shift enter, a prompt will appear in front of you that will require you to enter a number. For example, if I enter, let's say 56, and then I press enter, not shift enter, enter, then X will receive 56. Now you might be thinking this 56 is an integer, so the type of X should be an integer, but uh, this is not the case. The type of X will be a string. And the reason is whatever you enter is received as characters five and six. Even if you have entered something else that would have been received as a sequence of characters. So this is no longer a five as a digit five, six as a digit six. These are some characters, sequence of characters. Now, if you want to, uh, I, I mean, there are ways to convert this X, for example, maybe you want, let's say Y or X as 
int x. So this means you have now converted this string to integer and then whatever the result is you have stored that result in x again. If you now see the type of x, uh, type of x, the result is integer and you can for example print x minus 34 and the result is 22 because x was x was 56. So uh, this input function is, uh, I mean, it is, and, and one way, by the way, if you if you're expecting an integer or a float value, for example, let's say you're expecting a float value, then it is good to write input, let's say, enter a real number, maybe, or, or any message, any message. And then at this particular time, at the time of input, then it is okay to convert that thing to a float and it will become a float yeah that's it so now uh, for example you enter 12.5 if you see the type of a now type of a will be float okay but there are problems for example if you are if you are expecting float and somebody enters uh, uh, enters something that is not float for example a or let's say b equals float input enter a real number let's say and then you press shift enter and somebody just enters let's say abc so now this is not a float abc cannot be converted to a real number no matter what so you will catch an error uh, there are ways to avoid these kind of errors and program program breaks using exception handling and there are other ways but um, be careful, I mean, the user is not, um, I mean, the one who is going to enter uh, the, the, enter the input, um, if that, that user is not restricted enough, then you can get errors. Um, so, uh, I mean, this is not the case that whatever you will enter, it will be converted to a float. If it really, if whatever you have entered is really to convert, it is really convertible to a float, then it can be convertible to a float not otherwise and at the input time there is no restriction you cannot restrict the keyboard to enter what or what not although there are ways although there are ways to do that so um, that's about uh, the input function so uh, we have seen uh, some of the functions let me just let me just go through quickly uh, we have seen input we have seen uh, is instance we have seen div mode we have, been, we have seen power function, we have seen the round function, and there are several others. Um, yes, so from now on, we will be actually moving towards uh, 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 basically decision making based, sometimes we will use these kind of functions, mostly we will be using input function, but sometimes we'll be using maybe other functions like these functions. And sometimes uh, uh, we will be doing decision making based on these and, and stuff like so. One thing that I want to tell you is if, for example, you know the function name, some function, let's say like power, you know that POW power is a function, but you do not know how to use that function. One way is to just type a, a question mark in front of it and then just press shift enter. And in front of you, the documentation of the power will open up. So it will tell that this is power, that's how it should be called, and uh, then some description will be in front of you that equivalent to x raised to the power y with no arguments, with two arguments, or equivalent to x raised to the power y remainder with z with three arguments, and so on. If you want to see uh, implementation of this function as well, uh, we will see the functions later on, but if you want to see more about the help, you can type the double a semicolon, a double question mark, and uh, more things should be open up in front of you. So, yeah. In this particular case, the uh, this power function does not have an implementation uh, in Python, so the single question mark and double question mark are the same. Uh, so one more way, uh, is to use the help function, help pow, and you will get 
uh, a lot of information about the power how uh, for example help on built-in function power in module built-in so this is power this is equivalent to this some key types and stuff like so uh, or for example you want to know how can I use the input function for example so you can uh, write help on input and this is how this can be used so sometimes it is okay if, if you know the if you know the name of some function and you know how to use it you can just open up the documentation right here in Jupyter Notebook by either using a help function or you can use just a question mark in front of the name and so on so um, that's about the functions um, in the next video we will be seeing the power of comparisons and uh, the decision making or sometimes called the control flow so the real fun will begin uh, from the next video because we will be actually deciding which part of the code should run and which part should not run based on based on certain conditions so hope to see you in the next video okay we are in control flow the most interesting part of any programming language well assume um, that you have two numbers you have taken two numbers from the user a you've taken that number from the user using input uh, I have not supplied the input message here uh, the message is optional it's a description if you supply that that's okay if you don't supply even that that's okay so A is some number the user will supply when the code will run B is some number the user will supply when the code will run now once you have A and B in front of you obviously the user will supply that on the fly you don't know what the value of A and B are because when the program will run only at that time the A will be populated and B will be populated. Your task is whatever the value of A is that you, that you don't know, whatever the value of B is that you don't know, the user will supply that those values. Your task is to print the value that is bigger than both. So for example, if A is bigger than B, then print A. If B is bigger than A, then print B. So whatever the bigger value is, print that value. Let's say that's your task. How can you do that? So the question is how? Does Python allows us? Does Python allow us to do that? Um, for example, if A is bigger, then we should print A. If B is bigger, then we should print B. Remember, again and again, we are we are talking in terms of if A is bigger. If so, this is this is this is what if A is larger than B, then this condition will be true. This is like the comparison. So this is true. But then we must have an if condition as well. Uh, if A is bigger, then do what? So if A is bigger than B, then do certain things. Otherwise, don't do that, those kind of things. So this if condition is really, really powerful and is available in all programming languages. Um, in here, for example, let's see if A is an input, B is an input writing an if condition that's if is a keyword that's a comparison that we have done earlier as well and then the syntax required a colon in front of that so if this condition is true if this result if this comparison results true remember the comparisons they return boolean values if this comparison if this uh, whatever the result of this operation is if that is true then you go into this block um, and whatever the statement inside is do that for example print b is greater than a um, now my question is is that is, is that done are we done with the task the task was to print the bigger number if b is greater than a then b will be printed then or, or, or we might have printed for example we might have printed rather than writing this we might have, might have printed let's say just print b because b is bigger um, if B is not bigger than A, what will what we will do then? So yeah, if B is bigger than A, then B will be printed. Yes, because then you will be inside here. If B is not bigger than A, if this condition is false, we will do what then? So that's a question. So right now I'm just coding this in Jupyter Notebook and then we will see how can we deal with that if B is not bigger than A kind of condition. So let's first see 
the blessings of if condition in Jupyter Notebook. Uh, yeah, so let's say A is an integer. Let's say you're expecting an integer input, input, let's say, and then you write if, well, let's say B is again an integer input, maybe, and let's say if A is greater than B, then print A. That's it, that's your program. Remember uh, this indentation, I have not written this print here. This is the indentation that defines the block of A. Let's say if I want to print A, then I want to print, let's say, I am still inside if condition. condition and so whatever that starts from this whatever that starts from whatever that starts from uh, this alignment if I write something here let's say uh, x is equal to 5 all that block all that block is called the body of the if condition if it starts from this alignment if however I I type a statement but I type that statement in that kind of alignment, the alignment like this, this is no longer inside the if condition. So for example, here I type, I am outside the if condition. So the purpose of writing these multiple lines is just the if condition does not require to contain only one line of code, it can contain um, a whole block of code, multiple lines of code. So this is no longer inside the if condition. So now we will take input A, input B, whatever the numbers will be. If the value in A will be larger than B, then this will be printed and this will be printed. Once these two are printed, then this has to be printed regardless of the values of A and B because this does not, this last print statement, it does not depend upon this does not depend upon the values of a and b it has the if condition has no impact on that that is just a sequence of statements the if condition the statement inside the if are just these two for example if a is not bigger than b then neither this will execute nor this will execute but this will still execute because this is this has nothing to do with if condition so let's run this code and see uh, how it works so let's see the value of a See the power of descriptions. If we could have written a description, then the description could have been uh, could have appeared here. But let's say this is the value of a. Let's say twelve. The value of b. Let's say um, let's say ten. In this particular case, uh, because the value of b is ten, the value of a is twelve. Twelve is bigger than b. If this condition is true, this statement becomes true. Whenever this condition becomes true, you are inside the print. You are inside the if condition. Now this print executes and you you get 12. This print executes and you get um, I am still inside the if condition. And this has to execute no matter what the values of a and b are. So now let me rerun this and give other values of a and b. Let's say the value of a is 10 and the value of b is let's say 45. Now this, condi this condition becomes false because uh, 10 is greater than 45. This is not true. This is false. So whenever this condition is false, you never land inside the if condition and you go out from the if condition. So these are the statements that are inside the if condition. They cannot execute because, because you never visit them. They can only be executed if the if condition becomes true. So then once you're out the if condition, that's the statement that is going to be executed anyways. So yeah, so that's the flavor of if condition or decision making. And this is the comparison operator that returns a Boolean value. You may have different kind of comparisons here or combination of comparisons here, no, no problem, depending upon your logic. But the question is, are we done? We are going to print only the bigger number. We have, we have printed the one that is, uh, if A is bigger, we have printed that. What if, if B is bigger? Uh, we have not solved the task yet. This is the task. We have not solved the task yet. So how to do it? Okay. So yeah, uh, it looks like complicated. 
how to print only that number that is bigger so if B is bigger than A then we will print B maybe maybe we should maybe we should apply another if condition if B is bigger than A then print B if A is bigger than B then print A maybe um, yeah why not so um, so for example let's go to Jupyter notebook and and write the following um, let me let me write a whole new program here uh, a equals int input okay let's do not have a message int input and then if a is bigger than b then print a Okay. However, if B is bigger than A, then print B. I guess we are done. If this condition becomes true, then we are here. And we know if this condition becomes true, then this condition cannot become true because it cannot happen that A is bigger than B as well as B is bigger than A. This cannot happen. So whatever the bigger number will be, that will be executed. Further, you can see I have this if condition and this if condition, they are aligned in a way that this if condition is not, this, the second if condition is not inside the body of the first if condition. Um, we will see such a cases, such cases when this is required, but right now, I guess we are done. If A is bigger than B, then print A. If B is bigger than A, then print B and only one of these if conditions will become true because a is bigger than b b is bigger than a these two statements cannot be true at the same time so let's see so a is 10 b is 45 so the answer is 45 wow because 45 is bigger so let's run it again so a is let's say 22 b is let's say 4 and the result is 22 because 22 is bigger i guess we are done with the task um, we have used this if condition twice to achieve the task um, to print the number that is bigger and both the numbers we we, we took both the numbers from the keyboard um, yeah I end this video here and in the next video I will tell you more uh, features of this if condition particularly the else statement what, I, what we have done recently with another if could could be achieved through an else statement that is uh, more powerful, more readable. So in the next video, I will talk about else statement, which is a part of if. So hope to see you in the next video. Okay, in the last video we saw if condition and um, we actually had an example in which we wanted to know, we wanted to just print the greater number. So we input a number A, we input a number B, and if B is greater than A, we printed B is greater than A. Then we applied another if condition to check if A is greater than B, then print A. Uh, the else clause or the else part of if is, uh, a as, as the name suggests, if this condition is true, sorry, if this condition is true, this particular condition is true then go there if this is not true which means else if this is true then go there else go there so if this is true then you land here if this is false then you land in else part for sure and this else is uh, I mean if B is greater than A if that condition is true then you print this thing otherwise a might be greater than B or A might be equal to B. Either way, you land in else part. So this if and else, they both have this alignment, but then the block of else started from this particular alignment. Maybe you have more statements here. The alignment of this if block started from here and you may have more statements here. So let's go to Jupyter Notebook and see the else running. So let's say a equals int uh, input and b is 
<coughs> b is int input and we say okay if a is greater than b then print a else else print uh, else print b uh, else print b now b will be printed even if it is equal to a or if it is greater than a either way b will be printed so let's just see um, let's just run this and see what happens so shift enter so input a number so a is let's say uh, 10 and b is let's say 12 so what do you think when I will press enter what will be printed b or a b yeah b is printed that's what b is printed now um, if I run this again and a is 10 and b is 10 still the 10 will be printed so let, let's modify let's let's just say dot print if part so that means we landed in if part otherwise we landed in else part so just to be more elaborative let's say so 10 and 10 and we landed in else part and the reason is if a is greater than b so 10 is greater than b 10 is greater than 10 false so you go to else and the else block the whole block just execute it so that's what else is it's uh, really very nice to have an else there whatever this whatever the if this is false whatever that condition is if that is false then you land in else so um, yeah that's else part simply now um, okay so we have this um, if l structure we can have one more power uh, with this if what if we want uh, if a if b is greater than a then you print b else if a is equal to b then you print they are equal and if this is false and this condition is false if both these conditions are false then you go to else part so basically if else if else if else if else so you can have really deep structure for example in this particular uh, example if b is larger than a then you land in this part else if this l if is just short form of else else means b is not greater than a else you can have another check else if a is equal to b then do what l l if we can have one more check we can have one more check we can have several checks and then else else will only execute if all the if conditions or else if parts on top their conditions they are false and only then else will be execute so let's see these uh, else if running um, on Jupyter notebook okay so let's say a is um, int so rather than taking inputs let's say a is 1 b is let's say 5 um, let's say we have taken these inputs a is 1 b is 5 if a is if a is equal to b then do what print equal l l if which means else if now because this is if you should you have to write a condition here which will be either true or false if a is larger than b then do what then print let's say a and 
else let's say you print b okay so that's it and this statement print is not in if condition not not in if this is outside complete this is complete if condition with all its else and else if parts and this is no longer inside so let's run this uh, what do you think what will be the result if a is 1 b is 5 then else part is going to be run because uh, a is not equal to b a is equal to b that's false a is larger than b that is also false so you will land in else part and b will be printed and then a statement will be printed which is not an if so yeah so b is printed and not an if if b is 10 then what will happen a equals to b that is false so you will not land here else if a is larger than b true you will land here because you land here else will not execute so a will be printed and then not an if if a is 10 and b is also 10 let's say then you have equal yeah so that's uh, else if okay so um, that's about if else if if else if or short form is lf else structure in the next video we will be talking more about this uh, if else if else structure in a bit more detail and we will also be giving you a short form of uh, this this kind of else if else if else if else if structure so hope to see you in the next video okay one way of writing this if else if else kind of structure there is a short form as well uh, which is written down here in a in this uh, green color for example this is a kind of a same code that we saw in the last video but that's the short form uh, let's say a equals 9 and b equals 10 then print a if a is larger than b else print this particular thing if a is equal to b else print that this is exactly the same kind of structure for example print a if a is larger than b so you just read that if a is larger than b then print a else if a is equal to b then print equal else print that so that is kind of a short form of writing this if lf else kind of a structure but i will i will recommend to 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 use i mean the structure in this particular horizontal form rather than writing that in a in this particular way because this kind of structure that horizontal kind of structure is much more readable much more manageable and this might be this structure might be confusing sometime for for some kind of readers or and also if this structure goes on and on and on which we will see uh, in a in an example today uh, writing that writing very deep and lengthy structures in short form is not very feasible so although but but this feature is there if if you like to write if else if else kind of structure in this way this is available in python okay uh, let's let's get a good grip on this if else if else structure on jupyter notebook let's move on to jupyter notebook to see an example just an example so let's say the example is user will input a number let's say int input let's say and enter marks let's say enter marks for a particular subject let's say user will enter some some marks and our goal is if the marks are larger than 85 then we will print a grade if the marks are larger than larger than 80 but smaller than smaller uh, so if the marks are larger or equal to 85 then we will print a grade else if uh, marks are larger or equal to 80 but smaller than 85 then we will print uh, a minus grade um, and and if else if if marks are larger than larger or equal to 75 but smaller than 80 we will print we will print uh, for example uh, uh, b grade for example b grade and, and so on let let's print this whole nested structure that let's let's make this else 
if else if else if kind of structure a little lengthy let's let's get comfortable with it so if a is larger than or equal to 85 to enhance readability it is good to include a spaces uh, a space after the variable and space but don't actually write the space inside that because larger and equal to they combine without space is an operator so if a is larger than 85 then print let's say a grade great l if a is a is larger or equal to 80 and a is smaller than 85 so let me let me write this in, in a more readable form else if a is smaller than 85 and a is larger or equal to 80 then we should do what it is sometimes good to include these kind of uh, parentheses sometimes it is good just to make these things more readable that this is one block this is one this is one boolean this is one boolean this is one decision this is one decision um, although not writing the parentheses is also okay but writing the parentheses make uh, code a little more readable so for example if a is smaller than 85 and a is larger than 80 if that is true so remember and is true only when the left side is true and right side both are true then this whole condition becomes true and I promised you that I will show you the power of comparisons and actually combining the boolean variables using ands and ors and stuff like so so here you're seeing the one in that case let's say print uh, let's say uh, a minus grade and elif if a is if a is uh, smaller than if a is smaller than 80 and a is bigger or equal to 75 if that's the case then what should we do let me omit the parenthesis just to show that whether writing parenthesis or not writing parenthesis is perfectly okay uh, I, I just recommend to write parenthesis so it, the code becomes much more readable than otherwise okay then we have print let's say b grade and let's say one more lf lf um, if a is smaller than 75 and a is larger or equal to let's say um, 70 then print um, b minus grade let's say and um, let's just finish this let's else print below average for example let's say let's say that's our that's our code so we will we will enter numbers if the number is greater than 85 then a grade if when this condition becomes true then this print will execute and we will out of the structure right there if this condition is false then this condition will be checked if this condition becomes true then this print will execute and we will be out of the structure if this is false and this is false then this will be checked if this is true then we print b grade and we are out but if this is false then this will be checked and if this is true then we will print b minus grade and we will be out if this is also false then we will dive into else part and we will say okay below average so let's see for example let's say the marks are 82 
82. So A minus grade, uh, yeah, that, that, that makes sense, A minus grade, because the marks are smaller than 85 and larger than larger or equal to 80, so A minus grade. Um, yeah, let's, let's run this again. And we have, let's say, marks, let's say 64, below average. Okay, great. So you see uh, this if, elif, 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 else, this can go as long as you want, depending upon your logic. So great, um, and further, you can combine several comparisons, several booleans together with ands and ors and nots, whatever you, whatever you like to, like to do. Um, let me give you one more, uh, one more uh, beautiful thing. Let let's let's create an else without writing an else. Uh, let's let's just let's just write elif and um, implement else completely else. So we are not going to write else explicitly, but we are going to write a program that actually simulates else. So let's see. Uh, if a equals let's say three, if a is larger than ten. Um, then print, let's say larger than 10. Now, we are not going to write else, but we are going to achieve the else part. L if not A is greater than 10, you see, then print else part. You see that, I mean, uh, that's beautiful. If this condition is true, then go there. If this condition is false, then not of false is true, then you land here. And you need not to write an else part if you want. Just, I've implemented, um, I have implemented else part using lf. So, you see that? So, else part, so we are in else part. If a is, let's say, 13, then we will print Okay, greater than 10. Well, just for fun, just for fun. Okay, um, okay, great. So um, we saw um, if condition, it's shorthand and uh, else if structure in, in, a, in a bit more uh, lengthy way. So in the next video, we will see if condition inside or in the body of another if condition, which is called a nested if. Uh, so hope to see you in the, in the next video. In the last video we saw um, if else if structure. In this particular video we will see uh, nested if or, or simply called if inside the body of another if. So let's take an example to understand what nested if condition is. Um, simply we can understand if condition inside another if condition, that's all. Uh, rest of the story is the same. Uh, the way if works, it works even if it is inside the body of another if or, or anywhere actually. So let's say we have uh, input a number uh, and then we check if x is larger than 10, then you move inside the if condition, if that is true. If that is false, then you are here, whatever you write here, it will work from here. But let's say x is greater than 10, then you print your number is greater than 10, your number is above 10, let's say. Let's say you print that. Now, after this, can, after this statement, you move to this statement and you just make another check. If x is larger than 20. Now you see this if condition, this particular statement is inside this particular if condition. If this, this condition becomes true, only then you dive in, uh, otherwise you're not. So here you're checking if x is larger than 10, then you move inside and inside you're making more checks. Uh, so for example, if x is larger than 10, then you print or do some stuff here, and then you apply further more, more checks, more granularity, more whatever your logic is. So let's say here you are checking if x is larger than 20. Now, if this condition is true, then you move here, else. Now this else is of this if. If x is not larger than 20, then you move to this else, else part, and you're here. So, and we can have another if inside this particular if, or an if inside this else part, and, and so on. So if inside an if is called nested if, and we can have, uh, I mean, deep structures, for example, if, then something, then if, then something, then if, so maybe we can have 
a very lengthy structure if nested if structure depending upon the logic so let's get ourselves comfortable as always by writing the code on Jupyter Notebook because that make much more sense when we see things running on 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 the notebook so let's say a is uh, let's say again int let's say we take some number and if a is larger than 10 then we say okay print larger than 10 and do more stuff print let's say inside the top f condition okay then then maybe we have another check if a is uh, larger than 20 then say print um, greater than 20 uh, yeah greater than 20 and you can print now print inside the nested if okay else print else print um, smaller or equal to 20 smaller or equal to 20 and then print for example inside the else part of nested if uh, that's it and you can print here print outside all ifs fine so um, that's it that is that that's the structure so let's see let's give an input which is larger than by the way if input is not larger than 10 this if condition is false then you directly dive to this print statement and all this structure is not going to be executed this is this complete thing is called the body of this if condition and the body will only execute if the condition becomes true whether that condition is just a single condition or you have a combination of a lot of comparisons and a lot of booleans uh, whatever if this condition becomes true whatever that condition takes form of then then and only then you dive into this part and when you are in this part then that's a whole new universe then you are on its own in the new part in the new part for example um, if this condition becomes true then you are in this part that's the body of this particular if condition and that's the body of the else part see the the body of the top if condition has this kind of alignment all the statements that are in the body of if condition they start in the same alignment and all the conditions all the statements that are in the body of this particular if condition they have their own alignment and this indentation is necessary just to define for example which statement is in what kind of block for example if i just press a tab then another tab then this print statement is in this else part and this is the indentation that is defining the placement of this print if for example i press uh, i i align this with this uh, this particular structure here then this print statement is inside this if condition this is the indentation that is defining the placement of different uh, statements and if the print starts from here then it is completely outside of all if conditions it is like this way so let's run this code and see what happens let's say we print let's say we just write a equals let's say 12 so what do you think what should be printed if a is 12 then first of all this condition is true so greater than 10 will be printed inside the top if that will be printed then this check will be executed and this condition will become false because 12 is not larger than 20 then you will go to the else part and less or equal to 20 this number this string will be printed and then inside the else part of nested if that will be printed and then you will be out of all if condition then outside of all ifs that will be printed so let's see uh, whether whatever we have said is correct or not so yes um, greater than 10 inside the top if less or equal to 20 inside the else part of the nested if outside all ifs yeah 
So that's what the nascent if is. And by the way, you can have uh, you can have, for example, uh, more if conditions inside the nested ifs. For example, you can have one more condition here uh, if a is larger than 30 for example then do what then print it is larger than 30 as well uh, and further print maybe not necessarily that you always write print statements you can do any interesting stuff inside um, inside the nested if of nested if fine um, and then you can write the else part of this particular if condition here if you want to or or, or whatever uh, I mean you can have as hilarious structure as you want but that completely depends upon the logic um, or you may have an if condition inside that else part here for example you can write an if condition here if whatever that is also that is also perfectly fine so um, if a is larger than 20 then you print this if a is larger than 30 then this for example and let me write the else part here else print um, uh, less or equal to 30 and we can print inside the nested inside the else part of nested if of nested if okay so wow you see that program uh, let me let me just scale it down so that you can see that completely see that program I mean um, yeah it it makes perfectly sense to me for example you take an input if that is larger than 10 then you're here if it is larger than 20 then you are here uh, if it is not larger than 20 then you are here okay so let's say it is larger than 20 if it is larger than 20 then you are here further if it is larger than 30 then you are here otherwise you are here and once and by the way if a is not larger than 10 then you are directly here wow so let's run this code let me just scale it down so that you can see it more uh, uh, you can see more text let's say so let's run this uh, no errors great so let's say the number is uh, let's say 25 so what do you expect the result so the number is 25 is greater than 10 inside the top if it is greater than 20 inside the nested if it is smaller than or equal to 30 so inside the else part of nested if of nested if and then outside all the if conditions great yeah you enjoyed that I enjoyed that great okay so that's about the nested if uh, one more thing that I have already uh, told you but just let me tell you the power of indentation you are here for example in this particular if condition that's the if condition and that's the nested if and that's the else part of this if if you move this else part in in the indentation or the alignment with this if then this is else part of this if and this is not the else part of this if so remember the power of indentation the this is the indentation that defines which part belongs to what what kind of block or structure in in python in other languages sometimes for example in c++ they they normally use to write these curly brackets to define a block and their indentation doesn't really matter but in python this is the indentation that actually defines each and everything so for example the, this is a crucial example if this else just moves backwards and aligned with this if you get this else with this if these are two if and else structures this is still nested if without an else part and if this else move somewhere in between I mean if this is not aligned with this if this is not aligned with this if you get a syntax error because that is not a proper indentation so focus on indentation that is really really important um, yeah so although I have I've told you that the indentation has uh, already told you but the, uh, I just I just found to uh, make a slide over this else part because that's important sometimes you may get confused whether this else belongs to this if or that if 
Well, the indentation defines this else belong to what. Okay, I end this uh, uh, control flow indentation here. So uh, from next uh, video, we are jumping toward loops. But before loops, I, I just want to I just want to um, write a lengthy program in if else if their combinations. I, I just want to write a Jupyter program for you to um, to get comfortable with if nested if um, the the conditions that are ands and ors and nots or stuff like so. So so in the next video we will be practicing more on Jupyter for if conditions and then. From the next to next video, we will be jumping toward loops, the very, very powerful structure. Okay, hope to see you in the next video. Okay, so uh, let's just practice this if condition a little bit more. Uh, in this particular video, I'm, um, we are going to achieve a particular task. So let's design some task here. Uh, by the way, this is comment. Comment. Comment is, uh, it starts from a hash symbol and that's a statement that will never be executed this just describe your code for example so it, like it like it it is not there but it is there as a text but not as a code file uh, like hash uh, sometimes uh, represents a comment or description with a single line if your comment goes on multiple lines it is good to write a multi-line comment. So that's a single line comment, for example, single line comment. The multi-line comments, they start with um, three quotes and then end with three quotes. So whatever you write inside in, these, uh, in this particular block, that's a multi-line comment. So let's describe our problem in this multi-line comments because that's the problem in form of text and then um, we will be solving that problem um, using using the code. So that's just description of the problem. Let's say a user will enter a floating point number number. Let's say two thirty eight point nine one five. Let's say okay. Your task is is to so let's uh, just let's just more readable your task is to find out the uh, integer portion integer portion before the decimal before the point let's say for before the point in this case in this case it is uh, 238 and then and and then check whether if that integer portion is uh, an even number or not so just print yes or no uh, so print even if it is even number otherwise print odd so that's the that's the problem statement that's the problem that we're going to solve and this is just comment now we are outside the comment that's a multi-line comment um, yeah so um, how to how to solve that problem um, yeah, how to solve that problem. So let's start solving this problem. Uh, I'm going to spend some time on this program just to get comfortable with the if conditions. Let's say, let's say that number is x is input. Let me convert that input. Enter a, a real number, let's say. Okay, we are just assuming that the user will enter a real number. Uh, it, it's a real number. Um, real number might be, I mean, 238.0, that's a real number, or 238 itself, that's also a real number, that's okay. 
but we are not assuming that the user will enter, let's say, some characters like A, B, C, or stuff like so. Just, just assuming that. Okay. Now, assume that X contains a real number. It may be an integer by default. Maybe user just enters 10, and that's it. So it may be already an integer. Then we have to check whether that 10 is um, whether that 10 is uh, uh, even or not. Uh, or the user may enter 11.7, or the user may enter minus 34.7, or the user may enter just zero, or user may enter just 0 0.3535. There are a lot of possibilities that the user come up with. Uh, this X can contain any kind of number, and we have to check according to. So how can we move? Let us just see whether that number let us just extract the decimal portion, the, the portion uh, before point. Uh, let us just extract that. How can we extract that? Um, um, there are two conditions. First of all, let's see if x is positive, then do what? Else do what? So let's write this structure first. If x is positive, then what we have to do and if x is uh, negative, then what we have to do. So if x is positive, then what we do, we, uh, uh, we just, um, so what should we do? Uh, I'm just stuck here. How can we extract the, the decimal portion, the portion without uh, this particular thing? Um, how can we extract that? Um, that's, that's tricky. That's kind of tricky. Um, yeah. So, any any ideas? Uh, I guess this uh, the the structure I have I'm using. Uh, let us just first think that x is positive. Just make our life easier. And then, if x is positive, it's a positive number. How can we extract this portion out? Just the number that is below uh, that is before the decimal point. What what should we do? Can we can we can we apply apply around function? Will that help? Um, X will that help? Helps. Yes. Or no. Round function. So let's say y contains the rounded value of um, X. Then so what? Then how can extract? How can we extract the? Uh, the, the decimal portion, the, the portion, the integer portion. Or maybe there is a function that actually uh, round downs. Let me check whether there is a function floor or not. No, floor is not a function, I guess. So let's say round x. Okay, now y contains the rounded val value for whatever the x is. We are now assuming that x is positive. Okay, then what? Now, if, if y is larger than x, that means we moved up, okay? Uh, we moved up, the round goes up. In that case, what we do is uh, we just subtract, uh, uh, so the inte let me, so we just subtract the integer portion. So the, uh, let me, integer portion. Let's say that's our variable name. Then the integer portion is simply y minus one. Is that correct? Is that correct? If y is larger than x, then integer portion is simply uh, y minus one. For example, for example, just just think about it. If uh, when 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 for example, if the value was twenty nine point uh, six, and the rounded value will become thirty, so thirty minus one will be twenty nine. That is what we are we are what we are interested in. So yeah. So otherwise, if, for example, else, else, if y is not larger than x, then y itself is an integer portion. y itself is an integer portion. Is that correct? I mean, is that making sense to you? That if, for example, if, um, if x is larger than if x is larger than, if the rounded value of x is larger than uh, uh, larger than x itself, then we just subtract one and we get the uh, the portion. Otherwise, 
uh, the rounded value itself is the portion. Just, just let's just run this, uh, run this code for now and check whether what whatever we have done so far is correct or not. So after that, just print, let's say the integer portion. Integer portion. Let's just print that. Okay. So enter a number. Let's say the number is, uh, let's say twenty five point three. 25.367 let's say obviously the integer portion here is 25 so let's say let's see our program returns 25 and not oh the result is 25 magically oh my god we found 25 let's run it again let's run it again just to see uh, Okay, let's run this again. And this time let's give it to 45.8. Okay, the integer portion is 45. But when we will round, we will get 46 and 46 minus one, we will dive into this particular if condition. Let's see. Uh, oh, the result is 45. We are, we are still moving very well. Uh, great, that's, that's great. So, okay. Um, let's play with it. Uh, let's let's give uh, let's give 0 0.2. The result should be zero. It is zero, right? Um, let's run it again and give it let's say let's say four. That's it. The result should be four now. It is four. Great. So we are working very well. We have extracted the integer portion as long as the number was positive. Okay, great. Right. What if the number will be negative? Let's say that was true if that was true. So that whole logic works if x was positive. So if x is positive, then whole this logic just works. Uh, okay, then um, else, what should we do? If x is positive, then this logic works. If x is not positive, then what will happen? Then how can we find out the integer portion? Because first we have to find out the integer portion and then we have to find out whether that integer portion is even or not. Finding out whether that integer portion is even or not might be simpler, but first we have to find out the integer portion. So for example, uh, let's check the behavior of round function on negative numbers. Let's say round. Uh, minus 9.3 so the result is minus 9 okay if we say okay round minus 9.6 the result will be minus 10 so it looks like the same as working in the positive number so round function is actually working roughly the same way it should work in the positive numbers okay so what should we do here any idea maybe we maybe we first convert uh, maybe we first convert by the way uh, yeah maybe we first convert the number let's say y equals round x again like before but then what uh, then what so maybe this rounding helps the same way maybe the rounding helps the same way we should extract this x out from this here because it is going to work in the else part as well. Why to compute it? Why, why to write this redundant code? So y is round x, let's say. Then if y is greater than x, what should we do? Um, if it is negative, y is greater than uh, then what would what will be the portion? Um, it will be the integer portion will be portion will be what um, y minus one or what y plus one yes you got the answer that's y plus one great and else I guess we have uh, integer portion equals y itself I guess Yes, I guess that's the uh, that's the code. That's the code. I guess let's check by the way, but I guess that's the code. 
By the way, this else part is um, this else part is same in both of these conditions. So maybe uh, maybe we can combine this code and write a more elegant code, but um, I guess this will work. Let us just print the uh, integer portion just to check whether we are working well so far or not. So let's enter, uh, let's say 12.3, the result is 12, great. So it did not change our previous, I guess, our previous logic. So let's say there is minus 9.8. Now the integer portion should be minus nine. Oh, it is returning 10. Why is that? Um, why is that? Um, oh my God, this should be changed. When it is round, it may go that way. Or when it rounds, um, it actually becomes lesser than 10 because when it rounds, it goes up and it becomes lesser than in negative world, this condition should flip. Yeah, so we are making an error here. Let's fix that. Okay, let's run this again and see. Let's say minus 9 point minus 93.2 minus 93 great so then we have let's say let's run it again minus 8.9 minus 8 I guess we are working perfectly fine once we have integer portion with us we just write here uh, at the very end if integer portion integer portion remainder with 2 if that equals to zero, if that equals to zero, print even. Otherwise, else print odd. That's it. That's the whole program. Let's see and let's see how is it running. Let's say 22.6. It's even. Let's say. Uh, um, minus 87.3 that's odd great so you see the power of if condition and and how can we think uh, in writing these programs and stuff like so uh, that was a lengthier video I know but uh, I guess you get a very good look and feel of of if conditions and thinking and building a logic and all that stuff so uh, in the next video we will start loops so that's a beautiful structure. Hope to see you in the next video. The best way to understand loops is to think about in a repetitive structure or repeating structure. Let me let me give you an example and we will we will dive into this code in a while. The example is let's say a user gives you a number, let's say integer number, um, and you want to print all the numbers till that number. Let's say you start from one and you keep on moving and printing all the numbers as long as you reach that number. So for example, if user enters, let's say five, your goal is to print one, then print two, then print three, then print four, and then stops, then stop, just stop. Or uh, let's say if user print, uh, if, if user enter, let's say, uh, three then you print one you print two and then you stop um, this is easy if user in enters an n we can just print uh, we could have written this thing print print i let's initialize a variable i with one print i and then i equals to i plus one or in Python we can write this quickly as i plus equals to one that means i uh, uh, that means in i store i plus one uh, this is the short form of writing this and then after that you just apply an if condition for example here you can apply an if condition and say okay if i is smaller than n you keep on printing and after printing you just increment again this uh, then check the if condition and keep on moving. Well, that is feasible if n is 5 or n is 3. What if, if n is, let's say, 50,000? I, I mean, you're writing all that structure again and again and again. I mean, that's a whole lot of code. Well, the loops are just a solution of this kind of structure. When you want to perform 
same kind of task again and again, the loop gives you the facility to do that. For example, let's just consider a while loop. This is again a condition uh, similar like a condition in if condition. Like, like in if condition, you evaluate this uh, Boolean expression. That, that's an expression that results a Boolean value. While this condition is true, you will stay in this block. And after executing whole block once, you check this condition again. If this condition is again true, you will dive into this block again, then check the condition, dive into the block, then check the condition, dive into the block. As long as this condition stays true, you stay in the block, you, you move inside the block. Once this condition is false, then you exit this while loop, then the loop terminates and you move on to uh, the further processing. Just like in if condition, just like if conditions, if if the condition becomes false, you exit that if condition and you could move on, moved on. So in this particular case, for example, if n is five, let's say if n is five, user give an integer number that is five, i is equal to one. Now one is smaller than five. The condition is true. You move inside. You print i. The value of i is one. So that's what you print. You print one. Then you change i, you increment i with one. That means i equals i plus one, so i becomes two. Now the body of the loop finishes, that's whole body of the loop. The body of the loop can have many, many statements, a whole block of code. Um, once i becomes two, you move on and you check, okay, two is smaller than five. Yes, it is true. You move inside the block again, you print two. Then you update i the loop body finishes once the loop body finishes you go and check the condition again whether that condition is still true or not it is still true the i is 3 i is 3 is smaller than 5 yes you move inside you print 3 you update i you check the condition 4 is smaller than 5 yes you move inside you print 4 and then you update i and then you move on now 5 is smaller than 5 false once the condition is false you will not dive into the body of the loop, you will exit the loop and you will print done. And that's it, done. So this loop becomes very, very, very handy in, 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 in applications that have repetitive structures and in most of the interesting programs, most of the interesting problems, these are the loops that play uh, a very huge role. Uh, so let's go to Jupyter just to uh, get our hands uh, get our hands on this loop, for example. Let's say x is, uh, again, let's say int or n. Let's take n. n is int input. Let me make this uh, a little bigger just to, let's say that input. And input is a number, let's say n i is your certain um, let's say uh, let's say one while i is smaller than n uh, you may have written this uh, parenthesis just to uh, just to create the readability just to make the readability and um, otherwise i mean uh, this is also okay that's perfectly fine if as long as i is smaller than n, keep doing the following. You, what you do is print, for example, the square of i. Print the square of i. That's a square of i, let's say. And then you say, um, print, for example, uh, this is iteration number. And then you just print i. That's the iteration number i of the loop. That's the iteration number i. Um, uh, this is just a string. This is just a string. And that's a variable. Its value will be printed. Uh, this print function takes as many arguments as you pass. So you can, you can write a comma here and continue whatever you want to print. That's a very flexible function. Okay, then what you do, you say, okay, i plus equals to one. By the way, uh, this i plus equals to one is the same as i equals i plus one. You see, uh, I have just commented here just to explain what this is doing. If I just write i equals i plus one, that is also that is also uh, 
correct in Python, but that's kind of a shorthand. Okay, and that's it. Um, now, again, when I de-indent, I'm outside the loop. This is print loop done, for example. So that's the code, for example. So let's run this code. Let's run this code. For example, uh, let's say n is equal to 5. Then um, we have 5. So this is 1. This is the iteration number 1. Then 2 square is 4. This is the iteration number 2. Then 3 square is 9, the iteration number 3. Then 4 square is 16. This is the iteration number 4. And then the loop finishes. That's it. That's the first snapshot of the loop. We will continue from here onwards in the next video and I will show you more and more flavors of this loop. So hold on and uh, wait for the next video. Okay, in the previous video we saw a while loop uh, and we saw one, uh, one program related to while loop just printing, uh, just printing a bunch of numbers till a particular number. Well, when you are inside the body of the loop, that's a whole new, uh, you, you can write whatever you want to write. For example, you can, you can apply an if condition inside the body and check that an, at each iteration a particular decision should be made or not. For example, in this particular case, I'm going to print i uh, whenever i is an even number. So i is some number. If it is even, then print it else pass. This pass statement, for example, is just a statement of saying that do nothing. It is just a shortcut of writing do nothing. We could have we could have omitted the whole else part along with this pass and still the code is equivalent. But sometimes writing this pass make uh, the code readable just. Uh, uh, so, so writing this pass statement just means do nothing and just move on. Um, if we omit else statement and we omit this parse, that's perfectly okay. So, uh, for example, let's try run this code. Let's say n is let's say n is five. Uh, I equals one. Uh, one is less than five. Yes. One is not an even number. So go to else part. Else means pass, which means go on, and then um, increment i. This print statement is outside the loop. This is this is aligned with this while. This is not inside the body of the loop. Otherwise, it should have been indent, uh, indented inside. Now i is incremented. i becomes 2. Now move back. 2 is smaller than 5. Yes. 2 remainder 2 is 0. Yes. So print 2. So 2 will be printed. Because if executed, else will not execute and i will increment. Because i is not inside the if condition. It is inside the body of the loop. So i incremented, i becomes 3, you go back, 3 is smaller than 5, yes, 3 remainder with 2 is 0, false, so pass, i, I plus 1, so i becomes 4, 4 is smaller than 5, yes, 4 remainder 2 is 0, yes, so print 4, so else will not execute, now increment i, once you increment i, you get, for example, i equals 5, now 5 is smaller than 5, false. So you go out of the loop and you print done. And that's what this code is. So you can have if condition inside the loop. You can have nested if inside the loop. <coughs> you can have loop inside the loop, nested loops. Uh, we will see examples of nested loops as well. I mean, that's, that's all allowed uh, or sometimes really required. Okay, so... Uh, Next, there are two uh, important statements uh, that are there. One is break, one is continue. I want to focus these statements because they have a deep link with loops. A break statement wherever written inside the body of the loop tells that exit the loop immediately. Whenever this break is encountered, whenever this break executes, it exits the loop immediately and brings you outside the body of the loop. That's what it does. Break. So, for example, if i becomes uh, if i becomes divisible by 17 and the remainder becomes zero, you will print a break. 
and then when this break statement will execute you will exit the loop immediately regardless of what is the value of i what are other states whatever break exits the loop okay great now the continue continue statements um, continue statement wherever encountered continue brings the next iteration loaded regardless of the remaining remaining uh, statements in the loop for example when this continue will be executed no matter how many statements are there onwards that are there in the body of the loop the loop will not finish it its iterations iteration by going through all the remaining statements but it will start another iteration immediately so continue basically skips the remaining a body of the loop and starts another iteration. Uh, here I have written this uh, true. True means while true means always run. Uh, you might be thinking always run. It, it's an infinite loop. Will it? Will it? When we will exit the loop because this true statement will always stay true. We're not changing this true anymore. There is no condition here. That's true. While true means always go inside the loop. But once where, whenever this break is encountered, you are outside the loop right away and this break exits the loop this continue skips the remaining uh, remaining portion of the loop body and starts the new iteration starts another iteration so this continue means start another iteration immediately uh, skip the rest of the rest of the statements so uh, rest of the statements inside the loop body okay so let's just um, practice this break and continue just just in Jupyter notebook to get a better look and feel of uh, the loop so let's say uh, we have let's say again let's say uh, n equals let's say 10 or we might have taken that as an input let's say n is equal to 10 uh, while uh, true which means keep moving uh, we might have taken some value here i equals let's say 1 while true if i remainder with let's say 9 if that is equal to 0 then just break the loop else else uh, else uh, what you do is really you increment uh, else what you do is uh, if i is uh, is if i is not divisible by 9 then what you do is i equals i plus 1 that's true oh, by the way previously we we have written this way so either way is fine whether you write a short form or this form so else this okay uh, and that's that's it the the loop finishes uh, that's the loop uh, after the loop you just write okay print the loop is done done so let's see what's the output the output is done straight away and the reason is uh, well, why it is oh one is not one is divisible by nine only then you could have break uh, while true why why the loop oh it does not print anything we could have printed some statements so that we know that we went inside the loop or not uh, okay so inside if so for example print inside else so let's run this again oh okay great inside else inside else inside else inside else the first time it go inside if that time it breaks and it goes out and prints done that's what this break statement does so let's see an application of continue statement. Let's, uh, for example, just copy and paste that code into another cell and see how this continue works. So let's say uh, we have a loop like so. So what we say is uh, like this. If I is nine is not equal to zero if this is the case if i is not divisible by nine what you do is 
you get take i plus equals to one and then continue continue to the next statement and whatever else you write here for example print something um, print something else something else whatever that will not be printed and once the continue will will be encountered whenever this i is um, whenever this i divisible by 9 is not true if i is then you continue once this i is divisible by 9 for example then you will not follow then you will not dive into this if condition only then these two statements will be printed because uh, this this continue will not allow anything further that should happen and once these are printed let's say we break our loop right there let's say so if for example for the very first time one is not divisible by nine so i equals two so continue these three statements will not be executed the next loop the next loop the next loop once this if condition becomes false this continue will not operate and then we print this statement then only then we will print this statement and only then we will break and we'll exit the loop and print the done so let's print here print inside if so let's run this code let's run this code and see what happens that's the code um, maybe i should i should just yeah that's a better font let's run this code so when the code is run inside if inside if inside if you see when you when you are inside if when you continue when when this is the body of the if condition when if condition completes it should print these two things but continue is telling uh, the cursor to go back to the next iteration and move on and once this if condition becomes false only then you get this this thing printed this thing printed if this break was not there you do you then again was going to the while loop and you will be running an infinite loop and then you have done so that's uh, what this continue and break does so um, in the in the in the very next uh, video we will see another kind of loop here we saw the while loop in the next uh, video we will see a for loop uh, very powerful and very famous kind of loop for uh, it, it does almost the same stuff as while loop while the while loop runs uh, based on a condition the file the for loop it runs based on counter it's a counter loop that many times it should run and so on so we will see the details of for loop and uh, the applications of for loop in the next video hope to see you in the next video okay in this video we are going to discuss for loop another kind of loop in the previous video we saw while loop although most of the stuff almost all of the stuff can be achievable through while loop but sometimes it becomes handy to apply for loop um, in this particular uh, example i'm going to populate a list uh, so before actually uh, moving towards for loop let's see very shortly what a list is although we are going to we are we are going to uh, uh, explore this list in in much more detail when we will discuss the data structures module but just for the sake of example a list is a collection of different kind of elements for example two three four that's a list of th three elements so two three and four the list can contains different type values for example two three point four and stuff like so we can access different elements for example l of zero means the very first element the indexing this is called the index the index starts from zero then index one is so if we print for example print l of zero the result will the result that will be printed will be two similarly we can append more values inside a list append let's say 53 and the list after this append operation the list will be having these values 2 3 4 uh, 53 uh, we can remove delete update and do a lot of stuff we will see lists in detail but just for this example just think that list is collection of a lot of elements 
and we can add insert more elements we can delete elements we can change elements and so on or we can just initialize the list with just an empty list and start inserting elements one by one and expanding that list okay now this is an empty list for example and for i i is just a variable for i in this range is an iterator range 10 means uh, sequentially give a number one by one starting from zero start from zero uh, give them num give numbers one by one for example first time give zero I will contain zero second time give one third time give two and so on after every iteration the range will give another number as long as the numbers they are smaller than 10 so the last number that this range will return will be nine so whatever this is written inside is not included and it starts from zero so as long as i is in this range i is lower than 10 as long as that you that's the body of the loop just like the body of the while loop so first time i will be zero and zero is smaller than 10 okay you print i i plus one and append the square of that in a list then next time this range will automatically return the next number into i now next time i will contain a one next time i will contain two next time i will contain three four five six seven eight and nine once the value of i becomes nine that's the last iteration of this body of the loop and after that the loop finishes so let's just try it on this uh, very very first time i will be zero when the loop enters uh, its body very first time i will be zero and one will be printed because we are printing i plus one at that time the list and the empty list will be having one number which is zero square so list will be having just one number zero because zero square is zero next time i will be one and we will print two and the list will contain one square which is one next time i will be three we will uh, i will be two we will print three and we will be having a square of two which is four and so on till so on till uh, 10 here when the i will be 9 we will print, print 10 and in this list we will be having 9 square which is 81 i guess and after that the loop finishes and we will be out of this loop um, okay let's see this uh, let's see example of this in uh, in jupiter just to get more comfortable with with the list as well as the for loop so let's see um, let's say we have an empty list let's say an empty list just consider a list like this l is just a variable you can write another variable name that's a variable name l okay so for i in range in is a keyword range is a function in is a keyword i in range for example let's say 10 what you do is you print you print i plus one or whatever you want to do that's the body of the loop and l dot append that's a function of the list we will see that in detail uh, in the data structure sessions okay and that's it the loop finishes uh, when you finish the loop just print the whole list so let's say print the list and you can see the result one two three four five six seven eight nine ten and that's the well these are the values in the list uh, as as I mentioned earlier all these are the values by the way this range function actually uh, if what if we want I to jump more than just one uh, for example we we want I to start from zero it reaches 10 and let's say we want the jumps to be taken as two rather than one and one so the very first time uh, so that's the start location that's the end location which is not included start location is included end location is not included and that's the step size so very first time i will be one you move inside then a jump of two will be taken the next time i will be uh, so very first time the i will be zero then you uh, move inside then the jump of two then you move inside then a jump of two then you move inside as long as you stay smaller than 10 you will move inside the loop body of the loop so let's see what now printed Let, let's print just i rather than i plus one uh, oh there is an error what's the error zero oh the range function does not have colons 
it has actually commas. Sorry, my mistake. Uh, I was just a MATLAB user once, so MATLAB actually has these colon things. Uh, so I was just confusing MATLAB notation with this. Okay, great. So, um, so first time I was zero. Next time a jump of two, I becomes two. Next time a jump of two, I becomes four. Then I become six. Then I becomes eight. And next time I becomes ten, but ten is not included, so you're out of the loop. And that's the squares that you got. Um, it, it is not necessary that you always start from zero. You can start from one and you can j take a jump, for example, a jump of three. And it's not necessary that you just reach 10. You can reach, for example, 20. It's up to you. It's completely your choice. And in that case, you have this kind of iterations. So this range function really is helpful for iterating over a, over a loop body or a structure. OK, great. So that was introduction of for loop. And we have iterated here on uh, on a list. We, we just have actually populated a list using for loop. Okay, in the next video, we will see more details of this for loop and um, more fun stuff. Okay, hope to see you in the next video. Last time we saw a for loop uh, in the last video and magically this else has something to do with for loop in Python. Well, this else clause makes sense for if um, but in for loop, um, it hardly makes sense. But let me let me let me try to make sense of else clause for for loop. There is an else part of for loop as well in Python, not in other languages. I, I don't know any other language that has this else part. Maybe there is some, but I don't know. Um, so this else part in Python, particularly in for loop, uh, this else part or else else block will only execute if for completes its iterations. For example, uh, this is a set. Uh, a set like a list is, uh, is a collection. List is defined by square brackets. Set is defined by curly brackets. The set is just similar like the set in mathematics. We will see the set lists, tuples, uh, dictionaries, and many of these data structures in detail in data structures portion, but just I have introduced this. Just consider this set has three elements, apple, 4.9, and cherry. Apple is one object or one uh, data. 4.9 is one data, which is a floating point data, and cherry is one data, which is a string data. Okay, so this S has three elements, three different elements. So now for X in this set, as long as X is in the set, the very first time the X will be apple, so it will print apple. Next time X will contain a 4.9 as long as, so I iterate over this set, as long as X is inside the set, pick elements one by one and just print them all. Okay, we expect that when X is apple, when the very first time X will be apple, it will print apple. Next time X will be 4.9, it will print 4.9. Next time X will be cherry, it will print cherry. And the loop ends because there is no item in set to iterate over. Because the loop finishes its uh, complete iteration, there are expected three iterations and the loop finishes those. Now the else part will execute and you will say, okay, loop completes its iterations. Well, you will be wondering in what case the else will not, uh, else will not execute. If you apply any break statement inside the loop body, which means you forcefully, uh, you forcefully remove some of the iterations that were going to be executed, but the loop did not complete it, did not complete its iterations, then the else part will not run. Uh, so let's see an example in in uh, in Jupyter to get a good grip on this uh, else. Okay, let's define a set s. Um, s is a variable name, you can have any variable name, let's say apple, or let's say 4.9, I guess. And then we were having, let's say, um, cherry, if the, if these spellings are correct, I guess, cherry. Okay, then for x in s, as long as x is in s, print x, fine, else, print, when you finish the loop terminates, 
with success or all iterations it completed all its iterations and this is a statement that is completely outside the loop outside the loop so let's run this so you can see apple 4.9 cherry loop terminates with success outside the loop okay now you might be thinking in what case this uh, else will not execute okay if for example uh, as long as x is in n if i say okay let's say i take a counter here uh, i equals one that's a counter let's say and every time i just increment i i plus equals one and then i check if uh, i is uh, equal to 3 if i is equal to 3 then just break let's say um, else just for readability else pass now this else is else of this for and this else is else of this if and this pass statement is just a statement for doing nothing now what you do when i is equal to 1 you print this i plus equals i becomes 2 2 is equal to 3 false so you pass you move on next time x will print 4.9 i will become 3 and 3 is equal to 3 that's correct the break will execute which means the loop should have one more iteration but the break just disrupt that one more iteration that should be there because the loop could not complete its iteration due to this certain condition this else part of the loop will not execute and you will go directly outside this loop so let's run this code and see the result so you can see this apple 4.9 outside the loop um, i would recommend also this um, else is there for for loop but um, i would recommend to avoid using else uh, in the beginning i mean it, you may be confusing this else by the way there, there is a there is a mistake here this else should be ended with a colon here okay so i would recommend to not use else clause for a for loop in the beginning until you you really need it because you may confuse this else with the with the else of if condition and you may think something else and the program behave in a different way so either way um, if you want to use else else for a for loop is there in python okay um, just one more example of for loop and uh, here we use dictionary i'm introducing some data structures here just for fun we will see these data structures in detail later on so dictionary that's a key value pair it is like a set but one item is consist of two numbers that's called a key and that is called a value that's a key and that's a value like a dictionary we have uh, key and values so now as long as x is in x uh, x represents to key and d is our dictionary and d of x represents to whatever value that x points to for example apple is a key that points to 44 cherry is a key that points to game for example if i write d apples apple the result will be 44 similarly d of cherry the result will be game okay so let's iterate over this dictionary using uh, this for loop all am i showing you that this for loop is very very handy of iterating over different data structures and a lot of data and stuff um, whereas while loop is more handy in checking the conditions and stuff although you can do all the stuff using while loop you can all the stuff using for loop but one is better over the other in certain in certain situations so uh, let's 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 just run this for a dictionary let's say i have a dictionary d it's defined like a set let's say my key is a and my value is 10 let's say my key is b and value is minus 19 and let's say my key is c and my value is let's say uh, a b c let's say that's my dictionary so for x in d print the key as well as the value of that key so now you can see 
Uh, the key is A, the value is 10, the key is B, the value is minus 19, the key is C, the value is A, B, C. So this for loop is really, really handy in iterating over a lot of data structures and stuff, although it has uh, other applications as well, but this is handy. Okay, great. Um, so that's about loops, for loops and while loops. These are two kinds of loops in uh, important loop. These are two important kind of loops in there in um, Python. In the next vi uh, video, I will directly go to Jupyter, uh, Jupyter Notebook, and we will be practicing for this for loops or while loops. Uh, we will be practicing the loops. We will be doing actually examples of nested loops. We will be actually solving a problem like we did in the if conditions. We solved a problem previously. We wrote a code for it. Uh, here, we will also write a code and we will be get a good grip on the loops. So hope to see you in the next video. We will solve a problem um, in Jupyter Notebook directly. Okay, hope to see you in the next video. Okay, welcome back. Uh, in this particular video, we are going to practice for loops or basically loops. So let's have a problem statement first. What problem we are going to solve? Let's have comments. And the problem we are going to solve is, let's define uh, given a list of of numbers, numbers, for example, i.e., let's say, 1, 2, 4, minus 5, 8, 7, 9, 3, 2, like this. Um, make another list. Make another list that contains all the items in sorted order from minimum to maximum, i.e. your result will be another list like in this particular case, we will be having minus 5, which is smallest. Then we will be having 1. Then we will be having 2. Then we will be having 2. Then we will be having 2. Then we will be having 3. So all the items, but in minimum to maximum sorted order. Then we will be having, I guess, 4. Then we will be having 7. And then we will be having 9. So that's your that should be your output in another list. So assume this list is available to you or any list is available to you assume this list is available to you so how to solve that problem let's start okay let's assume that the list is available let's say this is the list we are going to sort let's say this is available okay um, um, okay so what should be the the logic what should be the logic how can we solve that problem? Uh, this is uh, this is an easy looking problem, but it is not so easy. Let us first write, uh, 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 let, let us just simplify this problem to just finding out a minimum from the list. Let's say we are given a list and we just want to find out minimum number, one minimum from the list. So how can we move that? So let's say M is uh, some number, so M is, the very first value of the list, let's m is our variable, let's say. That's the first value. And what we do is for i um, in the, for i in L, as long as i is in L, if uh, i is smaller than m, then if i is smaller than m, then m should contain I otherwise do nothing uh, that's it so at the end print this M print this M at the end so print the minimum number let's say M great so um, so that's the that's the uh, basically um, so yeah that's the um, that's how we will find out just the minimum value so let's run this code and the minimum is minus 5 available to us. 
what if we want to store the minimum value as well as the position of that value? For example, um, we not only want to just find out what is the minimum number, we also want to, want to find out at what index, for example, here 0, 1, 2, and 3. At the third index, we found the minimum. What if we are interested in the index as well? So let's say if for the very beginning, the index is 0. And then what we do is uh, we moved on and uh, we say, OK, we, we maintain a counter. Let's say a counter is c equals uh, c equals zero, for example, right now, and c uh, just uh, plus equals to one. That's a counter, and then this idx is just that c, uh, whatever that c is. So whatever that index is, when we find this uh, c, that index is also there. So let's print the index as well as the minimum value so okay so at the position 3 at index 3 we found the minimum value okay now we have written a, a kind of a code block that helps us finding out the minimum value how can we actually um, how can we actually um, do how can we actually so the basic logic is you find the minimum value and swap that value um, with the very first value okay great and then uh, move the loop next time find out the minimum value from the remaining list and swap that minimum value with the second value next time you find the minimum value as long as the position and swap that with the third value and so on so do that stuff and uh, just rearrange the same list um, using this but but how can, so that's the logic, find out the minimum value, swap it with the first value, and then start from two till end, start from, this, start from the remaining values, find the minimum, swap it with the first value of the remaining list, then reduce the list uh, step by step and you will be having a sorted order. But how to start with, how to find out like this, how to, how to do that? So, any idea, I mean, we are going to, so for example, in this particular case, if I want to swap the list, what I will do is I will say, okay, swap with zero at the, at the, at the zero. So I will contain a temporary variable. Temporary variable will contain the value of zero, this zero. So what I will do is at list zero, write the minimum value and uh, the minimum value, uh, so at zero you write the minimum value, but at this particular index, from where we found the minimum value, just place the, just place the, uh, the value at the very beginning. So in, after that, after that operation, the minimum will be at the first position or the zeroth index and that value will be, so minimum value will be swapped with the very first value. So let's run this code and see what a list looks like after that code. So you see, for example, the minimum value is swapped by the first value, whatever the first value was. But we want to do the, that progressively for, for the rest of the list, we want to find out the minimum and swap with the first one for the rest of the list and keep on moving. How can we do that? So um, yeah, that's a, that's a, so let me define for, so let me first indent that a bit. Let's say control right places that will indent all my code. So for J in range uh, length of the list, whatever the length of the list, let's say for J is that. So what I do is M is um, the Jth value, the index right now is J and the C is also, um, C is also, um, the counter C is also starts from J. Okay, great. Now we want I to start with, uh, to now we want this I to start from J and move onwards, yeah. So let's say I in range, start from J and go till length of L. 
one by one take the step of one okay great so what next um, now the value will be L of I rather than simply um, L of I rather than simply I in that case you do this okay and the index is just C okay great keep on keep on introducing this index again and again uh, after this loop what you do is you pick the jth value you swap the jth value with the minimum and you do that and that's it you keep on moving and after after the outer loop finishes if you print your list you will be having the list sorted order at least we hope so so maybe there is a bug in the code maybe there is a problem in the code but we hope this will work what we are doing progressively by the way this is a nested loop this is a loop inside the loop and that's uh, and then we have an if condition inside the nested loop uh, loop inside the loop great uh, let's see how it how it works if there is no oh there is an error length of range oh we haven't write a colon there don't forget this colon that's a problem oh we have a sorted order oh my god we have a result with us you see the applications of this uh, oh one three is missing where is three uh, we have two threes oh the output we have written here is wrong there's no two threes there's only one three so you have sorted a list um, if you remember we we have written a similar kind of code in the problem so problem solving session very earlier where we solve this problem using selection sort but there we just wrote a pseudocode and here we have uh, a code much simpler than um, ac actually the Python code. Uh, if the problem was just sorting, there are built-in functions to do that, but I'm just telling you how these loops and if conditions and all that stuff can be used uh, to communicate with each other, to match with each other, to, to actually perform a problem solving task when given a problem. Um, although we will see later on in Python most of the problem solving tasks, I mean many more of them, there are built in functions for those, there are available functions for those. You need not to write all that stuff, but to, mastering, to, to master any programming language, you have to go through these constructs so that for a new problem or for a very large, uh, complicated kind of problem, eventually you, you may need these kind of structures with you. So mastering these structures is really essential for problem solving and programming in general. So, okay, that's about the loops and if conditions and control flow, all of that. Um, in the next uh, video, I will, I will start talking about functions. So you have seen this LEM, that a function. You have seen this range, that's a, that's a function, iterator, although. Uh, you have seen round function, you have seen div mode, you have seen print function. What if we want to write our own function? How can we do that? From the next video, I'm going to show you how can we write our own function. Wow, isn't that great? That's great. So hope to see you in the next video. In this video, I will talk about functions. A very powerful construct in almost every programming language. Uh, Python also supports functions. Uh, what a function is, let me, let, me describe the, let me describe the need of the function by a scenario. Let me give you a scenario. The scenario is, let's say uh, you are writing a very lengthy program. Um, the program requires to print uh, particular messages whenever needed. For example, you need to print this particular message, the task, the task um, was successful. Let's say you need to print this and then you have to print moving to the next task, maybe to to inform somebody, maybe in, to inform your client, and then you have to ask, okay, send me the next task because I'm done with the previous task. Let's say you want to print this, or maybe you want to print more or do some more stuff. And let's say you want to do this again and again whenever needed. Somewhere, whenever you complete a particular task or something, you want to print all these messages. And then somewhere else, whenever a particular event occurs, you need to print all these messages again. Now one way to do that is to write just these print statements whenever needed in the program. One way is if you want to perform a task and the task has a lot of coding, maybe 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 very small amount of coding or maybe a very 
large amount or magnitude of the coding. In this case, we have just three statements, but maybe we have a task that we want to perform again and again, and it is really a very lengthy task in terms of the coding. So one way to do that is to just write all the coding in uh, coding somewhere and define a function. And that function means the function contain all the tasks that you need to perform. Whenever you need to perform that particular task, just in your coding, just call this one statement, just this one statement. And the whole task that is written under this, uh, under this uh, maintaining this as a heading, that will execute automatically. I mean, however, I mean, th that task that is under this heading may be very lengthy, may be short, may be, may be complicated, may be simple one or anything. But the need is, uh, we want to perform this task whenever we need, and we do not try to code this again and again. We do not try to code, we do not try to, we do not want to write the same lines of codes again and again and again and again in our program. Just write this particular lines of code once, define a function, just like a task. Whenever you need to perform that task, just call the heading or the name of the function and the whole task under that function will execute. Functions in almost all programming languages, they do that. Even in mathematics, they do that. In, in Python, the syntax of defining function is you, if you want to define a function, you have to first start with DEF, meaning definition or defining. Then you need to write the name of that function. The name of that function, name of function and name of variable has resemblance. I mean, the name of function should be descriptive. It should, uh, it should portray uh, what the function actually is doing. So it is good to write, it is good to suggest the names of the functions that are very descriptive to make the code readable and manageable. So here I have written the function name as print success. You can write any name. Then you start parenthesis, then you end parenthesis, and then you write a colon like you have written the colon for if conditions or for loops or any other constructs. And then you do indent like the body of the for loop, like the body of the if condition. This is the body of the function. Body of the function is all should all be aligned. Then you write all the task, all the coding that you need uh, to be performed whenever this function is invoked or called. This body can contain if conditions, for loops inside. I mean, this can have a whole lot of coding inside it. And whenever you will call this function, whenever you will type this command, wherever in your coding, the whole task under this will be executed automatically again and again, whenever you like. So um, let's take a look uh, of defining our first function in Jupyter Notebook. Let's just, uh, I guess, uh, yes. So, yeah. So that's our notebook. We were populating that notebook. So, by the way, if you if you want to know where this notebook is located, if I want to, uh, for example, uh, invoke that notebook again, uh, when you will run your Jupyter notebook from the Anaconda prompt, you'll be having all the files that you are working on. And one file is, for example, this, you just click on that and your file, one or more files, whatever you want to open up, they, that will open up in the Jupyter Notebook. Um, yes, so it is opening up. It's a lengthy file, so it may take, a, may take a second. Okay, let me just take a better zoom level, just to, okay. So we were working on that notebook. Let's define our first function. Let's say uh, def define let's say the function name is print success that's a that's a syntax then you press enter print i am done then print uh, um, send me another task let's say and that's it Let's say that's the that's the body of the function. The body of the function here contains only uh, two statements. Okay, then you run this uh, you run this command just like Shift Enter. You run this so that uh, it is 
it is reported in the symbol table there is a symbol table inside the python maintaining python is maintaining all the variables all the function information inside so once you run this cell then the it, then this print success function will be registered to python so that whenever you want to call this function again it will be available now if you want to perform this task let's say you want to perform uh, let's say you want to perform this task whenever you want so you just call this function this is called calling of the function whatever i'm doing now print success and that's it you press shift enter and the all the statements that are under this will be executed and you do some other stuff let's say uh, 3 plus 8 that is that is uh, 11 do some other stuff and afterwards if you want to do the same process again then you call this function again and all the coding inside the function will be executed it is very very handy if a particular task if you want to perform that task repeatedly it is good to just write one code for that task in a function and then just invoke function whenever you need uh, it, it it supplies a lot of managing power uh, a lot of debugging power uh, if, if you have an error for example inside the function you just go to the code you just go to the code of the function itself and fix the error and come back you need not to you need not to go all over the code if you have not defined the function and you have called these lines of codes everywhere inside your main code then it will become very difficult to handle and function actually provides uh, a lot of um, a lot of simplicity of managing and readability and a lot and a modular approach in that sense so that was our first um, that was our first function uh, we'll be talking about more uh, we'll be talking more about these functions uh, in the next video so hope to see you in the next video the function name should be descriptive that's okay um, but it is further uh, important sometimes to have a documentation of the function sometimes called the doc string uh, the doc string allows uh, you to write the description of the function but that description will never be executed it will be available whenever you need a help or you need to know what this function does um, sometimes it happens your function can contain a lot of code for example you have a particular function let's say uh, fun let's say it contains def fun and it does a lot of uh, a lot of complicated stuff inside and uh, it is sometimes required to 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 know what this function actually is doing so this document string is one way of describing what the function is doing you might be thinking that if if you're writing this document string inside the where the where the coding of the function should be written we should open up that the coding file and see what the function is doing or should we actually open up this function implementation where the function code is written and then we have to read what the function is doing actually python gives you another power if you have written the document string inside uh, that should be a top statement before the first coding statement whatever description you want uh, as a document string it will be available without actually opening up without without actually seeing what inside the function without actually opening up the file that contains the implementation of this function let's see uh, let's see uh, uh, to in jupyter notebook uh, in, in more concretely whatever i'm saying right now so for example let's define a function uh, def print success um, two let's say the function name this function is print success two um, uh, the function name is print success too although it's not a very descriptive name but um, the spellings are also not correct but that's fine um, print success too here i just define a document string uh, the document string may contain maybe just in one line or it may be a multi-line it is like a multi-line comment or maybe a single line comment if you want but uh, it starts with the uh, three quotes and ends with three quotes let's say i write here this function is doing nothing except printing a message printing a message let's say full stop and then 
I further define, let's say I define more in saying that that message is hello, let's say. Let's say, or, or any description you want for this function. Now, this is a document string and it will be available whenever you need. Now here the coding starts. Let's say you write a coding here and you get hello, let's say. And you run this code. Now let's say we are not seeing this function. We are, we are not available with this function. Uh, we are not available with the code of this function and we want to know um, what this function actually does. First of all, we can just write, if we write PRI and just press tab, the tab will allow us um, to access all the functions that are available with prefix PRI. So let's say we go to print success, print success, print success, uh, here print success, S should be capital, print success, let's say, uh, so print success two, let's say. And we write a question mark in front of it, and then just press shift enter, it will pull the document string, it will pull the document string, whatever we have written, and we will get to know what actually this, uh, this is doing. So this document string actually does uh, a lot of job. Further, if we, I mean, this is, this is kind of whenever we need to know what a function is doing, the document string is one way to just go and check what is, what is happening. Right now, this function implementation is in front of us, but in several times, the function implementation will not be in front of us. Several times, we will be, we will be accessing functions that other people have written in their libraries. Uh, and we need to know what those functions are doing. So document string is one very, very healthy way of describing our function. And I will recommend to make your habit writing document strings every time you write a function. Um, I was telling you that if you write a double question mark, then it will not only pull the document string for you, it will pull the whole implementation as well. So now if you see, uh, you this is the document string and that's the implementation. So whole implementation will be available if you want. And this is true for the functions that are, that are, that are the functions that are third party functions or some other person have written that function and so on. For example, you know a function length, we have called that function several times. So let's, let, let's, uh, let's see. So the document string is return the number of items in a container. That length function is not written by us. Somebody have written that function. That's a built-in function, by the way. And uh, we, we can, this document string tells us, okay, what this function is doing. We don't have the implementation of that function. Obviously somebody have written that function. And, um, and if we write the double, then we should get an, an implementation as long as the implementation is not in C++. Uh, I haven't told you that a lot of, a lot of implementation of Python itself has been done in C and some other languages, uh, C mostly. Uh, so several built-in functions, because of because of their speed, they are implemented in C. And if you if you want to get their implementation, they get their code. The code will not be available for most of the functions. So that's so whenever you write a double question mark and the answer is the same as a single question mark that's an indication that this particular function is not written in plain Python. It is written in some other language and is used in Python. That's another versatility or, or flexibility of Python. You can engage multiple languages inside. Okay, uh, one more thing. Uh, I can write help, uh, help command, and I can get this print success, um, success to, and uh, the, the help of print success too by just typing this help command. So uh, this help will tell us, you see the help is telling us the document string. I mean this help on this function. If, and this, and this is the function we have written. This is the function we have written. This function is doing nothing except whatever description we are giving there. If at some time, if we are supplying this function to somebody or making a package of a lot of functions that we are writing, these document strings will help to get to know how to use these functions. Uh, by just knowing the function name, we can, this document string actually tells us how the, what the function is doing. Wow, great. Oh, by the way, we haven't called this function yet. We are just playing with the document string. Let's call the function print 
now we know what the function is doing let's print let's call this function and whatever written inside the function will be called c this is only called this is just acting as a comment and it is basically a comment yeah okay great um, stay with us there is much more about function that we are going to tell you hope to see you in the next video okay in the last video we saw document string uh, you might be thinking what is power of this function if it is doing some static task well um, in this video I'm going to tell you that the function can the, the, the coding or the behavior of the function can be dynamic based on based on the arguments based on some properties that you will be defining at the call time for example the the function has uh, in in almost all programming languages the functions the most interesting functions are the functions that receives an argument and an, an argument is just considered an argument just as a variable and performs its task according to that to that arguments uh, argument just take a single a simple example let's say rather than having a function print success we have a function print message and it it prints whatever message it receives and at the call time for example we call this function like uh, so print message and let's say we call this as um, let's say success let's say now success will be printed next time we call the function and we give another argument maybe in a string let's say uh, 74 errors let's say that will be that will be printed or, or anything I mean anything that you supply will be printed Wow isn't that great I mean one function and uh, you, you might be thinking the plain print function does that what's the power of this well I'm just telling you the, the functions the function does not only contain one line I mean it can be a whole task depending upon this input argument and the whole task will perform dynamically based on based on what input argument you are supplying there um, you are noticing one one thing that I that I just forgot what is that thing I define this function um, I guess everything is fine I, I've, I've just I've just missed something oh document string I should have written document string although document string is not essential if you do not write document string it's perfectly okay the function will run but it's a good practice it's a it's a good habit to always write a document string okay let's see the power of input arguments by again going to our good friend Jupyter notebook okay so let's see let's say we define a function define print print message let's say and it receives an argument message and now, this argument is just a variable it's just a variable and let's say we say okay print message or further um, let's say we say um, if is instance message string if this is string then simply then simply print it if this is not a string then just say okay um, print your input argument is not a string and then you say okay here is what you have supplied and then you say okay whatever you have supplied just see okay message and that's it that's it that's a function um, we might have written a document string for it um, the function prints the message supplied by the user or prints that message is not in the 
form of string. Wow. Don't worry, we have to see the strings in detail. Uh, we, we will see the sprint function in detail as well because the sprint has a lot of lot to do with strings. Uh, so, so just for now, I mean, that's our function. Print message. Let's say if the message is uh, of string type, uh, this string does not, this, is, this should be simply str, this should not be that, is instance take like this. Your input argument is not a string, here is what you have supplied. Um, here is what you have, so here we can, we can say here is, here is, here is the type of what you have supplied. And then we can just print the type. Uh, and type of MSG. So the, the, the goal here is to just write a function that prints a message if that message is in plain string form. If it is not a string, then um, it, it prints that, okay, you're the, the, whatever you have sent is not a string, it is not a proper message in string form. Let's say this print message function receives a string, let's say that's our logic or something. So let's run this. Uh, first of all, let's see what it does. Help print message. Um, so the function prints the message supplied by the user. Uh, we, we can access the same help by uh, just mark if we want. Um, and it gives us the document string. If, however, we want the implementation as well, then we write a double quote and the implementation is also available. Wow, great. Python is really great. Okay, let's call this function. Um, yeah, let's call this function. Print message and whatever you want to print, let's say. Um, this is the message. This is the message. Let's say you want to print this. And this is the message that's printed. Okay, now let's say you call this function again sometime and you supply 23. And it will say your input argument is not a string. Here is the type of what you have supplied. It's an integer type, right? Um, you can you can have you can have you can call this function in the following way. Let's say you define a variable y and the variable y contains hello. Hello there. Let's say that's your, uh, and then you call the, uh, then you call this function on y, and it will print hello there because y is also a string. Great. So that's how you can, you can, you can, uh, you can pass different arguments and instruct the function how should it behave, without actually writing the whole logic of the task again and again. You have written all the logic once. Actually, this is actually the logic starts from here. That's what the task is to, that's what the task you want to perform. And you need not write this again and again whenever you need this kind of stuff. You just call that function, exploit arguments, and it will behave accordingly you want. Great. So you might be thinking that a function only receives one argument. Maybe we want to supply more than one arguments, maybe maybe two arguments, maybe three, maybe four, maybe five, and maybe we want to supply several arguments and we want to do some task based on the values of those arguments or, or those variables. So in the next video, I'm going to show you uh, multiple arguments. Okay, hope to see you in the next video. So in the previous video we saw we can define a function and we can supply input argument to it. And in this video, we are going to see that we can actually send more than one arguments to the function. These arguments are just variables. These are just variables. Whatever value we will supply to these dynamically, because Python is dy dynamically typed, dynamically their type will be defined. And for example, here we have supplied just two variables and we just printed them. But based, based on uh, supplying more than one input arguments, and based on what logic we are going to perform, we can do anything, we can do anything. Uh, so um, yes, Python allows us to supply 
uh, multiple input arguments to a function, and um, and 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 we can we can just perform uh, all the tasks according to whatever logic we are going to do with that. So let's go to our friend Jupyter Notebook and see an example of uh, a function with multiple input arguments. Let's say the function we 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 define a function. Let's say um, my power. Let's say my power my power let's say you remember there is a pow function in in python that's a built-in function i'm going to write my own function let's say uh, it contains a and b um, well document string um, my this function computes power just like built built-in power function great that's the document string okay uh, now what we want to do is we want to print um, okay let's 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 create another variable C that is a power B okay then we print this C and we are done let's say that's our goal so we register that function by just just calling the by just pressing the shift enter in Jupyter Notebook and now we um, check what this function does well uh, this function computes power just like built-in power function okay just to just to remind you again and again the the importance of document string I'm writing this again and again let's run this function my power let's say 3 raised to the power 4 I want this so the result is 81 oh my god so whenever by the way if you don't have pow function with you although you have um, you can you can create your function and whenever you want to use you can use your function not a big deal um, yeah by the way um, what if you um, what if you um, what if you let's you can you can define a function with more than two arguments define let's say um, display types let's say that's your function display types and all you know is uh, or or check arguments let's say check args let's say that's your function and a b c d let's say e these are the input arguments and let's say uh, at some task you want to know whether all the five variables that you are working in somewhere whether all of them are uh, numeric values or not if they're not numeric values you're not moving on and you are uh, doing something because you were expert let's say you are let's say you're taking input from somewhere reading from a file or whatever and you need to you, you need to check before moving on whether a b c d and e whether they are ints or floats otherwise uh, if 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 any of them is not int or float um, then you're not processing then you're not moving on and you are going to check the input arguments again and so on uh, these kind of functions are there because whenever you call certain uh, whenever you want to do processing on data sometimes it is required to check the type of the data whether the data is supplied in a way uh, that you were expecting and so on so let's have this function check orgs um, uh, I'm not writing document string here uh, I guess I've told you enough to write document string again and again um, so let's say if is instance a if uh, is instance int float if that is true uh, and um, is in let, let's just have three variables just to just to focus on if is instance a then b And um, is instance C if all of them are if all of them are 
if all of them are integers or floats then do something then let's say print uh, a plus b plus c maybe or a plus b plus c raised to the power 2 just print their square let's say else um, or or if they are if they are all integers or floats then do some interesting task here some task otherwise uh, you can say okay print and error um, the input arguments are not of the expected types fine you have this function let's say let's call this function um, the function was check args so let's check args check args check args let's say three four five so now you have all of them are great let's say you have uh, check args and uh, you call this check args on let's say three four but this five is a string let's say g now you'll be having an error the input arguments are not of the expected types uh, one of them or more of them or whatever uh, yeah one more thing uh, uh, the this function is expecting three arguments if you call this function by less than three or more than three arguments you'll be getting an error for example three four um, although this function is accepting three arguments you are calling it with just two you're getting an error because you have not specified all the arguments that the function is requiring although the the arguments that you have supplied they are of the type that it is expecting but you have not supplied the, the, the number of arguments that the function is expecting. Similarly, if you call this function by more than uh, three arguments, although it requires three arguments, you again will get an error because it is expecting three arguments and you have not apply, supplied three arguments. Later on, uh, in, in, uh, later on, we will see how to write a function that accepts variable number of arguments uh, we will see that but right now in this particular way if you write the function in, if you define the function in this particular way you have to define the arguments the number of ar whatever the number of arguments it is expecting you have to supply exactly as many otherwise you are getting an error okay so that's about the multiple arguments um, okay what next well um, Next time, we, uh, in, in the next video, we will see that uh, what, is the, what is the importance of order of these input arguments. What will happen if I just swap message two and message one? Will that, will that change the behavior or is there any order? Uh, the, first mess, the first variable, the second variable, third variable, is there any ordering inside the input arguments? Um, yeah, there is. So let's see in the next video. In the last video, we saw how can we pass multiple, how can we define a function with more than one input arguments. It is important to know that the order of the input argument is really, really important. Um, so whatever argument at the call time, for example, if you call this particular function, the name of the function is f, that's not a great name. You should have a name that is descriptive, but um, I recommend to write good names. Uh, let's say this is f, that's a function, and the very first variable is c2, the, the second variable is c1, the third variable is c3. Now you let's say call this function like, like this, let's say 2, 4, and 9. What will happen is this 2 will be copied in c2, this 4 will be copied in this c1, and this 9 will be copied in this uh, c3. Now c2 has a value 2, c1 has a value 4, and c3 has a value 9. Um, if you change the symbols or the variables order here, uh, whatever order you have written there, 
the first value that is passed at the call time will be passed to the first variable, whatever the name of the first variable is. The second value at the call time is copied in the second symbol, whatever the name of the symbol is. Uh, so this ordering is really, really important. One way to uh, work, one workaround for this is at the call time, you actually define the variable names and their values. For example, you call you call F and you say, okay, C1 has this particular value. But this way you need to know that there is the, the symbol name in definition is exactly C1. So C1 has this value, C2 has this value, C3 has this value. Once you, at the call time, if you have defined your variable names along with their values, then you are order free. Now you change whatever, you, whatever if for example you call this way, C2 is B, C1 is A, now, no matter in what order you have called these, this C1 is going to be copied in C1, this C2 is going to be copied in C2, and this C3 is going to be copied in C3. Uh, for the functions that has many more arguments, it is, it, is good to, it is good to call the function in this particular way if there is a chance that uh, calling a function in a different order may, 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 may become confusing and stuff like so. This actually gives you more grip on this ordering issue. Um, if, 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 you're, if you're happy with, if you're very smart and you say, okay, I will always supply in a particular order, I will always read the document string first and then I will call that function, that's okay. Otherwise, this is also a feature that is available. At the call time, you assign the values of uh, the functions that are there at the definition time. And now, no matter in what order you are calling that function, C1 occurs at third position, C2 occurs at first position, the relative values will be copied according to their names. So, um, and that's a good feature. That's a very good feature. Let's see, for example, a uh, running example of this in, in Python, in Jupyter Notebook. Okay, define, let's say function f, let's say it receives a, b, and c, let's say three values, and let's say it prints um, a is Let's say it's print A, A is A, and you say, okay, B is B, and then it prints, okay, C, C is, whatever the value of C is, that's a C, okay. Um, now let's call this function F with let's say two, three, and game. So we will say, okay, A is two, B is three, C is game. Fine, great. Um, now this two will be copied in A no matter what. If we, if we change this, if we change this calling order, for example, if we, if we change this order, we just, we just move to, we just move to this particular order. We just say, okay, um, this is uh, three, this is uh, game, this is two, if we call like so. Now three will be copied in A, game will be copied in B, and two will be copied in C. Um, and that, if, if, if that is the behavior you want, then you are good to go. Otherwise, it is, it is handy to call the function in the following way to just fix, okay, a is, a is two, fine. Um, B is three and C is, let's say game, if you want these numbers. Now, if you call the function like so, that will happen. Now, if you change the order, no matter what order of at the calling time you come up with, it will stay the same. For example, you go and say, okay, um, C is at the first position and A is at the second position, let's say two, and B is at the third position, three, 
the output will stay the same. And that's a, that's a beautiful, that's a beautiful thing. So uh, that's one way of uh, handling with the order. Uh, if, you, if, if, if you think at call time, it is important to define the variable names, but it has one problem that you need to know, you need to know exact variable names. If the variable name is C1 there, you need to know what it's, it's C1. Uh, you need not to, I mean the C1 matches with C, it must match with C1. C2 must match with C2 and so on. So you need to know these names. Okay, great. Um, in the upcoming videos, more features of functions are are going to are going to be discussed. So stay with us. Hope to see you in the next video. So we in the last video we saw the ordering of uh, input arguments in a function, um, and we saw a fix to it. I mean, if you if you if there is a chance that you may miss a proper order there is a way to fix that we saw that in the last video here uh, we have another uh, another thing to discuss this x variable x input argument this is the variable that is defined inside a function although um, the value it receives is copied from somewhere else but it is defined inside the function that is also the function variable or the or the variable that is in the scope of the function inside the function, in the body of the function, something like so. It may be handy, for example, let's say you, want, you, you compute something, you do some processing on your inputs, and whatever the result is, you save that result in another variable. And let's say now you need the value of this variable to do some further process. Let's say what you do is, let's say, in, at the call time, that, that's, let's say, this is, the, this is the function, let's say, this is the complete function, and let's say, a is equal to 12 and B is equal to let's say 7 and let's say you call the function add a B now the value of a will be copied in X the value of B will be copied in Y okay and now um, you need the sum of a and B to be received here uh, in a variable you want a variable in which the result should be uh, saved for example uh, let's say the variable is D let's say and then you want to do some more processing on D let's say D uh, double star 5 uh, mod 3 and maybe you need to apply an if condition on that if that equals to 0 then do some stuff otherwise so let's say you need this variable out what will happen is this C variable is not accessible outside this function. And the reason is the C is defined inside the function. When the function body completes its execution, the C is lost. C is no more available. C is defined when the function call has been made. When, the, when, when you are executing this statement, C is defined and a memory location was created in a C, sometimes called the function space in the memory or process space that is created in memory. But once all the body of the function executes, all the functions that were inside the variable, they're lost. What, how can you, how can you receive this value? How can you receive the value inside C outside this function? So that is, uh, that is question in this slide. How can we do that? Further, um, the, this, this particular function can access all the variables um, that are not defined in this function but that are available outside this function and are defined already. For example, let's say I have a function f and the function is, uh, let's say I have a function f and so if this function is uh, defined like so f, let's say f is your function and it is defined like uh, D E F and that's it. And here it prints, let's say, some variable, let's say A. Let's, uh, now, now you, now, now this A variable is no longer in F, not even defined in F, but as long as this A variable is defined before calling F, for example, that's the cell where we are writing the code and we say, okay, A is equal to seven, and then we just call this F. Because A was available before calling F, A will A is accessible here. So the functions, the, the variables that are available before the call, they are available inside the functions. But the, the, 
the variables that are defined inside the functions, they are not available outside. Um, that's a problem. Further, if we define this a here, a is equal to two, now this a is sometimes called the local variable or the function variable, the variable that is local to the function. Now this a is, is, is defined inside the function and all the accesses to a will access this value two rather than the seven. Consider the seven has a separate location in memory and this two has a separate location in memory. Both have names a, but this a will only be referred to when the function is executing. After the, after the execution of the function completes, this is gone from the, from the memory and this will still be available. This seven will still be available. So it is good to know, and, and by the way, if A was not defined here and you still called F, then either you will be getting an error or this A might be a global variable or available in some package that you have already loaded or stuff like so. In that case, this A will be accessed if it's a global variable or accessible. So it is good to know the, the, the scope of the variables inside the function um, because when you're calling them, uh, what functions, if this if x is already defined, for example, if uh, x is already defined like uh, 34, um, and then this x is 34, as long as this x is not defined here. If x is defined here, this is this x actually is the local copy and that will be accessed inside the function. Once the function is gone, again, x will be 34. So uh, it is good to know the local copies or, or the function space itself. The, uh, but, but the problem here is how to access this variable, the value of this variable outside the function because this is completely defined inside. Uh, how to access that? Well, um, well, there is a fix and that fix is called the return statement. If you write the return statement, for example, you return this value, so x plus y, you might have saved these values. You might have saved these values. For example, C equals X plus Y. That's okay. And then you say, okay, return C. What will happen is wherever you have called this function D equals add, let's say two, three. Now this value, this value C, which in this particular case is five, that value will be returned in D. Uh, and all the properties of this variables are returned in D. So just like this C is copied in D, and this uh, is available further, whatever you want to do with this D, okay? So yeah, so return statement is there. So um, in the next video, we will actually code this in Jupyter Notebook and see uh, the return statement running, and we will see the scope of the variables and all that in Jupyter Notebook. So hope to see you in the next video. In the last video, we saw uh, scope of a variable, particularly, uh, if a function, if a variable is defined inside a function, is it accessible outside the function? And if a variable is defined outside the function, uh, is it accessible inside the function and vice versa and so on. So we discussed those kind of things, which is sometimes called sco scope of a variable. Um, and further we discussed what if we want, uh, what if we want a value of the function that is computed, val value of some variable or some result that is computed inside a function, what if we want that to be accessed outside uh, outside the function? So we discussed that uh, in, in detail in the last video. So let's see um, uh, all those concepts in a running form in Jupyter Notebook. So let's see uh, how it works. So first of all, let's define a variable. Let's define a function. Let's say define, um, let's say my add and let's say it receives two uh, arguments, let's say A and B, and, and then let's say C is A plus B. Let's say that's C uh, or, or C value, let's say C value or some value, whatever, whatever you want to call that value, some value, um, that's it. Let's say we did, we did that. Now we want to access that some value from outside the function. Um, print some value. Uh, by the way, let, let's first call this function. Let's say my add for values, let's say two, three. Uh, so two will be copied in A, three will be copied in B. 
Um, so then let's access, let's try to access this value, some value. Um, it will throw an error and the reason is this variable some value is not accessible outside this function. What if we want to access, because this is defined inside the function. What if we want to access this, um, I mean, what if we want to compute some result and then use that result outside the function? So the way out as discussed in the last video is a return statement, return value. And now if we call that again, let me, let me call, uh, if we call that again, now, uh, oh, what, oh, we, we haven't actually registered. By the way, remember this, that's that's a common error I, I got in that error a lot of, a lot many times. If you change the implementation of the function, you have to rerun that cell. You have to register the updated copy of the function to the Python. Otherwise, you will be getting errors, uh, probably, yeah. Uh, oh, what's the problem here now? Print some value, oh, we, oh, the some value is still not, ex still not accessible because some value is not uh, is not accessible it is it is a variable defined inside the function it is scope in it's the scope of this variable is just the body of the function so let's receive this output in a variable d and then let's just print d and d is 5 great so one more thing let's say we define a variable here a variable outside the function. Let's say that's a variable name. That's a very lengthy name, but let's say that's a name. Variable outside the function. Let's say its value is three. And then, um, then let's define another function somewhere. Uh, let's say, let's define another function down somewhere. Let's say define, um, f um, maybe g and it receives nothing uh, but it prints this let's say variable out side the function and that's it let's say that's a function now um, when we call this function this variable outside the function that is accessible inside the function um, so so and 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 if this function and if this uh, variable it is not defined inside here and if there is this is defined somewhere else and it is global or accessible it will still be accessible however if we define a function uh, with the same name let's say variable outside outside the function let's say 5 now this function will print 5 if we, because that's the local variable, that's a local variable in the function. Now this will be accessed in this print statement. Uh, let's see. Now the result will be five, but if you print the variable outside, now the value will be three because this variable, this particular variable that was inside the function it got destroyed when the function finishes and this is available again. So, um, yeah, so you need to know, uh, by the way, it's a good practice whenever you want to, um, whenever you want to access particular variable inside, it is a good practice to pass that variable as input argument to, to minimize the confusions because this can create a lot of confusions. So it's a good practice, uh, although the feature is available and sometimes useful as well, but uh, it is always recommended to pass the values um, as input arguments that whatever you want to access inside the function. Okay, so one more thing. Um, this, uh, this function g is returning nothing. Uh, for example, it is not returning anything. Uh, it is just printing, let's say, something. Let's say it is not printing uh, anything. Let's say, uh, let's say this is a comment. Let's say it is not printing anything. So this, and then we call this, and that's it. So it has no return value. By the way, in Python, even if you, even if any function, even if a function does not return anything, it still returns a value which is called none, uh, which you can see here. So in Python, a function always returns a value. If you write a return statement explicitly, it returns that. 
uh, if you do not write return statement when the function body finishes it automatically returns none um, let's see the type of this output what is the type of this output what is the type of this none what kind of data type is this let's see um, it's a none type uh, I mean that's a type in Python so it returns a none type uh, output how fancy Wow uh, one more thing the return statement is not only used to return a particular value if you for example in a particular function let me write a function here let's say def let's say the function is h and then inside that function you do something let's say print a let's say then you define a variable let's say a equals 2 3 let's say then b equals let's say 5 and then you add those values a and b and then you do some other stuff let's say print um, something and then you just write a return statement without any output or I mean it is not returning anything um, you can still you can still I mean continue writing uh, the function body uh, more and more um, but what happens is whenever the first return will be encountered <coughs> the function returns from there so the effective body of the function is just that the function returns right from there if you return a particular value for example C you can receive that value outside the function if you do not return anything just type a return statement that means exit the function right away it, it works like the break statement in loop uh, remember the break statement it, it 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 resembles to the break statement return means just exit the function right away no problem and by the way when return is called the uh, the default return value that is returned is none type if the return is called without without an argument here so for example let's run this function uh, let's see and let's call that function h um, yeah so it prints a then it prints something and then it returns and it returns for example it returns nothing but a none yeah. it returns a none and uh, if you return C for example C then it returns a C yeah, value of C which is 8 and this time this type the return value is no longer none type it is probably an integer type let's see yeah here so it's integer type make sense yeah so a uh, return statement has two purposes one you can return a value Two, you can return uh, you can just return the control you can just exit the function like the break in loops um, just just one more thing a return statement can return multiple values for example let's say we have defined a function let's say J um, let's say G G we already have defined we can redefine it but let's say R is our function and we just have a equals 5 b equals 7 and d equals let's say um, uh, something and then we just return them a b and a b and d so return statement can return multiple values in a sequence um, now if you receive those values let's say x y and z equals r so a will be copied in a is the first return value it will be returned in x it will be copied in x uh, b will be copied in y and d will be copied in z just as a sequence as you as you keep the sequence in the return statement if you change the sequence in the return statement accordingly so whatever the first value here is the first value here whatever the second value here is the second value here and so on so let's run this and just print all these uh, things x y and z so yeah five seven and something so this return statement is really powerful I mean it can return multiple not all the languages actually uh, not all the languages uh, they have feature to return multiple values but Python does have feature uh, to return more than one values and more than one values of any type a can have different type B can have different type D can have different type and so on so that's about the um, 
that's about the uh, return statement as well as the variable scope um, and whether you can access a variable that is outside the function or inside the function and so on and all that kind of things. In the next video we'll talk about what if we want to um, access arbitrary number of input arguments. I mean we do not know how many arguments will be there inside but no matter how many arguments a particular user is giving, let's say we want to write an add function, just, just to give you an example. Let's say we want to add, write an add function, let's say define um, add, let's say add to, another function add to, um, and let's say it receives an arbitrary number of arguments, d in, I'm, I don't know how many, uh, and it has some implementation, then anybody uh, who want to call this add to, if, it, if that person gives Two, or two arguments, then just two should be added. If the person gives three arguments, then three should be added. I mean, the person can give arbitrary number of arguments. How can we handle that? Because um, because the caller, the, 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 this is the call, this is the call, the caller can give five arguments, six arguments, seven arguments, and earlier we saw in the definition, the total number of variables when we specify, we have to pass those many arguments for sure. If a single argument is missing or a single argument is just more than the specified number of variables, we will be getting an error. But how can we handle this situation where we have an arbitrary or variable number of input arguments? How can we handle that? So to answer this or to get how can we do that, see our next video. It's coming. Yeah. So in the last video, we were talking about how can we handle arbitrary number of input arguments. For example, let's let's say we want to write an add function that should be able to add any number of, let's say, integer or floating point numbers that are passed in. Uh, remember last time uh, we, we discussed uh, in an earlier video that when you are defining a function, the total number of variables that you are defining, you have to pass exactly those many input arguments, otherwise you are getting an error. Um, but but this may be required sometime that we want to add a universal kind of add function that has that has capacity to receive any number of arguments but no matter how many arguments it receives it just add them all and return the result uh, such a function if available will be very very helpful because sometimes we might be calling that function by just two arguments sometimes we might be adding might be calling that function with let's say um, three arguments and sometimes more arguments or less arguments and so on. How can we have uh, uh, this kind of uh, feature available but the implementation is just one-time implementation? Well, Python have a very, very easy way of handling this arbitrary or variable number of inputs. And the way you do that is when you, when you are defining a function, you just write a star and then just print, let's say, one variable name, let's say args. Uh, and then after that, this args will act like a list. And uh, I mean, it will be having a lot of properties, args. This args has a property, uh, th th this, this acts like a list. So all the arguments that you will send in will be received like, like you're receiving those in, a, in one list. And all the elements, which are the arguments in the list, they are accessed by different indices. We will see lists in detail later on, but right now just think it is a collection, all the collection, it is received by indices. For example, the args, uh, uh, the, the very first element is indexed by zero. It is at the zeroth location. At the zeroth location, there is a three. At the first location, for example, the location index number one, which is actually the second look the four will be copied at this and so on. Now, how, no matter how many arguments you pass, a list it will be of that size. And there is a function length, L-E-N, that is handy to just check how many arguments are there. Now, if you pass two arguments, the args will, the length of the args will be two. If you have three, if you have passed three arguments, the length of the args will be three and so on. No matter how many arguments you pass, this args it will receive all them in one by one and all the elements in that arc will be indexed by uh, zero, one, two, starting from zero until the length of the arcs. So see, for example, the, uh, here, the, so the sum, sum equals zero. Let's say, let's say we want to add all these. For i in range, 
and inside range we just give the length of args for this example one two three four five the length of arg is five so i will start from zero till till four because five is not included so the very first time i will be zero and args in subscript zero is actually the value value of the first variable which is three so three is added to zero then next time i will be one and at the position one four is located so three plus equals four which means three equals three plus four or sum equals whatever the sum previous value of sum plus four then next time I, the value of i will be four you know how this loop works we discussed the loop in loops in detail and as you move on you actually explore all these numbers and this variable sum actually contain the sum of all the variables um, now you can return this sum and that act, that this particular function acts like a universal kind of function that receives arbitrary number of arguments how cool is that let's see um, in jupyter notebook to get more convinced how it works so let's say we have define um, let's say we have any function my add um, my add let's say that's function my add powerful let's say yeah universal or or universal universal my add universal and it received receives star whatever the variable name is you can you can write the name args or you can write any other other variable name it's it, this is this is just this is just a name of a variable uh, okay then let's say we have <coughs> let's say we have s equals zero which is sum then we just apply a loop i guess you know the loops we have lengthy discussion on loops uh, in range length that's a built-in function length works okay then what should we do s plus equals args i which means access all the elements one by one and this is again the same as s is equal to s plus args i either way you write this way or that way both ways are fine then the, when the loop finishes s contains the sum just return it and you are done wow now let's call this add function my add universal and let's call this function as two four and five for these and uh, let's just print the result let's just print the result okay the result is 11 wow because 2 plus 4 plus 5 is 11 now let's call this uh, function for let's say uh, for for let's say five arguments it works it adds all these five numbers um, wow that is great I mean now we can add any we have one function we, we need not to write a function for two arguments and then another function for three arguments then another function for four arguments and so on depending upon the number of arguments we need not to write separate functions we have just one function working in all scenarios wow so yeah that's doable i've done in front of you no problem yeah python allows this um yeah uh, in, in the next video we are going to see um, how can we actually handle the same kind of scenario but we want to handle the sequence of the input variables in a very controlled way remember in some of the previous this this yeah in this order of input arguments remember that uh, we receive three arguments and we pass the three arguments in a very controlled way uh, and then whatever these are we don't care whatever the order here if we don't care what if we want to fix the input or we want to become more careful for input argument orderings but then we also want the arbitrary number of arguments how can we do that yeah wait for the next video and i will show you how can you do that in the last video i promised you that i will show you how can you achieve the uh, ordering of the input variables but still having the arbitrary number of them remember this uh, looks like much familiar to you that's a call that can be made to a function and remember the function definition in some previous slide was like c1 c2 and c3 maybe and then something 
What if we want an arbitrary number of arguments to be passed, but we want their controlled, for example, let's say this particular variable symbol name that acts as a key, that's a variable name and that's the value. So let, let me call the variable name as a key and let's this is the value that is copied in the variable. That's another key, that's a value. That's another key, that's a value and so on. What if we have a lot of key value pairs? What if we have a lot of them? And we also want to check which value is of what key. Let's say we, we want to specify those, but we want to specify an arbitrary number of them. Let's say here, for example, there are only three. Let's say we want to pass five of them, six of them. And then we want our function to perform accordingly, uh, no matter how many input arguments it received. Um, yeah, and, and maybe inside the function, we may have applied a check that if the key value is C1, then do this processing if the key value is c2 then do that kind of processing and so on let's say for based on different variable symbol names we want to process the value differently how can we achieve that and still having the need that these number of variables can be can can be in a variable variable length they can be an arbitrary number of those so uh, python gives you again a very very simple way rather than writing a sim single star you write a double star and then you receive uh, in whatever variable name and now um, in, in this double double star means you are receiving a key value pair list it's a list of key value pairs um, we will see that that resembles to that resembles to a data structure in Python called dictionary. We will see dictionary later on in detail, but right now just just consider that this input argument, this input variable C, it contains a it contains a list of key values pairs, and then you just you can just iterate over this C. You can just apply a for loop to check the contents of this. Remember, we have actually done that kind of thing in the in the portion of loops, uh, yeah, here. Remember that was a key and that was a value, that was a key, that was a value, and we did that thing. We could explore the, we, we were able to explore the dictionary just uh, just using for loop. Yeah, it's the same thing here. It's um, not exactly, but you, you can think of that, that's exactly the same thing. Um, so you can explore that, that C looks like a dictionary now, this is key, this is value, this is key, this is value. This is key, this is value. You can, this X points to the first key, then C of X points to the value based on the, based on the key X. And then X points to the second key, then the second value and so on. You, that, that is very simple procedure, you are just printing all the dictionary, but you can, uh, you're printing all the variable names and their values, but you can do uh, very complicated processing if you want to. Um, let's go to our friend Jupyter Notebook to just get convinced that this indeed works. Let's see, so let's define a function first. So def, let's the function name is print all uh, variable variables and values so that might be a function name well wow, that's lengthy one but descriptive one maybe we can make it more descriptive print all variable variable names and values wow that's more descriptive I guess so it receives let's say double star any variable let's say the variable name is again let's say args or, or anything whatever you want. Then what we do is for x in args, just print, uh, let's say, variable name is just print x, and then, uh, okay, just print x, and then um, just continue and value is um, value is uh, args of x so let's say you you done this you did this so the variable name is this and the value is this okay and you want to do this for all all the all the variable and value pairs that you that you send at the call time 
so now let's call this uh, print all variable names and values and let's call this let's say the variable first variable name let's say is a and its value is 3 the second variable name is let's say B its value is capital B let's say the third value third variable name is C its value is uh, CCC and let's say the fourth variable name I mean you can define an arbitrary number of arguments here Wow that's amazing let's say the fourth variable name is Y its value is 6.7 and further notice you can you can pass a variable and value all have different types I mean different number of them and and much more um, yeah you can do that so let's call this function by just having four variables and their values let's see what we got so variable name is a and the value is 3 variable name is b and the value is b variable name is c and the value is c c c variable name is y and value is 6.7 um, you can give an arbitrary lengthy list here if you want and Python just allows you to do that and it allows you to do that in a very very simple way that's amazing that's amazing I mean that's uh, that's what a high-level language or really a, a powerful language should should have a feature so Python does have this feature I'm, I'm really amazed I'm really I really astonish Python um, by the way, I'm not saying the other languages don't have this. Uh, several languages actually support this kind of feature, but Python supports it in a very easy way. Uh, it's very easy to do that. I mean, it's not, not a rocket science. Uh, yeah. Okay, so now we have handled an arbitrary number of arguments, even with ordering is really controlled. Um, we have one or two more videos on functions just to explain a bit more then we'll then we will practice on Jupyter notebook we'll practice we will play with these functions a lot um, and we'll be calling one function inside the other function and so on we will be having one uh, better program just just program a new Jupyter notebook just to get comfortable with these functions but before that let's have uh, one or two more things to discuss about the functions yeah let's see so hope to see you in the next video Okay, I really want to talk about these default values for a function as well because uh, that's important um, and, and mostly needed. Um, the default value is a value of the input variable that you assign while, while you are defining a function. And if the value is, for example, if you call this f with, let's say, the input value 3, then 3 will be copied in the sum and the print will be 3. But if you call this function without the input, then this value acts as, as if you have passed this. So this is the default value. If you do not supply the value, this is the value that is going to operate. And by the way, you can have multiple variables with default values, some variables with default values defined, some variables with default variables, uh, default values not defined and so on. So you can have this. One care must be taken here that uh, the default value when you actually define the function and you compile this function, actually you, you run the cell shift enter in Jupyter Notebook. At that very time, this variable is assigned this value at that particular time. It is not assigned at the call time. So sum equals to zero is already there when you actually press shift enter for a cell that contains this code. Now, later on, if you pass a value, that value will be overwritten on sum. If you don't pass the value, the zero will go on. It looks like very easy. But one care that I want to mention here that I haven't mentioned earlier. In Python, there are certain variables that are, uh, that are referenced rather than copied. I will discuss the referencing and the copying in, in detail in data structures, but let me just tell you one, one, one example. Let's say you defined a list. Let's say one, two, and three. And then what you do, you copy this list into another variable, let's say L2. What will happen is in the memory, this list uh, in a particular way, this is not the exact view of the memory, I'm just showing you. Let's say this is the particular memory layout for which this L is pointing to. This L is labeled for that. L2 is also labeled for that, which means actually in memory, this is not the copy of the structure that is made. 
I mean, this is not like in variables, for example, if a is equal to three and b is equal to a, a will be a will be a position in memory and b will be a separate position in memory. That is what a view of the memory in ordinary variables are. But there are certain variables in memory just for memory efficient and code efficiency in time. Um, people have people have designed these data structures in a way that when you copy them, uh, when you just assign a variable to another variable, the memory view doesn't change. The just it's it's another name for the same for the same uh, for the same memory location. So what happens is if you change any value in let's say L2, let's say L2 at the very at the zero at at the zeroth index, let's say you change that by minus nine, the because it is the same view in memory that changes minus nine. And now if you print the elements of L rather than L2, you will get the changed value. You will see the changed value and that happens. Now, why that is important in terms of these default values here for the function? The reason is if you are accepting a list, let's say uh, the default is a list and you're accepting a list and you are also defining some default value for the list, if that's your definition, let's say. Then this list, this default value is assigned at the at the very first at the very first time and this l is really a local variable inside inside the uh, inside the memory now when once this cell is run not the call time at the at the at, at the so so what call the compile time when the cell is run this l is assigned this and that just happens once now if you call this list with some other list let's say l2 let's say 2 3 and 4 then if you call this L2, L2 will go there, it will be copied in L and everything is fine. But don't then uh, expect this, the contents of L2 to stay same as stay in L because L is this default values, they are assigned just once and they stay as it is every time you call the function, they don't change. Um, they are not assigned at the call time, they are assigned at the compile time and they stay fixed. So that care must be taken. I, I will show you that example, that particular example in Jupyter Notebook shortly. Uh, this, this might be confusing right now because we have not defined, we have not seen lists in detail. But um, I, ju I just want to make this point. I just want to mention this because that's important difference. With ordinary variables that, I mean, default values just I mean, just uh, like like a value, and if you don't supply a value, the default value just works. But with the variable that are reference type variables, you may expect something else, and the Python function behaves maybe differently, and that's because these default values, they are assigned at compile time, they are not, or compile time, actually this is not a compiled language, I should not use the word compiled, compiled again and again. Just think when we define this function and we run the cell at that particular time, the default value is assigned and the default value never changes, it stays fixed. Uh, yeah, so, and I will show you that example. W why don't we move to Jupyter Notebook and see that example, yeah. So, or, or why don't we do that in the next video? What do you think? This video? Okay, same video. Okay, let's go to Jupyter Notebook and see the default values, for example. Let's see, uh, let's say we have uh, define a function, let's say uh, gg, and the default value s is equal to four. Let's say that's a default value. And we want to print, let's say s if available. Uh, from the call time. If not available, then four will be printed. Now we print, now right now we are going to print, now we are going to uh, press shift enter. At that time, S is assigned to four. S has now value four, it is assigned there. Now we call GG, let's say, and we call uh, GG without input arguments. Now the four will be printed. If we call this GG with some input argument, let's say, 56. Now the 56 will be printed, no problem. Everything is fine. Let's see about the lists. For example, let's say the list is, let's say one, two, three, that's a list. Uh, and then L2 is simply, let's say L2 is L. 
then what we do is we change the contents of L2, let's say we change the very first value in L2 and we place that value as minus nine and then we print L. Now you might be expecting that L is a different thing, L2 is a different thing because L and L2, they both are pointing to the same memory. Uh, this, the content through L2 actually changes the memory view and L also changes and that gives the result minus nine in L. Well, the behavior uh, that I want to show you is different in the default values when we when we talk about. For example, let's say um, we define a function ff and it accepts a list and the default value is empty list. Or the default value is let's say one, two. That's the default value, let's say. Um, if, if, if no list is uh, passed, the default list is one, two. Now, uh, in this particular uh, scenario, if we just print, so for example, for i in the list, print i, let's say we just print all the list, uh, and that's it. Now we will press shift enter, and at this time, this l is assigned this value, and that's a default value that never, that is not going to change. Now let's say we have an l2 that is simply, let's say two, three, and four or let's say 12, three and four. And what we do is we call FF and uh, we just press shift enter. Now, um, oh, why not? Oh, oh, we call FF without anything. So the default list is printed. If we call this FF with uh, L2, the L2 will be printed. Now, the notice that um, this L2 actually is copied in this L because we supplied it. So L and L2, you may tend to think that L is now also pointing to L2. I mean, L has also the same contents as L2. So if next time, because, because of the behavior of these uh, lists, because they are by reference, uh, next time you may you may, might be thinking that because L2 is passed there, so L2 L is also L L2 is copied in L in a memory view way, layout. So L has also the same data as L2. And next time, if we call this function without input arguments, then L might be pointing out to L2 values. So 12, 3, and 4 might be printed. But that is not going to happen. The default values they never change. Uh, so um, again, you will be getting one, two. So the behavior of these reference type variables that is different ordinarily, but when you do that in, in the default value structure, that, that, it, that might work in a different way. And the reason is you, you must know that these default values, they're assigned at, at the time when the function is created, not at the function when the function is called and they are not going to change whatsoever. So, so that was about the default value. Oh, by the way, the default value was a simple concept. Uh, I guess I have made it too complicated uh, by telling you lists and default values and the creation of these variables at uh, what time and at the call time. I made this complicated, I guess. Uh, I shouldn't have told you the list values and all that stuff, but, um, but that's true, I mean, whatever I have told you is true. Maybe I have told you in a very complicated way, but it's true, yeah. Okay, uh, one more video on the functions, and then we'll be practicing the functions in detail on, on Jupyter Notebook. So just be here one more video with me. Hope to see you in the next video. Okay, this is probably the last video on, on the functions, um, yeah. Um, well, we will we will be having one more video, but but that will be like uh, coding and practicing all the concepts that we learn about the functions, not not something not not new theoretical concepts. Yeah. So uh, let me ask you a question to to actually uh, to actually make you understand about this slide. Let me go to the Jupiter and ask you about a, a few questions. Let's say you have, let's say, let's say you have this particular function and you, let's say my add, my add universal, let's say. We have written that function maybe a two or three, uh, three videos before. Let's say you have this function 
you have written this function and you are very, very excited. Wow, what kind of masterpiece you have generated. It can add an arbitrary number of values passed in it. Wow. Um, but this particular function is written inside this particular file, which is mastering Python zero to hero. Later on, let's say two or three months later, you were writing some code for some, some project or you were doing something somewhere and you were writing code and there you just needed um, you just needed a, you just needed a code for adding a lot of lot of values together and then you just remember oh I have written some function somewhere how can I use that function one way is to just go back to that file mastering Python zero to hero and just copy this function this particular this code and paste in the new file run that register that and then call that happy what if you want to use let's say a hundred different functions let's say you've written a lot of functions in a lot of different files and now you want to use all of them and and let's say this is a repetitive kind of demand several times you notice that this usually happens that this particular kind of function you require almost every almost in every project let's say a set of uh, maybe 50 or 60 functions that are that are required always one way to do that as i told you is to job, just copy paste those functions in every file run them and do that another way is to just uh, just i mean make a module a file of containing just those functions and whenever any of those functions is required just import that module um, into your coding file which is one line of code and then access all the functions as if they were they were they were actually available in in the code file that you are working on so that's about the uh, that's about making modules of uh, so so module is basically a python file that contains functions that you want to use in several different coding projects or the functions that you don't want to write in your the functions having the implementation that you don't want to write in your grunt coding file so you can have several of those functions stayed somewhere else in a different directory they're residing there whenever you want to use any of them you just import the whole module and uh, use the functions uh, so so module is just a python file that can, that can contain a code for you that whenever you want to use you can use it normally it contains functions maybe more than one function and several functions normally it contains functions that you repetitively use and uh, that you have written once in very careful way and then now you want to use it again and again in several different ways um, you need not to write the function definition in every coding file you need you just make one coding file uh, or that that is the most important uh, for you that is called a module wherever you want to use any of those functions that are there in that module you can call it you can use it so that's about the modules we are going to uh, make uh, I, I'm going to show you one example of making module and how to use that um, but but to use the module we need to actually specify the path where the module actually resides using this uh, sys module so and then we have to do some of this import kind of commands and then I, I mean there is some work that we need to do to actually get this module running in our code so in the next video I'm going to tell you what that extra work very little amount of work what that extra work you have to do so here for example my funks.py that's my Python file and it contains these two functions and let's say I want to use one of these or both of these functions in some other file and that file contains this particular code so in the next video I will show you how to how to actually uh, make and use the modules uh, yeah so hope to see you in the next video okay uh, in the last video I told you about modules uh, module is just a Python file that can contain a code that can be used anywhere if you want normally that module normally the modules they contain a lot of functions but they can contain variables and other values and, and so on uh, so uh, think about a file myfunks.py that contain this these two functions 
and think about a different file maybe a Jupyter maybe you're working in a Jupyter notebook and now you want to use these two functions so you first have to import another module called the system module sys you have to uh, you have to make this path available there are a lot of built-in modules that are already there in the path all the, already there in the search path when you want to call a function it is written in some module that is already in the search path if you are making your modules you have to either um, either copy those uh, those modules into the modules that are built in or if you want to maintain them separately somewhere else then you have to add the path of these in the search path as well and the way to actually insert this path is sys.path.append and then you actually write the uh, the path of the directory where this module file one or more files are located once this is added to the path now you can write the import uh, and you can import your file um, and your file as it is or you can import your file with some other name if you want you can rename that on the fly if you want once this is imported now you can use all the functions like the built-in functions the implementation of these functions are not there in your coding file you are just using those and you can now import these module into some other file and use there and so on for uh, for 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 very large kind of uh, projects it is good to make modules actually it is better to make packages which is actually uh, the the directory structures that contain modules but modules at least are, are really good to uh, for maintaining a large amount of course or actually the the functions that you want to use again and again so let's uh, just uh, let's uh, let's make a module why not so let's make a module let's say let's go to Jupyter notebook uh, let's create another file let's create another file let's say new Python 3 and uh, um, let's let's name this file as uh, um my let's say let's let's name this file as my universal let, let's let's use underscores my universal functions let's say that's a file name let's create another notebook right now it's just a notebook let's define some functions let's say we want to define one function as check all args uh, let's say that's the function it receives let's say uh, uh, let's say it receives a dictionary like uh, input and then it checks the type let's say check 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 type of all arcs um, and let's say uh, let's say you write a function check if not numeric let's say um, let's say you want to write a function that um, that that just accepts a lot of uh, arguments and you want to check whether any one of them if, if any one of them is not numeric you want to return let's say a flag otherwise you want to return um, a true let's say so for example uh, you 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 may you may need this function in several places so let's say in 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 your code you're expecting numerical inputs and if the input is and let's say there are a lot of variables that you are working on if and if any one of them is not numeric uh, you might want to check all the all the variables uh, and their values so one way of doing that is just to create a list and that's it i mean that's uh, and and you may have several of those I mean you can check all of them uh, maybe here um, maybe here we, we do not need uh, the dictionary kind of argument so maybe we just are happy with just one so let's say for so the output let's say output is let's say or or the return value vect value let's say that is already true and we will say okay for x in args let's say for x in args um, um, if x if uh, is instance 
x is int float if that is true then we are happy but if that is not true if that is not true then there is a trouble then we say okay if this is not true for any value then we just return false okay we just return false I mean we need not to break anything we just return false return means return whatever um, otherwise if we finish this loop if the loop finishes successfully um, and there is no return statement that is called already then we return maybe true so we need we do not need actually this variable let's say so this function will return true if all the variables are either int or float if any of them is not of this type this function returns false wow we can have another we can have another uh, function maybe uh, we can write several functions the same cell or in different cells either way define let's say another function um, universal or, or add all values let's say add all let's say numerics add all numerics and it also contains let's say args and the goal of this function is just to add all the values and return the sum so let's say s equals 0 for x in uh, for x in args s plus equals to x and that's it then return s let's say these are two functions and maybe one more uh, the name of this uh, or, or some some variable let's say you uh, I mean these are two functions now we are out of the function we are writing something else let's say um, um, my name let's say that's a variable my name this this does not this my name variable does not belong to any of these uh, functions and my name is Python uh, course let's say that's my name so that's it that's a file with the name my universal functions so what we do is we download this file as a dot py file dot py file so what we do really is we go to file let me just zoom this out so that you can see the download options we go to file menu we download this as we download this as uh, uh, we download this as well, as py file so python file so let's download this or we can write this python file as uh, in in some other editor if we want so open folder there is a python file here copy it now copy that file and now you're free to go to any uh, for example any any folder if you want just for example you go to somewhere in your directory and make a new directory maybe maybe you want to make another directory for example go and make a directory in maybe in D let's say or maybe in E let's say or maybe in C somewhere I mean make a module anywhere for example in C make a new folder call that folder as my or, or any name whatever name you want for example my module or let's say um, um, utils for example utilities or whatever name I mean let's let's call it as uh, let's call it as ABC for example ABC whatever and you just make that and just copy that Python file here my universal functions dot by now uh, if you go back if you go back to uh, your uh, where where is the Jupiter here is the Jupiter now you go back to your code this is your file go back to your code let's say this file is no longer here and what you do is you import sys that's a system module then sys dot path dot append write the path here where the module is located so the module right now is located at ABC this is the path of the module once done you can import 
what what was the name of the module you you need to know that that was my um my what so I just I just don't remember the name let's import my uh, universal functions how it appears actually when I when I have added this path then this import command and after the tab completion just fetches that file so uh, that 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 name might be very lengthy so you can rename that as let's say my F's or, or whatever name you want so you import that once you have imported that now you can use the functions if you want for example you can check the uh, implementation of my f's dot if you see dot add numerics you want to check the implementation of that uh, here this remember this file is no longer in this particular file this is located somewhere else um, and you can call this function like uh, like the built-in functions my f's dot add all numerics um, and you can have for example uh, let's say it accepts the input arguments let's say two three four well, let's say six and um, that's it that's the that's the return value uh, you can you can save the return value in some other variable let's say c and then later on you can print this c uh, or do some stuff with this uh, C, that's one thing. Another way of importing the same thing is, let's say you don't want to use all the functions, you just need this add all numerics. Let's say that's that's the only function that you want to use again and again. So you need not the other functions. Let's say for this particular file, you do not need the other functions. Then what you can do is you can just say, okay, from my universal functions, import, uh, add all numerics and you can rename, rename this function as something and you can call that function the same way so you do that now you need not to write any dot kind of thing you just call add all numerics because it is imported now and you say okay two three four five six seven and you save that in let's say D and then you print D if you want or do whatever with that that's it or, or you can import several I mean multiple functions or you can import all of them um, other than modules there are uh, I, I mean for complex codes I mean this is not one module that is there I mean there are several modules uh, and the several modules may be arranged in, in a directory structure that where the directory and the subdirectory and the subdirectory and so on so the modules that are arranged in directory structure although they are accessed much like the same way uh, that directory structure is sometimes called package and these are basically the packages that are that are most useful and uh, we will be seeing some data science packages uh, like numpy is a data science package um, then uh, we will be seeing pandas uh, that's a data science package we will be seeing uh, matplotlib that's a data science package for plotting and uh, visualizations and stuff so packages just the modules that are arranged in directory structures um, so now you know what module is and uh, the oh we, we missed to we actually missed to uh, import the name of to see the name we, we have saved a name there as well so let's go back and let's go back and do that and see how how many things are available uh, let, let's go to some other cell an empty cell so my f's dot tab completion my name is available uh, remember that was a variable yeah that's available so the name is python course so this module file does not require to only contain functions it can contain any information any data that you want to use in other files other coding and stuff and so on so um, yeah that's about modules in the in the next video we will practice about these functions a little bit um, um, we will be seeing how to call a function inside another function how to make a lot of functions that are calling each other and so on so we will be practicing more um, on uh, about these functions not theoretically just in Jupyter notebook just to get a better look and feel of um, of functions more 
and after that practice we will be then jumping towards data structures starting from strings so hope to see you in the next video okay uh, before moving on let's just practice some uh, some some I mean let, let's get a good grip on functions and multiple functions and handling those and the best way to do that is to solve actually a problem remember we solved a problem when we uh, when we uh, when we are done when we were done with if conditions then we solved another problem when we were done with loops just to get a good grip on loops uh, let's solve a problem uh, uh, let's just solve a problem using using the functions just to get a good idea of functions um, what kind of problems should we solve here? Uh, should we solve an older problem? Uh, last time we solved a problem using loops that were sorting a list. Why, why don't we why don't we solve the same problem uh, but in a different way? So let's go to Jupyter and see um, see our file Jupyter file. We have actually solved a function somewhere using loops. Just let let me just find that out. Oh yeah, they're here. So here, so given a list of numbers, let's say this, make another list or maybe the same list that contains all the items in the sorted order from minimum to maximum. Your result will be another list like this. And we solve that using loops. Um, okay, let's solve the same problem, um, exactly the same problems. Let's solve the same problem using a different way, using a different, uh, using, using functions just to get a, grip on functions. So let's say that's our problem we want to solve. So that's the problem again. And we want to solve that. So how can we solve that? Um, to solve that, let's first define a function. Uh, let's just uh, make a function. Uh, um, let's just make a function that, uh, um, let's just make a function, let's say define find minimum. And the function accepts a list and returns the minimum value in the list not only the minimum value of the list but also the position of that minimum value so find minimum as well as find uh, so minimum as well as the position of the minimum in the list so how can we how can we solve that problem uh, that that's that's one standalone function no matter what list you pass in it will find the minimum okay as long as the the minimum is defined for the items of the list for example the list items are let's say all numerics um, okay how can we how can we do that let's say minimum value is the list zero that's let's say the minimum value and right now the index at the minimum value is let's say um, is zero okay uh, like we did in the loops like it is it is kind of the same code but uh, let let's write a function for it okay so that's a function find min so uh, how can we how can we proceed what should we write here uh, let's see a counter let's say um, a counter is let's say or i maybe let's say the counter right now is zero for x in l if x is smaller than our minimum value if that's true then the minimum value indeed is x and the index where we found that is i okay great else do nothing i mean else just go away and i plus equals one so move on so i is just the position so i is moving on and on and on as you follow the list and m contains the minimum value and idx variable contains the position of the minimum value so that's the function for for readability we might be adding an else clause just to write boss and that means the if condition finishes i mean do if this condition holds true do that stuff otherwise do nothing uh, that's just because of readability if you want even if you don't write the else clause in boss statement even then everything is fine so let's call this function just to test whether this function is working properly or not. So let's just find, uh, oh, we haven't returned anything. Uh, we, need, we need the minimum value as well as the index. So return minimum value as well as the position. So return that, okay. Oh, but we, we are returning that inside the loop that becomes in the body of the loop. Oh, no, 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 that's bad because 
even in the first iteration, the return will be called, and even in the first iteration, the function will finish. Indentation, remember indentation? Now that's better. Now this is no longer inside the body of the loop. Great, that was a bug, we fixed it, great. Okay, so let's call it find, let's receive A, B, so A will contain the minimum value and B will contain the index of the minimum value. So find min, for example, and the list, let's let's give it the list, one, three, four, uh, two, three, four, um, zero, nine, let's say. Uh, now the minimum value is zero and that minimum value appears at zero, one, two, three. That's the third index. So B should be three, A should be zero. So let's see what's the value, what's the result. So print A, B. So A is zero, yes, and the position of minimum is three. I guess it is working fine, great. So that's one function, uh, find minimum. Let's find another, let, let's write another function, uh, swap. So define, define another function, let's say swap values. And what we do is uh, it, it, it actually uh, accepts two indices, index one. It actually accepts a list, then two indices, index one and index two. And what it does is it actually swaps the value of index. So index one value should go to index two position and index two value should go to index one position in the same list and then it returns the list. Okay, great. So it, it so so that's a that's a good example. It would it accepts a list uh, type variable, it accepts a index type variable which are integers. Great. So Let's contain, a, let's define a variable temp that contains L IDX index one, just store it in a temporary variable. Then uh, at this particular index, index one, just copy this value. Don't worry, we will see lists in detail later on. Now list, uh, now at index one, the value of index two is copied but uh, it is not overwritten because we already have saved the value somewhere before that copying up appears. So L at IDX2 is simply temp and now return the list. So that's how you can swap the two values if you want. Uh, great. So let's just check it whether the two values are swapped or not. So let's say list is two, three, six and seven, let's say that's the list. And uh, let's say we want L2, that is swap values. And let's say we pause the list and we want the values to be swapped at position one and position three, which at, at position one, the value is three because the position starts from zero. And at the third position, the value is seven. So we want these to swap. So the result will be two, seven, six, and three. Let's see what's the result. So let's print L2 and yeah, it works, great. What else, what else do we need? Uh, so we have find a minimum function, we have swap values function, what else? So um, yeah, what should we do? Now let's write the main function, sorting. Let's write that function. And we will call, we will use these kind of functions inside that function, we will call these functions. So let's define um, sort list. Let's say that's our function. It accepts a list and it returns a sorted list. Okay, what should we do? What do you think? What should we do for the very first time? Well, first of all, we should check whether all these list um, it contains, um, the, the list contains all the numeric values or not. Let's say we are just doing this for numeric values. So we should first check that all the arguments are, are of numeric type or not. For that, we should write a function that should do that. Oh, remember that function is all written in, in a module. Remember that module? We made that module ourselves. So we can import that module if we want. Import um, my, Remember that my universal functions 
Um, and we just need that function. We just need that function. Wow, well, just from from my universal functions import what? Import a check if numerics, check if not numeric as, so you can write that function name something else, but just this. So you import that function. Now you may be able to use that function. So after that, you can use that function. If check if not numeric list. Uh, remember that function returns true if all the values are numeric, otherwise it returns false. So if it is true, then move on. If it is not true, if it is not true, what should you do if it is not true? If it is not true, then you might be printing an error, error um, list does not contain numeric values, maybe that, and then you just return. Return, that's it, I mean, return. Don't need to write anything in return, fine, great. So else, we need not to write else uh, because this return will take care of that, but it is, for readability, it is good to write else. If all are numeric, then what should we do? Okay, what should we do? if all are numeric. What we do is um, we will uh, be doing what? We will be finding minimum, we'll be finding out the minimum and then we will be swapping the minimum from, um, um, what should we do? What, what, what we, we have already a function find minimum that we can call just right away. We have a function swap values that we can call right away. We already have used this function. How can we combine all these functions? How can we use all these functions just to achieve the problem sorting? We want to sort a list. How can we do that? Okay, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, it looks like, um, um, it looks like a different thing. Maybe, um, maybe, um, so let, let, let's just write out. Let's just, for x in the list, let's start thinking here uh, for every element that is in list, uh, for x in list. Um, what should we do? Uh, we, should, we should find out the minimum uh, and swap the minimum with x or so we should find out the minimum as well as the index of the minimum and should swap it with with the value x and everything will become great yeah I guess yes um, okay so what what we are going to do is we are going to maintain a counter right now the counter is zero which is just the index what we are going to do is we are going to find out the minimum, minimum and the index where the minimum lies. So by find minimum in the list, so it will return us the minimum as well as the index where the minimum lies. And then what we do is uh, we will say, okay, um, okay, what we want to do is uh, um, L is actually um, L is um, swap swap values with index C uh, swap values in the list with index C so index C should be swapped with IDX yeah and C plus equals one will that work um, will that work so after this Will the, will the whole list be sorted? So let's return a list, L. Is that true? I mean, we are finding out the minimum value one by one. The only catch is the list is updated here. And, uh, oh, there is a problem. 
when we are finding out the when we are finding out the minimum we are finding out the minimum from the list and every time the same minimum will be returned that's a big problem so looks like this find minimum function is not doing our job uh, what we need to do really is we we should go uh, to find minimum function and give it that start your uh, start your find minimum from a particular index so so don't don't search the whole list to find the minimum start uh, finding out the minimum from the following index for example so let's give a start index and maybe an end index but let's give a start index so start searching the minimum from right from there how can we change all the code right now oh that's bad thing let's change the code let's say that's the start index start index let's say this the index right now is start index and i is um, also uh, start uh, oh, we, we, we may use a range function here that might be much more feasible to us so let's use a range function rather than this let's change the coding whole lot that's a bad thing we need to change the code for i in range uh, starting from start index starting starting from start index uh, ending at length of the list and doing a step of one okay now x really is x is really list at the index i okay if x is smaller than m then this is that and index is i otherwise this we need not to do this because this is this is happening automatically and rest of the story is same i guess yes that will work out okay great oh there is a problem oh we just missed this colon here great we fix it okay now swap value is there maybe this works maybe it doesn't maybe there is a bug let's see let's let's just call this function so let's call this function l2 is sort list and let's pass the list as two one five three minus eight seventeen let's see let's pass this list and see what it returns if it returns fine we might be happy otherwise we will see where is the bug if there is a bug Oh, list does not contain numeric values. Why not? List does not contain numeric values. Why is that happening? Um, list actually contains all the numeric values. Uh, where is the problem? Check if not numeric. Let's see the let's see the implementation of check if not numeric. Let's see that. Check um, if not numeric. Let's see the implementation and where is the bug because all these are numeric so check if not numeric x in args if not is instance then return false uh, so if uh, everything is int or float uh, so if x is int or float then uh, return otherwise return true so it returns true if uh, all are um, if all are numerics so it returns true if all are numerics so not true means false and it should, why why it is why it is returning false so let us just was let us just see why it is returning false that's a that's a bad news that something is happening wrong let us just see how this is working so let us just check check if not numeric and let's pass the list this list and let's see what is returned let's just print the return thing print it is either true or false so it returns a false why it is returning a false 
um, it is a bad thing why it is returning a false let's go to the file let's go to the file um, here uh, sorry let's go to the file here in this directory let's open up this uh, maybe we open this in simply a notepad maybe a notepad why not or maybe some other fancy editor uh, let's open this up and see what is happening um, all right. um, format font let's have a bigger font and see what is happening Uh, font of 20 yeah bugs are bad they're really bad for X in args okay if not is instance so first of all is instance this it will return true always okay uh, if not true which means false then we'll move on and the loop will be running if anywhere you where it is finding out where it is finding out basically so this this is working really fine let's 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 write this function somewhere inside our notebook and see what is let's say rather than this let's write this function like check numeric 2 check numeric 2 check if not numeric 2 and let's call that function and see what happens check numeric 2 it is returning false again why it is returning false that's amazing where is uh, the false so two is integer yes one is integer yes so true 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 all these are true oh minus eight might be a problem minus eight might be a problem let's see uh, maybe uh, I don't know well well there is it is still false i mean i'm stuck here guys i'm stuck here i don't know what to do i don't know what to do i have to debug this function i have to go inside that function and see what is happening so what we really uh, args oh my god the big trouble the big trouble yeah i found the error we are passing a list and that list is just one argument that is not a lot of arguments we have to pass all these arguments in in a different way I mean if you want to you're getting you're getting the bug the bug is we are passing one variable not a lot of them two one five three eight seventeen these are not all different variables for example if we just go inside and print X for just first x it is the all it is all the um, it is all the list it is all the list uh, it is not the variables one by one let's see yeah I found the bug found the bug great yeah see it is not it is not a lot of it is not a lot of variables it's not a lot of arguments it is just one argument that is in the form of list variable that's the trouble what should we do uh, should we go inside and add another a function check if not numeric for lists rather than variable number of arguments what should we do um, let's write another function that check for the list uh, let's write here check numeric 2 it contains a list for example just accepts list L or maybe L or whatever X uh, or, or just simply you can call the or L list and it goes through all the list and does uh does the same job as previous so now this will work so the function that was there in our module is no longer working and it will not work yeah so we are not going to use the function that is in the module we are going to write another function that will help us here and we have written that and here we go we just chain that function with that and we just register that again and let's see what happens now oh there is another error which error um find min missing one oh we we did not find this find min is missing the 
starting index. So the starting index is C. Great. Great. That's a problem. That's a huge problem. List is sorted. Oh my God, list finally is sorted. Oh, huge, huge, huge. So you see, you can call the functions inside other functions. You can call the functions from modules. If they are no longer working or no longer beneficial for you, you can write new functions, you can call them, you can, uh, yeah, all that stuff. I guess that that lengthy video taught you a lot of lessons, uh, how, to, how to code actually. And uh, this actually happens when you are doing uh, tasks that are really big. You have to define different functions. You need to define different functions for modular approach and focus on each function as a separate entity. And that, that makes much simplicity uh, in managing the code and bug fixing and all that stuff. You see, I fix the bug by just noticing that, just by just focusing on this function. I have not thought anything else. Uh, just focus on that function, go and see the implementation, fix that, everything else stays the same. Um, yeah, so too lengthy, I stop here. Okay, uh, now you have done a lot of practice about functions, um, loops and a lot of stuff. That was all the basic uh, programming in Python. Um, uh, in, the, in the next um, video, from the next video, we will see the real power, a much more real power of Python where you need not write a lot of loops and a lot of code and still you will be able to achieve a lot of stuff. And for that, we need to go through the data structures that are available in Python. So from the very next video, we will start seeing strings. That's the data structure. We will see list in detail. We will see set in detail. We will see dictionary in detail. We will see tuples in detail. And after going through all these data structures and getting a good grip for the data structures, then finally we will move, we will move to the, the packages that are available for data science, particularly NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib. And uh, we will see, uh, maybe, I include, maybe I include one or two videos for scikit-learn as well. So hope to see you for the whole new phase in Python, the data structures. So we'll hope to see you in the next video. Okay, let's dive into the long awaited strings. String is basically just a sequence of characters and it's a data type. It's kind of a data type uh, in, in Python. It's much more powerful. The reason, uh, the reason of, I mean, making this a whole new data type in, in, in almost every language is the reason is that almost all the data, all the text that appears in sequence of characters, so making that sequence of character, the whole text, as one kind of data type and writing special kind of functions to, to deal with that text might be necessary. And that's what string is. In Python, for example, you can declare a string variable, s or any variable name, by just double quotes, let's say a, b, c, or, or equivalently by single quotes. Either way is fine, D, E, F. So either way is fine. You can declare uh, using double quotes or single quotes, either way is fine. One thing is be careful, don't mix. Uh, I mean, don't start by single quote and think that now I will end with double quote and that will be fine. So don't mix them together. If you're using single quotes, use single quotes. If you're using double quotes, use double quotes. Don't mix them together. That might be much more confusing later on. So uh, let's say this S is a string. Python is the best language for data science. Let's say T is another string that is defined by single quotes. Uh, in this course, we are going to learn Python. Uh, then you you can print S uh, different in a different way. Let's say you can call you can call a print S. Uh, you can call a print to T. Or you can just, by the way, you can you can add two string variables, s and t, and the result is a new variable, that's a v. Um, how the plus symbol works in, in strings is, plus in strings means just concatenate, concatenate them together. So first you just copy this uh, string, the whole string, and then you just concatenate the other string with it, and uh, the, the result is a new string. Now that's a new variable, you can use that variable and do a lot of stuff with it. So let's go to Python and see actually 
the prints in, in a, uh, the, the strings in, in the running form. So let's say S is a, a string, let's say um, Python is a good language, let's say. And let's have another string T that is using single quotes. It's good for data science, S-C-I-N-C. -E okay, it's good for data science. Let's run these two and see the type of S. What's the type of S? The type is str, string, str. That's what the type is. And if you just print S, um, that will be printed. Python is a good language. Remember, um, so far we are using this print and always we use this kind of hello or something like that. That basically is a string because, uh, by the way, this print function actually, it, it takes an arbitrary number of arguments. We can print hello, then we can print anything in another type, then we can print another hello, let's say hello to, hello to, that's a multi-variable multi argument function print. Then we can have another string maybe who are you um, and then maybe a floating point number 5.9 so we, we have used these kind of uh, we have used these kind of uh, I mean stuff a lot um, we have used print function and we we, we we were using this double quotes again and again but but these are actually strings um, that we will be that we were using later uh, there uh, so this print function actually accepts strings and all these kind of normally the whenever you use print normally you are using normally you're going to uh, actually display some text and uh, maybe you're writing that text into some file and so on so this string is highly highly uh, useful most of the data is available in the text form in the string form and we want to process the data we want to find the anomalies in data we want to fix them again we want to stay in the text so it is good to have a data type that actually have a lot of functionality that handles all that stuff. So um, let's see, for example, uh, another, uh, um, another uh, uh, let's see how can we concatenate the, the two strings, for example, S and T. Let's say we have V, that is S plus T. That's concatenated V, and let's print V. And V is concatenated, wow. Python is a good language. It's good for data science. Well, it is concatenated, but um, there is no space between two because wherever the first string ends, the second string starts right from there. What if we concatenate three strings? Uh, S plus another string that just contains a space character, then this string. By the way, whatever that is there in double quotes or single quotes, whatever one character two track character all these things are are called strings so now we are concatenating three strings together s a space one space string that contains just a space character then t and let's see what happens now so python is a good language space it's good for data science and so on um, wow so um, yeah so that's basically the introduction of string. What if we want, for example, uh, to concatenate, what, what if we want, we have a variable A, which is 12, and let's say uh, we have a variable B, which is uh, the price of this book. Let's say the price of this book and A is 12. So let's say this is our price. Now price is in integer form, S is in book form. Let's say we want to make another string V that contains the following kind of thing. The price of this book is, and then whatever the price is, that should be there. So what? how can we do that? So let's say S plus maybe, maybe another string is, then maybe a space so that after that the price appears. Now if we, write plus and write price, price is no longer a string. It is an integer. And an integer cannot be concatenated with the string in a straightforward way like plus. How can we 
how can we make a message like that the, the price of this book is whatever the value of the price is one way to do that is to convert the variable price to convert the type of the variable of price from integer to string that means whatever the value in this case 12 is written that becomes a string of characters 1 and 2 and now it can be concatenated with with the rest of the string and we will contain the message that we want so for example if we now see what is v that is the price of this book is um, this book is 12 oh we don't have a space before is so let's let's type a space there space is also a character can be handled in string wow so that's how um, we can convert different types to string um, we, we can have a flow type we can convert that to string and so on uh, another way of doing the same or achieving the same kind of stuff is to write print uh, the price of this book uh, is I mean we can use the power of the variable number of arguments of then price that's exactly the same thing the price of this book is uh, 12 the price of this book however consider one thing the print function automatically adds the space for different kind of arguments you can see that here yeah you need not to specify specify a space the space is automatically added if it is if it is considered to be a different argument in the print function okay great so um, that's the introduction of a string uh, we are going to explore string much in in in, in a much more detail uh, in in the upcoming videos so stay with us we are going to see a string in much more detail okay hope to see you in the next video a string might be very lengthy um, or may span I mean very lengthy and may span more than one lines or maybe the formatting is in a way that you want to even if it is, even if it is not very lengthy you still want uh, the different chunks of the same string to be uh, appear in different lines so there is a way to declare multi-line string again using either three single quotes or three double quotes and then three double quotes or single quotes whatever convention you follow and then you write all the string in no matter how many lines you want and that one variable actually contains a multi-line string if you now print for example if you call the print function on this multi-line that that's by the way a variable name multi-line string that contains this data multi-line multi multi line that multi, multi the spelling or spellings are wrong here I just written multi line anyways if you if you call that print function this will the print will display this string as it is like it is there so let's see the and and by the way the, the same multi line string kind of fashion remember that that is used for comments as well if you have comments that span on multiple lines you can use this so this multi-line string really is um, if if it is not saved in a variable and used as it is somewhere in the code then that acts as a multi-line comment great so uh, let's practice the multi-line string in in Jupyter notebook let's see so let's say we have a variable a that is a multi-line string and let's say the string is this is line one then we have this is line two and then we have this is last line and this line is three that's it okay great that's a multi-line string let's see how can if we print a what happens so this is line one this is line two this is last line and this line is three why this the first this is shifted one character right oh there is a space here let's remove that space if not required and run this again wow because space is a character that will be printed if you want okay what if you really want uh, the, the really want the following kind of stuff you have let's say print So what you really do is you want to print the following way the following 
options are available. And the options are, let's say, tab, 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 let's say, hyphen, A, and that does, hyphen, A, that does nothing. And then we have, let's say, hyphen, B, and that also, also does nothing let's say you want our message to be printed in in such a way what will happen let's see okay the following options are available hyphen a does nothing hyphen b i mean all this is a string multi-line string these characters that you think they are not there these are spaces and they are i mean the spaces are printed here the spaces are printed here where you're seeing nothing is printed these are the spaces that are printed there. So sometimes this multi-line uh, string, it helps to format our message in a way that we like. So that's helpful, helpful in most of the cases. Further, if you write this multi-line, uh, by the way, uh, if you write this multi-line um, comment in the start and end of any code script, that means the, uh, if you write this multi-line way of defining the strings, at the start and end of any code script, that code script is commented. Uh, that we have seen several times earlier as well. So, for example, in problem solving, remember that we define all, uh, oh yeah, so that's the comment. That's a comment. Um, even if some code is written inside, that will not be executed, right? Okay, so uh, that's about the multi-line string. Uh, in the next video, we will see because because the string really is is basically a, a collection of all these characters. What if we want to access a particular character? For example, this is the first character is T here. The second character is H. The third character is I. The fourth character is S. The fifth character is space and all that. What if we want to access particular characters inside the string? Because a string contains a lot of characters. What if we want to play with some of the characters inside the string? How can we access different characters? For example, if I want to access a uh, seventh character of the string, how can we do that? So let's see in the next video, how can we index different characters inside a string? Hope to see you in the next video. Okay, in this video, we are going to actually uh, access different characters inside the string, sometimes called indexing. Uh, the term slicing is basically more relevant to arrays lists are uh, actually the the mutable structures but we will see uh, um, I'm, I'm just comparing because you you may listen this term slicing again and again but really it is indexing but we will see the indexing or slicing sometimes uh, is you these two terms are used interchangeably uh, we will see the examples of slicing in in detail in uh, lists um, and and in more detail in numpy arrays but um, here, uh, you, you just think that indexing and slicing are the same things. Uh, index, so for example, I have this A, let's say this is A array A, and I want to access its uh, fourth element. Here, the fourth character element is E. By the way, um, this A is a variable. If I want to access the very first character, the, the indexing, the number, the positioning starts from the integer zero. That's the first character. So if I want to print out of it, that will print G. Uh, if I access, for example, if I write the index three, what do we mean? That means the fourth element. The fourth element is E. What, what will be printed? What will be printed if I access the fourth element, or the index four, if I access this thing? A space will be printed and you will be seeing nothing because when a space is printed, actually, nothing colorful is printed there and you might be thinking oh nothing is printed nothing nothing have been accessed actually a space character have been accessed so yeah uh, a more we can we can we can actually access we can actually access uh, a substring inside a string as well for example uh, we want to access for example a substring starting from index 3 and all the way up to index 8 but does not include the index eight. So it will include the character at index three, which is E, 
character at index 4 which is space let me write space in this way character at index uh, 5 which is O character at index 6 next character which is F then a space which is 7 and then the character at 8 so, so this is not included to be accessed this is included this is inside this is included this is not included so we can access a substring so starting from 3 ending at 8 let's see let's see an example and we'll come back to this slide again after after a few minutes so let's say we have a string s let's say how are you and uh, who are you let's say so let's say that's a string okay and what we really want is we want to access for example the we want to access the element to access the elements you have to write the square brackets that's a standard notation in Python whenever you have a collection and you want to access different elements that collection might be a string that collection later on we will receive might be a list maybe a tuple dictionary maybe a set uh, maybe an umpire array maybe a pandas structure or, I, I mean anything that I, that is a collection normally it is accessed by if it has different elements and we want to index them the indexing notation is square brackets and indexing always starts from zero rather than one in in python uh, there are some languages in which the indexing starts from one for example matlab uh, uh, the indexing starts from one but in python and in several other languages uh, the indexing starts from zero uh, which has some benefits over starting with one it has some benefits so starting with zero is okay it's okay so let's say we want to access element at index five the element at index 5 is actually the sixth element in the string starting from 0. So first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. So R will be printed. So let's see. Um, R is printed. Let's check the uh, let's check the type of this uh, return value. Uh, let's check the type of this uh, this one element which is R. What is the type of it? So type of uh, different elements in a string different characters in a string what are the types so what is the type of it so the type is also string so each and every character is also of string type in some other languages the the type might be a character character is another type but in 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 python each and every one character is also a string more than one character is also string as long as they are accessed from a string okay let's access for example the element number three to element number let's say eight so the result is r so element number three oh, oh not three <laughs> actually starting from index three which means the fourth character which is space and then e r e and then space and then then we finish if we for example move to from three to nine let's say and the the value will be r y or we may move to from for example we may start from the very beginning so for example index zero we may end at the index 10 but not including the 10 so the result is how are you and and i mean y o and not the u included because that's the index number 10 and index number 10 the last index is not included great uh, we can have negative indices in strings as well. So a negative index is just uh, just the indexing from the right side, not from the left side. For example, a negative index, uh, so minus one points to the last character, for example, u. Similarly, minus two points to the second last character and so on. So minus one, let's say it will access u. And similarly, we have uh, minus 3 and that will access uh, y or we may have start from let's say minus um, start from let's say minus uh, 8 and go till minus 3 that means go back to go back to minus 8 index and then move to minus 3 index okay and minus 3 in this case 
Let's see what, what's the result R. What is that? Why R? Oh, this R. I guess this R. Let's check it out. Uh, so this is this u this is minus one minus two minus three that's index number three so three is not included minus three is not included so it has to stop here okay that's uh, minus four minus five minus six minus seven and minus eight oh great so that should be printed it has printed so let's say we have rather than minus eight we start from minus twelve and we reach to minus three so who are okay great so we have negative indices as well um, and by the way this kind of fetching this kind of substring uh, is sometimes called uh, slicing I mean we are just fetching the slicing although the term slicing is much more popular in 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 mutable data structures uh, what a, what is a mutable data structure what is a immutable data structure well um, yeah, I should tell you right now, you can change, you cannot change um, any character in the string. Um, that might, that might look like a bad news for you, but once the string is created, the elements in the strings are not changeable. So for example, let's say at position number one, you want to place a character, let's say E. That's not possible, and the reason is, the string is a data structure, the string is a variable type, a data type that is immutable, immutable or unchangeable. Once created, you cannot change its contents. They stay fixed. You cannot change them, you cannot alter them, you, you cannot delete certain contents from it. I, I mean, once created, it stays as it is. You can copy this into another string. You, you, you can copy and paste, but you can get a substring and copy into another variable, for example. But the contents of S cannot be changed. Um, so all the kind of data types in Python that are unchangeable, the contents are not changeable. They are called immutable, and string is immutable. Um, so so the, the, the term slicing makes much more, uh, I mean, sense or, uh, it it is more popular in the data structures that are mutable, um, that are mutable. Although uh, you can use the term slicing, indexing, both inter interchangeably, uh, but it refers to roughly it refers to uh, fetching a substructure or substring. In this case, in the list, it it will be a sublist or so on. So that's what slicing is. Yeah, um, great. Why don't we do some more fun with this string? Yeah. Let me show you more fun with this string, uh, more indexing. Let's say you start at index zero, you go to index 12, but not including 12, and then you jump, you take a jump of two rather than one. What will it do is, it will fetch all the characters starting from index zero, all the way to index 12, but not including 12, but it will take a jump of two rather than taking a jump of two. So first character, then take a jump of two, then pick a character, then take a jump of two, and then pick a character. So it will actually pick every other character starting from zero. So let's see that. So for example, if you remember the string, that's the string. So it starts from H, fine. Then it skips O and go to W. Then it skips space and go to A. Then it skips R and go to E. Then it skips space and go to U. And then it skips O and go to U. And then the 12th achieved and we stop there. Wow. So the, the general way of slicing or indexing, the general way is you have a start index, start, then you have end index, and then you have step size. If you do not mention the step size, the step size by default is one that we were doing already. If you do not mention the end, the default end is the till the end, the total list size. If you do not mention the start, the default start is zero. For example, let me make that a comment and just uh, practice a few, for example. Let's start from zero. We do not mention the start. Let's start from zero and go to 12. If you do not mention the starting index, that starts from the very beginning, zero, go till 12. Okay, great. If we do not mention, for example, uh, we, we start from three and we do not mention the end, that means uh, go till 
the end starting from index 3 including the last character okay if we do not mention the step for example if you start from 1 go to 12 and we do not mention the step the default step is 1 okay um, there is one way of reversing the string I mean very beautiful way I mean you do not you do not start the mention you do not mention the start you do not mention the end and then just take a step of minus one in this particular way the start and end index they are they are just swapped and you get the string reversed way wow so that's the reverse string isn't that fancy yes it is okay um, a lot about uh, indexing you can find out the length of any string by using len function you can find out the length of any substring if you want to if you have a substring using again a length function len that's okay okay and now we have seen how to access substrings and how to, we cannot change the elements of a string because it is immutable but we can access them we can access them we can uh, just display them we can analyze them and so on in the next uh, video, we will see uh, some functions that are supplied for string processing. What we can do with strings and I mean, how can we manipulate the, those strings? Although we cannot manipulate the contents of a string, but we may copy a string, we may get a string, manipulate it and save it to another uh, variable and uh, how, what kind of functions that are available in string, in string data structure, string data type. So let's see that in the next video. Hope to see you in the next video. Okay, let's see different functions that are available to play with the strings um, in, in this string data structure. Let's say you have uh, this string, A, a lot of spaces. Uh, these are a lot of spaces at the beginning, and these are a lot of spaces at the end. There are some spaces in the middle as well. So there is one function called strip. Uh, all the functions of the string, they are called by taking a dot a dot something uh, these are called methods you 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 can loosely call them functions but um, those kind of functions that are related to some data structure and called with dot they are sometimes called methods uh, the, the, the term method is more related to object-oriented programming actually string is a class so all these are the methods but even without knowing that it's perfectly okay you can call it method or function that's perfectly okay you can i mean it, it's okay it's okay without knowing what a class is without knowing what an object oriented programming is this a dot some function that operates on this a um, one difference with method and function is when you call a function with a dot and you call some function let's say a dot strip then inside the definition of the function this a object or the a variable is available like like you have passed that variable as an input argument that's all you need to know uh, about the difference of method and function the rest of the story um, is perfectly okay even if you don't know that's that's fine okay a dot strip it operates on a which means the a is passed in this function as just as input argument or it is available there inside the function implementation and then the strip function, what it does is it removes all the spaces that are in the beginning and removes all the spaces that are at the end and returns another string that has that has no spaces at the beginning and no spaces at the end. And the new string is copied or created in a variable B, let's say, whatever that variable, we can, we can have another name of that variable. So let's see. Uh, let's see the running form of this strip function in our friend Jupyter Notebook. So let's say uh, A is a string variable. Let's say a lot of spaces, A, B, C, D, E, F, a lot of spaces, then H, G, Q, and whatever, and then a lot of spaces. Let's say this is A, and then we have B, let's say A dot uh, strip. Okay and let's print b so b is uh, actually everything without spaces without the starting spaces and without the ending spaces it does not hurt the spaces inside so that's a strip function sometimes processing the data when we when we read the data from a file it may have a lot of spaces at the beginning at the end maybe due to 
formatting issues or something like so and it is this function is available if we want to remove those spaces uh, from beginning or from the end let's see more functions another function is lower like the name suggests it actually um, it actually converts all the string to lowercase for example let's say we have uh, a string let's say a b uh, let's say we have a string a equals um, a b c d e f g and some characters some other characters and q f let's say that's a string and now what we do is b equals a dot lower what it does is it converts all the string to lowercase for the characters that are already in lowercase it doesn't hurt it for the characters that has nothing to do with lower or uppercase it doesn't hurt that all the characters that are not in the lowercase and can be converted to lowercase those are converted to lowercase and this is available yeah great so similarly we have another function called upper for example c is equal to a dot upper that the, like the name suggests it converts all the characters to uppercase wow let's see more functions oh there is a function replace the replace function what it does is it takes a substring and uh, replaces that substring with another substring okay let's see it for example let's say we have we want to we have the same a let's say the a is uh, this thing let's say that's a um, and what we want to do is we want to replace the semicolons let's say with uh, with with the semicolon we want to replace the semicolons with statics so what we can do is we can say okay d equals a dot replace um, replace the semicolon with uh, with let's say static or yeah so let's see what d is so each semicolon is replaced by a static by the way if you if you want to replace for example a uh, a dot replace if you want to replace one is one semicolon one semicolon with a string for example the string is star star and and hat hat person person that means one semicolon will be replaced by this see with this string and the other semicolon will also be replaced by this string and the result will be as expected each semicolon will be replaced by this string and that's the result what it is um, further if you want for example um, if, if you want for example uh, let's say uh, d equals a dot replace if you want uh, this particular substring that contains the two semicolons if you want the two semicolons to be replaced by another substring let's say two semicolons that's it and that is also possible i mean you you replace one substring with another one yeah great there is one more function called split um, that what it does what what the split does is um, for example you have uh, a string for example um, let's say a equals a string let's say a b c then you have this colon then you have d e f then you have semicolon then you have h g y this then semicolon then you have y y three two two three and that's it that's your string uh, let's say you read that string from some CSV file and this appears and now what you want you want all these uh, values to be separated out that are that that are separated by the semicolon maybe these are different values ABC is a different value then it is separated by a semicolon semicolon may be an indication or token that the next value started and and so on let's say you want to separate them let's say you want to just split them all of them with a particular splitter and here let's say the splitter is semicolon so what you can do is you can have a list and a dot split and in the split you can specify the character that 
uh, that is used for splitting after and before we split that. And remember the split function actually returns a list of strings where this is the first element of the list, this is the second element of the list, this is the third element of the list, this is the fourth element of the list and so on. Because once you will split, uh, you will be having different elements that are split it out. So if you print, for example, L, you will be having a list of different strings, A, B, C, and all that. Oh, don't worry about this single code. The single code and double code is the same thing. Now we can access, for example, the third element or, or maybe the second element by index one. And the second element here is D, E, F, and we can work more on that. Okay, um, is that it? I mean, are these the only functions that are available? Strip function, lower, upper, replace, and split function. Or is that it? That's all the string is about? Uh, maybe there are more functions. Uh, how many functions are there in string? How can we use them? What are the, what are the total number of functions? Where is the list? Uh, where is the documentation? Should we, should we follow some book? Should we go to some tutorial and find all the string functions and see how to use them? Well, if you want to do that, you can do that, but there is another smart way. Let's say A is a string that you know. You write A dot and then a press tab. And all the things that they, that are there in, in string, they will, they will appear in front of you. I mean, several things. You can go to this, you can go to that, you can go to that, and so on. So just you can check the documentation of A. For example, if you if you press A, then what it does, let's see. It's a string object and all that stuff, fine, it's a string. So further, what we can do. Um, so let's say A dot, we press A and then we press tab. Is there anything that starts from A? No. Is there anything that starts from B? No. Is there anything that starts from C? Yes. Capitalize, case fold, center, count. These are the functions that are available that starts from C. Okay, let's focus on capitalize. Okay, what is that thing? How to use it? Let's press colon, uh, question mark, and see what this is and what it does. Okay, so here is the documentation. Here is a doc string. Returns a capitalized version of the string. Capitalized version of the string. Is that the same as upper? Maybe. So let's see. Now we know what it does. Let's just check it out. Print A, capitalize, and see what's the result. Oh, it's cap. Oh, no, it, it does not capitalize the whole string, does it? Uh, the, the, the string A was, it does not capitalize the whole string. Um, what, what is A? Let's see, what is A? A is the following string. A is the following string, so it does not capitalize the whole string. Oh, the difference between the capitalize maybe and the upper is that the capitalize, when it encounters, uh, when it encounters, no, 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 capitalize just capitalizes the first character. Oh, let me let me read the doc string again. Returns a capitalized version of the string. More specifically, make the first character have uppercase and the rest lowercase. Okay, that means if we have a string that has a mix of values, the capitalized will do the following. It will convert the first character to uppercase and all the rest of the characters to lowercase. Wow. That's an awesome function. For example, if you have string A, B, D, A, F, D, and G, G, Q, let's say, um, and then we call capitalize, capitalize, let's say. So what that does is it actually capitalizes the first character and all the rest of the characters there as it is. And there are other functions as well, A dot, um, a dot, uh, let's say count, what it does, a dot count, what it does, a dot count, what is that thing, let's check it out, or maybe we can check that out using help, what is a dot count, so let's see what is a dot count, uh, it's a built-in function, count methods is an instance, of, and uh, it returns a number of non-overlapping occurrences of a substring, 
uh, sub in oh my god if you uh, I mean that's what it what what is written there um, non overlapping occurrences of a substring great oh my god so um, basically uh, there are there are a whole lot of functions uh, of strings that are available there are several hues of the string there are several ways of molding and playing with the strings some of the functions are available some you can make your own you can make your own modules on top of that to customize your uh, to customize according to your requirements a lot of these are available and you should know how to use them uh, and first thing if you want to do something with string or with any data type in python first check whether some method is available or not and one way to go that is just right away from here another way is to go to internet and see i want to do this in python with strings whether there is a function available or not the good chances are there will be a built-in function that is available and in that case i will encourage to use that function rather than to write your own one because using the built-in function or the method that is tied up there will be much more faster probably than the function you will be writing at your end even if you are too smart in algorithms so uh, yeah so that's about the um, string uh, methods there are so many other methods that are available um, in the next video we will see um, some more um, some more manipulation and processing and, and and some more working with strings uh, and then we will move to other data structures okay hope to see you in the next video in the last video we saw some methods uh, of string um, and these are just a few of them a lot of them are available we just we just discussed some of them um, in, in this video, we are going to talk more about strings uh, in a particular way. For example, what if you want to find out whether a particular substring is there in a string or not? Let's say you have a string and you want to know whether a particular substring is there inside a string or not. Well, you can easily find out that using the in keyword. And similarly, not in means the reverse of that or the, the complement of that or not of that. And in keyword always will return either true, a boolean, or false. If it is inside the string, it will return true. If it is not inside, it will return false. So let's check this, the implementation of that in, in the in Jupyter Notebook. So let's see. So let's say we have a string uh, ABC, ABC, and we want to check whether this string is there in this particular string or not. So the return value is false because ABC as a stop string is no longer there. Um, a is there, uh, for example, here. AB is here, but ABC is no longer there. Yeah. So if we, for example, have an ABC somewhere at least once, then the result will be true. Um, in in the last uh, in the last to last video or maybe in the very first video for strings, I showed you that you can use plus with strings. Can you compare two strings using less than or equal to? Um, I mean, how to compare two strings whether they are same or not? For example, A B C. Let's say that's a string A B C. I want to check whether that string is the same as uh, A B C or not. What will be the result? So 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 the question is is this double equal to used can be used for comparing two strings well the answer is yes oh what what will be the meaning of less than a string is less than the other is that true for example abc is less than let's say def is that true if it is true for example what does it really mean how can we define one string is i mean this string is lesser than the other string maybe this uh, maybe this operator is uh, working based on the length of the strings but if even if that then this length is the same as this length and to be more precise we can change that length for example by just saying okay abc uh, def gh I, and I guess this string will be still smaller than the right string. So how this comparison is working? Well, I guess the comparison is working based on the based on the alphabetic order, and you know the alphabetic order. 
A becomes first, then B, then C, and all the alphabetic order that is there in English dictionaries. That's how the strings are working here. And the alphabetic orders for all the special characters will also be defined in Python, for example. Um, and that's a special character, for example. Uh, maybe this string. Is this string smaller than the following string? Yeah, return true or false. Because there is particular ordering in, uh, in, in, in Python that is defined for these characters that this becomes first and this, like A becomes first and B, B becomes first and C and so on. So whatever the alphabetic order is based on that order, you can compare the two strings, no problem. So these are also available. And the third thing is in function that is also available to check whether a particular string is inside, a substring is inside or not to uh, in another string. One more thing that I want to talk about uh, in, in that, for example, what if your goal is to print the following? Let's say, let's say you want to print the following. We are learning. And let's say you want to print the string in double quotes. We are learning string here. Let's say you want to print this. You want this string to appear in double quote. How can you do that in Python? Well, it looks like same. What's the difficulty? Uh, let's let's call the print function and then just write here. Uh, we are learning. Uh, then write the double quote here, string, and here. That's it. But there is a problem. The reason is, uh, the reason is when we call this, uh, when we write this double quote, actually the string ends here. Exactly, the string ends here. And when we write this single quote and this double quote, the, another string starts here. And this is no longer a string. Um, I mean, what it, it has no data type inside. Well, um, how can we then insert these uh, double quotes inside? Well, there are several ways. One way is to use escape sequence. And escape sequence is just like, it is, you use a slash and then whatever you use is uh, considered as a corrector inside the string that is you're using. And now if you want another uh, double quote, you use a, you use a corrector which is the backslash or maybe a forward slash and if you use that that means that means whatever that is coming in front of it should be used as it is rather than rather than considering that that's a special string defining symbol now in this particular case you'll be having your double quotes available and the backslash will be just out it's just defining that don't touch this double quote it has nothing to do with defining a string it is just because i want to highlight this word another more uh, another more uh, easy way is to use the single quotes for example we are learning and use the double quotes as a corrector inside that now the single quote wherever it starts and ends they define the string everything else is a corrector we do not need a escape character where we where we want okay great uh, and uh, there are a lot of escape characters for example we have v are backslash n that means go to new line we are now on an other line so this backslash n actually puts everything that comes after to a new line that's an escape character similarly we have uh, an escape character backslash t that actually inserts a tab um, whenever we want so if we are then a tab then now on another line now on another tab whatever so there are a lot of escape characters. I mean, backslash n, backslash t, there are other. So it is good to know those. One more thing that is important, for example, let's say you want to print, uh, let's say you want to print um, some address on the drive. Let's say c, backslash, uh, backslash or forward slash, whatever that is called, uh, name, backslash drive. Let's say you want to do that and your goal was to just print that path. What will happen is this backslash n will be treated as a new line escape sequence and backslash n will tell, okay, go to the next line and treat the rest of the things. But because backslash d is not any escape 
sequence it is not listed inside it is treated as it is and that way this slash is also treated as a character but here because if uh, this slash followed by this n that's a combination that is already there for a new line that is treated in a different way if you want this to be used as it is and you don't want these you don't want this behavior you just want that all this should be treated in a very literal or raw sense then you should just apply an r there an r will tell okay that's a that's a raw string everything inside just treat that as a raw string um, there is no escape sequence inside great so um, and there is much more about string we can talk but that that was the most important that I that I told you at least to me uh, we can explore this more actually you should now explore this more what are other functions of string how can we play with strings in another way and stuff and so on um, if I talk about strings, I can just uh, I mean I can give a whole course on strings as well but um, here I just give you a snapshot of strings if you need more about strings I mean you should be searching on internet or seeing documentations and seeing basically uh, what you want according to your requirements search the functions uh, probably they will be available okay um, in the next video we are going towards list tuples uh, sets and dictionaries some other data structures that we were talking about earlier we will be going to explore them in more detail from the next video hope to see you in the next video a data structure informally or in a very naive uh, sense is basically a collection of a lot of basic data types uh, that contains data one structure contain a lot of data um, and we can define sometimes several methods and several specialized kind of functions are customized and defined just because of that uh, data structure to perform efficiently uh, different kind of uh, I mean for different kind of tasks we may have to define or we may have to choose different kind of data structures the basic data structures uh, that are available in Python is a list tuple set and a dictionary these are the basic data structures that are available we can create our own data structures if we want to but uh, most of the problems almost all of the problems mostly they are solved by these four basic data structures uh, although um, a lot of these are not that efficient uh, there are efficient uh, ways for a customized kind of problems uh, we will see uh, that efficiency when we will deal with the package numpy that is uh, that is faster than all of these uh, but we, but we will see what kind of constraints are there to make it faster anyways uh, data set in a very loose term is collection it is collection of a lot of values a lot of data inside um, and uh, all these uh, data structures list tuple set and dictionary they they are collection of data of heterogeneous types which means one value can be integer another element let me call an element another element or item another item or element can be of string type another element can be of let's say floating point number another element is a whole list itself another element is a tuple and so on so different elements can be of different types and that makes uh, the, this heterogeneity that makes these four data structures much more applicable and much more abstract and they can be applied to almost all the problems so let's see one by one and let's compare them together because the best way to understand four of these is just to compare them which can do what as compared to the rest so let's let's compare them and learn how how can we use those in detail so list uh, first is list list is ordered ordered here means uh, it is indexable which means uh, there is a part the element number one is at position one element there is an ordering of elements first element second third 25th element there is an ordering of element uh, with respect to their position so that's what we, we mean by ordered uh, changeable or sometimes called more more reasonable term or more usable term is mutable mutable means uh, once the list is created as contrast to string once the list is created uh, you can change its elements for example you can change the third element with another element and that's perfectly fine you can change it that what we mean by a changeable or more 
popularly called as mutable. Duplicates means the list can contain more than one, one element more than, I mean, at, at the position number three, you can have the same item and position number five, you can have the same item. So the duplicates are allowed. Tuple, however, although ordered, uh, there, are, there is an ordering of elements, there, is, there are indices of different elements. This is immutable. Uh, you can, once tuple is created, like strings, once the tuple is created, you cannot change different elements in the tuple. You have to create a new tuple if you want to, but you cannot change the items in the tuple. And the duplicates are allowed again. Um, set, on the other hand, is unordered, which means there is no indexing, there is no positioning, there is no first element, there is no third element, there is no fifth element. There is, that's a collection without, without actually indexing. Uh, you, because you cannot access a particular element with index, you cannot change it. But what you can do it, you can insert more elements and you can remove existing elements uh, if you want to. Um, again, the set, like in mathematics, sets does not contain any duplicates. So one item appears just once. Uh, we will see the examples. Dictionary, a very, very, very powerful data structure. Uh, again, it is, it is, dictionary is just like a set. It's a set, it is unordered. Again, changeable, you can change them, you can change the items, you can, and the dictionary, the, the and it does not have duplicates because it's, a, it's basically a set. It is just like a set. Uh, the power of dictionary is each item consists of, consists of a pair and uh, one one value in the pair is called key and another is called the value. For example, val is key for 12, name is key for ban and, and so on. So we have seen this uh, dictionary before in loops and stuff in just a very loose way, but th that's really a very, very powerful data structure. And later on we will see um, in pandas basically, all the data uh, is basically managed just like a dictionary if you if you have a good knowledge of dictionary you'll be having a very good grip very quickly on on a big data science library or big data science package which is called pandas because each and everything in pandas is handled just like we're handling a dictionary so it's it's a really powerful data structure to to know about so um so so list is uh, mutable uh, dictionary is mutable. Set is mutable in a sense that you can insert and remove elements. Tuple is not mutable. Um, and, and, and that's the comparison theoretically what, what is there. All these types, each and every of them ha is a collection of different uh, values and the values can have different types. That's the, that's the abstract power of all these data structures. So uh, in the next video, we will, uh, we will we will actually try to get a good grip uh, on list, tuple, set, and dictionary, and we will actually define them, code them, access different uh, methods of those, and we will be we will be trying to become comfortable with with these data structures by coding them in Python. So, hope to see you in the next video. Okay, continuing previous video, we were talking about uh, uh, data structures uh, in the last video. So let's go to the Jupyter Notebook and see how a list can be defined or declared, how a tuple can be defined or declared, set and dictionary. Let's see how can we make these uh, data structures in, in Python. So then one by one we will compare how can we access elements of the list, how can we insert more elements in list, tuple, set and dictionary and, and, and see the comparisons of all these one by one, operation by operation. So let's see. So let's go to Jupyter Notebook, our friend. Um, this file is getting lengthy and lengthy. Let's, let's make multiple files. Let's say this is part one. Just save it. And let's make uh, another, um, let's make another file. Uh, for example, let's just close this file or maybe stay it opened. Let's close this file and make another file. Uh, Python 3 um, yeah so let's name that file as this part 2 let's start a new file that that file was I mean that was okay to stay with that file as well but just let's make another file okay um, so let's just 
have a markdown cell and let's have a heading um, uh, data structures remember the markdown cells I just introduced them uh, introduced those just uh, in the very beginning and then we just forget them uh, because writing these description again and again will make the video length here uh, and the purpose is not to actually format the uh, notebook the purpose is just to show you the power of Python so I just omitted writing these descriptions more and more but just write a few descriptions in the start and then we will forget again oh that's a good, that's amazing let's define a list so list any variable name that's a variable name list is uh, let's say this you define list by square brackets and different elements they are separated by comma let's say one three four point nine um, name anything I mean uh, or five or maybe maybe three again so that's a list okay um, tuple on the other hand is defined using parentheses so let's say one three four point nine let's say name and let's say three again that's okay that's a tuple a tuple is defined uh, in in so when you write parentheses that means by default that's a tuple the the variable name has I mean if you have written T that has nothing to do that it's a tuple that's because the Python is dynamically typed when you will write the parentheses that means the the tuple is being defined let's define a set let's call the variable as s the set is defined with with these curly brackets so let's say one three four point nine I want to tell you that all these things they can contain each element can have a different type but then even if we include this three again because the set cannot contain the duplicates later on we will see only one copy of three will be there in the set the other will even if we want to include it will not be included okay then let's say a dictionary uh, dictionary is again defined like a set but but each element is a pair separated by a colon let's say the key value is uh, 23 that's a key value that's a key and the value here is a string let's say uh, 2 3 that's let's say the value now comma now one element is there this one element that consists of key and value pair another element uh, another element may have a key with string so so the keys can be of different types the the values can be of different types and so abstract so the key is let's say um, let's say B and the value for this is let's say 43 then maybe we can have another uh, key value pair with key as uh, let's say C and the value is let's say um, CC CCD let's say charge couple device okay anyways so um, so you now you know how to define the list how to define a tuple how to define a set and how to define a dictionary the the, the difference is uh, is the, the main difference here is in dictionary because one element consists of two values rather than one okay let's print that and see the types let's print all the types print type of so let's print them uh, the type of L is so the type of L is just print it that's L let's print that let's see the other types let's print the rest as well so just copy them and paste the type of list L is that the type of tuple is T and let's say we have T then we have S and then we can just replace this with S and then we have let's say uh, D dictionary and that's that's D okay so let's print 
So the type of L is list, the type of T is tuple, the type of S is uh, set, the type of D is dictionary. Oh, great. So that's how you can define um, these lists. Um, uh, you can define list, you can define tuple, you can define set, and you can define dictionary. No problem. Um, next, let's see how to access different elements uh, from from these data structures. What are the way, for example, to access an element from a list, let's say the element number, element that indexed with one. Remember the element that indexed with one is element number two, because the indexing starts from zero. So you can access that using the square brackets. If you want to access from tuple, again from the square brackets, exactly like the list. In set, for example, you cannot index it because the set has no ordering first second third element is no longer there but you can you can you can check whether a particular element is there in the set or not using in keyword uh, in dictionary for example if you want to check whether a particular uh, element if you want to access value for a particular key you just write the dictionary variable name and then write the key and it will return the value Okay, so uh, let's practice this in, in Jupyter. Let's just practice this in Jupyter. So let's say list uh, value at index one. Uh, so let's print this list at index one. Uh, the value should be printed as three. Print tuple at index one. Again, the way of accessing is the same print print whether um, three in s or not the return value will be the return value will be true or false so print will be true or false and then print uh, d and just access the value with the key 23 so let's see what happens so l at index one is three t at index one is three S, three is in S, yes. Um, and what is the value with the key 23? The value is, the value is two, three. Um, let me just describe more about this D. What is the value at uh, index B, for example? Now we have to give the index B in the string format. That's 43, yeah. So that's how we can access that. Let's print S also. Let's see S because when we have defined S, we have defined this duplicate three. But if you see the elements of S, there are no duplicates and it does not maintain even any ordering. I mean, we have defined S in a different way. It is maintaining everything maybe in a different way. One, three, um, yeah. Oh, the ordering this way is the same, but there is no index for the first or second or third element and so on. Okay, so that's about the uh, defining, declaring, or accessing different elements. In the next video, we will see more about uh, about the data structures. Actually, uh, actually, want to spend some time on the data structures because that will be a basic building block for for the data science packages. To if we if we know very well about these data these data structures we will be very fluent in the data science packages and working with those. Okay, hope to see you in the next video. Okay, in the last video we define list, tuple, set and dictionary and we actually access different values. Um, uh, in this video I'm going to actually uh, I'm going to actually introduce more indexing how to access list and tuple in particular because the, the both are very uh, very easily indexable like strings um, and I want to show you that all kind of indexing that you have seen in strings exactly works in list as well as in tuple. So let's go to Jupyter and see what a list is. For example, a list, if you print the list, that's a list. It has these kind of uh, values. If you just see the list, for example, starting from index one, ending at index uh, three, that that means the same pick a slice for example um, so index one value is three index two value is 4.9 and the last element is not included so if you get that 
you get 3 and 4.9. So exactly the same, the same kind of indexing that you have seen in strings, exactly that is working here as well. So for example, if I say list, start from uh, the beginning, go to end, but then I just give minus one, it will reverse the whole list. I mean, the whole list will be reversed. Um, I mean, all the same, all the things that, that we saw in, uh, in string, the indexing stays exactly the same in list as well as in tuple. Uh, so tuple, for example, let's access element uh, from, um, let's say from the very beginning till the, uh, till, till the third element. That's uh, not the third element till index three, which is actually the fourth element. So tuple and list, they are exactly, they will be exactly indexed as, as, a, as it is. So all the slicing, all the indexing, all the sub, sub listings, all, uh, all the sub tuples, they can be accessed exactly the same way as you, as you've gone through, uh, through the, through the string. Uh, one uh, difference here that I will explain later on, uh, because uh, list is mutable, it is changeable. I will discuss one thing that when you, when you slice it, when you get a sub list, um, uh, then actually it refers to the same memory. And if you change the sub list contents, the actual list got changes. Um, that, is, that is true for list um, in, in slicing. Uh, and that is true for sets and uh, dictionaries. In, in, in the copying, the references, and so on. So I will discuss that later on, but rest of the things are roughly the same as, as they're in string. Indexing, actually indexing uh, is almost the same everywhere in Python. It has uh, this kind of sli slicing is almost the same. If, if you know the index, how to index strings, you know how to index lists. If you know how to index lists, you know how to index tuples and strings and, and everything. And by the way, if you know how to index uh, string lists, you'll be very fluent in NumPy. That's the very powerful data structure. Uh, that's the very powerful uh, kind of uh, array processing package um, with, with, with some differences that we will see, but uh, um, even the indexing is same in Pandas when you are working with large amount of data, data files and stuff like so. The indexing is more or less the same that you've seen in, uh, in strings. We will, we will cover indexing, masking, and fancy kind of indexing in much more detail in NumPy, but this stays the same as, as you've seen in, in, in strings. Okay, so um, now uh, uh, can, we, can we expand the list? Can we add more elements? Can we insert more elements to the list? The answer is yes, because list is changeable, mutable, you can insert more elements. One way of inserting that is just to call an add operator. You just add plus and you just uh, insert another list. So like like two strings are concatenated by plus, two lists can be concatenated or combined together again by plus. But there is a faster function called append l dot append that is sometimes faster than using this operator. We will see that. Tuple, because it is immutable, uh, you cannot touch any content of the tuple. You cannot actually uh, insert any element to a tuple. You cannot delete any element to a tuple. There are workarounds, for example, convert a tuple to a list, change it, then convert the list to a tuple. There are ways to do that. But tuple in its true sense, in the literal sense, it is immutable. You cannot insert any element. You cannot delete any element. You cannot change any element. However, you can combine two tuples uh, together. You can concatenate two tuples together again by plus operator and save the result into a new tuple. That's possible. Set um, the, you can insert elements using an add function. Add function allows you to just insert one element. If you want to insert more than one elements, then you can call an update function that uh, actually accepts more than one element, that accepts another set that need to be inserted. That's possible. Dictionary, uh, you can insert a new key by just D, new key equals to that. You just assign uh, a new value to a new key and the key value pair is just inserted there. Great. Um, you can delete or remove any element from the list using DEL command, DEL L1. That means the this particular element is deleted from the list that is possible. Deleting particular element from the tuple is not possible. However, you can delete the whole variable, whole tuple that is possible. 
Uh, you can remove uh, elements from the set using remove function, s dot remove, and then you just give uh, the element that you want to remove that is possible. It will be removed, and you can delete the whole delete the whole variable that is always available. Similarly, you can delete a particular item from the dictionary by just deleting by just calling the d of the value uh, for example whatever the key is so you call with the key and call the uh, delete and it will delete everything um, I, I want to mention here for to remove uh, items from the list there are other methods and functions that are also available that uh, i mean there is a remove function there's a pop function these are available uh, similarly, um, from removing elements from the dictionary, there are other functions that are available. But just to compare them together, I, I'm using this del command, although there are other ways of doing the same stuff as well. So um, let's, uh, um, let, let's, let's, let's end this video here, and uh, in the next video, I will show you all these uh, operations that... Um, concatenating together, inserting more elements, deleting different elements. I will show you all these things in, in Python. So, so hope to see you in the next video. Okay, in the last video we saw how to insert different elements to different data structures. And we, for example, in the case of tuples, it is not possible. And we also saw how to, how to actually delete different elements wherever possible. So let's go to our friend Jupyter Notebook and see um, all these uh, concepts in a running form. So let's go. Okay, so let's, for example, we have list, that's our list. Let's append an element to the list or maybe more elements. That is L plus, let's say we can have another list, for example, how or that's a six and then you that's it. and these two lists will be appended and the new list will be uh, as you can see this similarly we can append an item using append function for example uh, 6.8 that will also be appended and the list will contain these kind of values so um, yeah so both ways are fine this plus is uh, this plus can be used to append to append two lists, and this append function can be used to simply uh, append a list w uh, with a with a, with an element. Okay, great. Um, tuples uh, you you cannot change a tuple. You cannot change a tuple. But what you can do is you can have two tuples. For example, t two is a different tuple. Let's say a and b. And let's say you have 45, let's say that's tuple two. Then you can have a third tuple that is just the combination of tuple one and tuple two. And in this case, you have tuple three, which is this. Yeah, so tuple one and tuple two are combined together, but you cannot actually insert into the same, the, the tuple is immutable. You cannot insert another element. You cannot delete the existing element. You cannot update any element and so on. Similarly, s, the set, let's see the state of the set. That's the set, set.add function. You can add anything, let's say 56, that is added there, and the new state of s is this. Or you can call the update function, if you, update method, if you want to insert uh, more elements. For example, if you have multiple elements to be inserted, 23, um, game, and uh, let's say you wanted to insert an element that is already there so for example one then um, the duplicates will no longer be there but the new elements will be inserted now let's see the state of d the state of d is this uh, if you want to add another key value pair you can add a key here for example a key might be a uh, new key for example new key and uh, the value might be uh, the value might be for example the new value well and now if you see d the the d uh, the contents of the d has changed wow that simple um yeah great uh, can you concatenate two dictionaries together using a plus operator is it possible um 
Is it possible to concatenate two dictionaries together? Let's say I have another I have another dictionary dictionary T2 um, that is um, let's say the key is y and the value is uh, yy and then we have another key let's say z and the value is uh, uh, let's say 10. Can I concatenate D and D2 together? Can I can I just update my D and add these values, insert these values also there? Okay, I left you with this question. You try to answer this and in the next video I will answer this question. But try to answer this question yourself. And one way to try that is just to go in Jupyter and just type and check whether plus is working or not or maybe there is another method and stuff like so. Okay, wait. Hope to see you. Oh, I have not used the DEL delete and all that stuff and so on. So this question is there. Let me use the removing the elements. So let's say L is this list. If I want to remove any element, let's say element number three, if I want to remove element at index three, which is this string name, I can use simply this delete and the L um, is everything but without that element. Uh, similarly, I can remove, if I want to remove any element from S, I can call the function remove and whatever I want to remove, let's say I want to remove game and the game will no longer be there. Uh, great. If I want to remove some element from dictionary, again, let's say that's the, that's the view of dictionary. I can call D and I can I can remove the element with key let's say C whatever the element is with key C delete that element and the dictionary has this particular state with this item this particular item is gone okay great I can do that but but DEL is not the only way of doing that there are so many methods I mean a lot of methods to do that but just to just to compare all these I'm just giving you the most similarities and differences wherever available. Okay, great. So I have asked you a question in this particular video. Can we concatenate two dictionaries together, particularly with a plus operator? If yes, then we are done. If not, then are there other ways and stuff like so? That's a question. So hope to see you in the next video with more on these uh, data structures. Okay, uh, I asked you a question last time. Can we concatenate this uh, two dictionaries together with a plus operator? So what's your answer? Um, yes or no? The answer is no, yeah. So we cannot concatenate them together. We cannot insert another dictionary to this dictionary using a plus operator because this plus operator is not defined for dictionary. What we can do is we can call an update function because dictionary is also a set, I mean a set of key value pairs but at the end of the day it's a set uh, with specialized function of course but we can call update functions and insert the whole new dictionary inside dictionary as 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 follows yeah so the answer is using plus operator no but there is a way using update method great so next um, we we focus on the copy function the copy function is available for list the copy function is available for set the copy function is available for dictionary. So let's see the need of this copy function. Here I want you to be very careful uh, because uh, that, that's really important. Uh, uh, let's say we have a list. Let's say uh, that's a list. And, and by the way, the same goes with set and dictionary as well, whatever I'm going to do with list. Let's say you have a list. Now what you do is you copy the list or you just make another variable like you can assign the value of l to another variable l2 what you do is that now l2 is also is this now these are two different variables l is this variable l2 is this variable so you might be thinking l2 is separately completely a new thing and l is a new thing you might be thinking that both are independent but python internally manages the data structures, most of the data structures in a way that because the data structure is a collection of a lot of data, it has a, it, it is consuming a lot of memory. What it does is when you assign a variable or data structure to, to another variable, 
it does not actually copy all the contents. It does not actually make a new memory uh, and store the contents in this. Um, it, it actually, this variable also actually points to the same memory as this. And, 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 the, and, and the consequence of that, if you change any value, for example, in L2, let's say you change the index2 value from this, the index2 value is 4.9, now you're working in L2. Let's say you change this L2 value from 4.9 to, let's 4.9. Let's say you do that. So you might be thinking that this happens in L2. Well, in L2, that has happened. But what it also does is, it does the same thing in L as well. So L also changes. The reason is, L and L2, they both are pointing to this structure in the memory. And whether you approach that structure through L or you approach that structure to L2, you are approaching the same memory anyway. And um, that is called referencing. I mean, it does not create the data, it actually creates a reference in the memory. It actually creates a new name for the same memory. And both are pointing to or accessing to the same memory. And if you really want the behavior so that L2 becomes different than L and whatever I do with L2 that should not affect L, then you should call copy function. L2 is L dot copy. Yeah, so that's the function, L dot copy. Now you have L2. Now you do whatever with L2, it will not affect L. So L2, for example, index at index 2, you again say, okay, this is 4.9. So L2 changes now. L2 changes, but L doesn't change. L doesn't change. L stays the same. Now this has different copy. Same concept go with the set and same concept go with, with the dictionary. Um, if, you, if you just make another variable S2 and equals to S, then if you change the contents of S2, S will change. If you don't want that, then copy it. Similarly, copy the dictionary. Because the contents of the tuple, they are not changeable, the copy function is not available for tuple. Because even if you assign this T to T2, um, you can now not change T2 because it is immutable. So having a copy function doesn't make sense in tuple. Great. One more thing uh, regarding slicing. Let's say you have, uh, let's say you have uh, L that's available to you like so, that's L. And let's say you make uh, L3, another list, by slicing, uh, let's say a list from, let's say one to um, five, let's say. So you start from index one, which is three, and you go to five by not including five. This way, the L3 is automatically a copy. It is not a sublist which is referencing. So L3, so L3 is a different, L3 is a completely new list, a new memory view. If you change the contents in L3, if you change the contents in L3, for example, L3 at index zero, it should go from three to, let's say, three. If you change the contents in L3, these contents, these change will not reflect in L. So if you do the slicing, um, slicing picks a copy by default. It does not pick a reference. And that's a huge difference between this list and a NumPy array. When you, and we will see that, when we will see a NumPy array, the slicing actually also again refers to the same memory location and that might be one difference in indexing. Indexing in the whole Python, whenever you do slicing, you get a copy. But in NumPy, when we will see NumPy in detail. In NumPy, when you do slicing, you get again a view, not a copy. And if you change in the sliced variant, um, anything, the actual, the actual uh, contents also change. And there is a reason to do that. And there, is a, there are efficiency reasons to do that and stuff like so. Again, the dot copy function becomes, the copy functions become much more applicable there as well. So, so, so you need to know that uh, even if you, do, uh, if you do slicing in general, in Python, in any collection, in any array, in any, um, if you do selection, uh, collection, for even for mutable objects like list, 
um, you get a copy. But uh, in NumPy array, the things, the things, these things, this particular thing, uh, with with a lot of other things, this but this indexing scheme actually changing changes with with this kind of slicing. Okay, so um, I end this video here. I mean, uh, you can explore much more functions of list, tuple, set, and dictionary, and what you can do with each of them, and what you, uh, I mean, in which scenario, what kind of thing is more. Uh, suitable for the other that completely depends upon the problem at hand but what we can do in the, what what we will be do what we'll be doing in the less next video we will be seeing some we will be seeing some functions of just list and then I will be just uh, just letting you to explore the the tuple set and dictionary and all their functions on your own and to see what function or what method is doing what for what which kind of data structure. So in the next uh, video, we will be seeing some methods just for list data structure. Hope to see you in the next video. Like in strings, um, let's let's explore a lot of functions in list, although in, 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 in sets and dictionaries and tuples, tuples as well, but many more functions are available in list. And by the way, uh, uh, let's see how, how many things are there in this list. And let's say L dot tab and tab will open up a lot of things with me for me. Append we know already, clear, copy, copy we know already, count we don't know, count, extend, index, insert, pop, remove, reverse. Some of these functions, uh, they make sense by the just their name, but let's see one by one. Let's see some of those, um, what they do. One way to do that is go to internet and see some book or tutorial or something like so. Another way is just write this, apply a, maybe a, maybe help function, maybe apply a help function. It may help you how to use that. Great, this help function is great. So append an object method of built-in list instance append object to end of the list. Oh, it appends an object to the end of the list which means um, we may be able to append um, another list to, to, to a list. Maybe, uh, have we thought about that? Um, the append method just takes one, um, uh, one, uh, one object. Maybe it, it, it takes a whole lot of list, uh, but then it may be possible that a list is appended inside another list and that whole list becomes uh, becomes one element because list can contain other lists as as elements. Well, that's a problem. Yeah. So let's see more functions. Uh, yeah. So let's see clear. Well, what this clear? Uh, what is this clear? What it does? Uh, uh, sometimes I use help. Sometimes I use that. Remove all items from the list. Oh my God! If you call the clear, the the list is empty. Okay, uh, if you if you if you just call clear function on a list, list will become empty. Be careful. Okay, great. What else? So let's see. I have this function maybe pop. What it does? Pop does what? So let's see. Uh, so pop um, removes and returns item add index default to the last, which means if you also oh, that's a default value remember the default value so if you call a pop function without an index it will return it will remove the index it will delete the last item and it will give you that it will return that uh, or if you give an index it will remove that value at that index and it will after removing it will return you that so you can use it wherever you want so um, there are many more functions. For example, you can see all of them one by one. Remove function, for example, reverse, reverse like, like, like the name suggests. If you call the reverse function, the list will be reversed. Yeah, and remember we have reversed the list in the following way as well. We have a way of reversing any array this way. So now if you see the list is again reversed. So I guess both of them are working like so. Same. Similarly, you can explore several functions from a set. You go and say add clear. Um, clear might be working as same as intersection, intersection and update, is disjoint, is a subset of the other. Um, yeah, add by default or update by default actually take a union. 
So I'm not seeing update function here. Where is update? Oh, union is there, update is there, which means uh, the list you are seeing is <laughs> here is not a complete list. You may be writing, what are the functions that start from you? So here are they and, and several others. Similarly, you can go to dictionary and call for several functions, clear, copy, from, keys, get, items. Uh, oh, that item might be, might be interesting. What is this item? Uh, what it does? Uh, Oh, it has an error. What? So how can I use this? How can I use this function? Let's see. Oh, this is just an object. It is not a function. Uh, I don't know. Let's see again. Or or it, it is not listed anywhere. Oh, it is items, not item. Okay, items. That's a function, maybe. So these are all the items. Uh, 23 with this. B with that, new key with that, and, and, and so on. Great, uh, so um, actually uh, the purpose here is not to tell you each and every function and what it does, it will take a whole lot of time. Uh, you can go and explore all these functions. The purpose here is to tell you what kind of data structure has what kind of properties and what are the similarities and differences in between. So if you remember this one slide, for list, tuple, set, and dictionary, and, and, and some text that is written out above, you'll be having very good knowledge of uh, where to pick what kind of data structure uh, in, in practice. So uh, in the next video, um, I'll be actually going to Jupyter Notebook as our, as our style, and I will be coding or solving some problem for you um, that will involve list, tuple, set, or dictionary, or one of them, or we will be choosing based on problem what kind of data structure is well and what. So we'll be doing that. Uh, but uh, before that, um, I, I just want to I just want to uh, I, I just want to mention that list, tuple, set, or dictionary they can contain any items inside any kind of type, which means a list can contain another list. A list can contain a set, a list can contain a dictionary, a, list, a dictionary can contain a list which itself contains a dictionary. I mean, this is all abstract. This is all abstract. One thing can contain the other. One thing can contain an instance of, I mean, a list can contain multiple lists uh, and those lists can contain t more lists and so on. Um, so. Um, before actually going to problem solving, let me give you a flavor of that, how abstract these things are. Let me give you a flavor of that in, um, in just, just in a couple of examples. So in the next video, uh, I'll be giving you a couple of examples based on the abstractness of these data structures. And uh, from the next to next video, we'll be, pro we will, we will be doing some problem solving based on that. So next two videos are completely on Jupyter Notebooks. So get ready. Hope to see you in the next video. Okay, uh, let's see the abstractness of uh, all these uh, data structures. Let's see just one example. Um, let's say we have uh, L, that's the list. We have already tuple, that's tuple. Let's say we have uh, set, that's set. Let's say, and we have dictionary, that's a dictionary. Okay, so let's say we have all these things, let's say available somewhere. So let's make another dictionary, for example, let's say D, uh, D, uh, let's say D2, and that dictionary has key value pairs, let's say the key is A, and the value is the whole list L, that's the value, it is possible. Let's say the key is B, and the value is uh, just a tuple, the whole tuple, that's the value. Let's say the key is C, and the value is uh, the set, and let's say the key is uh, D and the value is the dictionary, the whole dictionary D. It is possible, I mean, um, you, you can just do that. that. That is just one example. Oh, what's, oh, sorry. I should have, I should have incorporated this way. Okay, so this is possible. Now, for example, if I access, um, if I access the element um, with uh, let's say a I will I will get the whole list and not only that 
I can I can access the whole element and then after that for that element I can access for example the third element uh, the element at index 3 so this particular this particular first level will extract the list and that will in that is just the indexing or for that list see for example if I access uh, d2 uh, and inside d2 if I access the dictionary that is inside and let's say I save that dictionary in k then it, I can see the contents of k but I can uh, just for example this or I can just access all the elements of this uh, dictionary or k by just having for x in k uh, print for example uh, x and k of x uh, just do that I can I can just do that we, we have done that in loops as well so I, I want to tell you that the, these uh, uh, even if for example if you want to create a list L let's say L3 let's say you want to create a list that can contain the whole list that can contain what we get, oh, oh, I mean one element is the list another element is a tuple another element is the whole dictionary inside and then you have some other elements let's say these uh, game and that's perfectly fine I get I mean you can do that these data structures are much more abstract I mean now if you for example access element uh, at index 2 which is dictionary that is completely a dictionary if you if you check the type of that element uh, that that will be a dictionary object and you can extract that element and play the way you want to play and, and whatever um, one more thing we can for example lists we can uh, let's say we want to make a list list very quickly for example list of um, all the squares till till starting from zero list of all the squares till till 10 for example 0 square 1 square 2 square let's say we want a list of that so one way of doing that is a quick shortcut is to just use the loops so in loops for example we write okay uh, x square for x in range uh, 10 for example so it will start from 0 go till 9 including 9 and you will get x one by one and all this syntax is for making a list of x squares where x starts from 0 and go till uh, go till including 9 go to 9 one by one and that's how you can uh, make a list and I mean these kind of these are kind of shortcuts uh, again you can make a set for example um, let's say you want to make a set of all the squares for x in range let's say starting from starting from 2 ending at 20 and you want to take a step of let's say 3 so start from index 2 go till 20 do not include 20 but take the step of 3 and you can now have a set which is which is this I mean uh, there are there are a lot of ways of working these working with these uh, uh, one one can explore more and more about these things but what 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 the basic thing about these data structures are they are very very abstract they can uh, I mean a list can contain a dictionary and that dictionary can contain a tuple and that tuple have an element which is another list and so on um, it is it is that abstract it allows you to do each and everything in that way okay so I end this video here in the next video we will actually um, solve a problem using these uh, one of these data structures or we will try to choose one of those and that video um, may be lengthy may be small because we may have bugs inside and we will we will play around with these data structures in the next video so uh, do attend the next video because uh, it's really the practice and it, you will get your hands uh, you will get a very good grip on uh, the data structures um, in in the solving the next problem uh, that we are that we are launching for you. Okay, hope to see you in the next video. Okay, let's see a problem just to get comfortable with uh, these data structures. So uh, let's let's design some problem 
and solve that problem here using using these data structures. So the problem that I'm thinking is, let's say the following. Um, let's say, let's say you are a teacher. Should I type all these things? Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, let's say you are a teacher. You are a teacher, and you have different student records student records uh, containing containing ID of a student and um, the mark marks list in each subject where different students um, have taken different number of subjects and all these records all these records are in hard copy you want hard copy you want to uh, enter all the data in computer and want to compute the average marks of each student and display that's the problem so the problem let's say is uh, um, you have for example you have a hard copy you have a you have some papers upon which you have different students each student have a different ID uh, some students may have taken seven subjects some student may have taken three subjects some student may have taken eight subjects and so on different students may have taken different subjects records is there you want to first enter e for each student you want to first enter the records I mean the all the data that is in and then you want to compute from that data you want to compute the uh, average marks of each student for example if a student have taken five subjects then the marks for all the five subjects are available you just add all the marks and divide by five and that's let's say the average marks so first of all let's write uh, a way to uh, way to compute for example the uh, to just collect the data how to collect the data so let's write a function for that so let's say define a function let's say get data from user or teacher let's say um, and let's say that's a function and it returns data okay um, so what I do really is I say okay while true uh, I, I made a loop while true just take the data from the from the user and the data is in the form of uh, you first say okay ID um, student ID let's say that is enter or actually input enter student ID so he enters the the, the person enters the student ID um, yeah so on top you might have defined a dictionary maybe a dictionary D that is empty right now but you may you may uh, add and remove different values so what you do is uh, you add a student ID you get a student ID and in the string form and then you get the uh, you get for example the um, input as the marks list so marks list as input enter the marks by comma separated values so enter the marks using for example if you have five 
subjects just um, write the five subject marks by separating each with the comma okay then um, um, uh, this um, um, let's say uh, more students is equal to let's say input enter yes or no for adding more students so if for example you have more data to insert then press yes otherwise press no so um, that's for example our setup so we will keep on uh, getting more and more we will keep on getting more and more data from the user user will keep on entering the data but one thing that we must know is that if for example a student ID student ID is already in D if that is already in D then we should give a message print um, print that student ID is already inserted so that might be a message um, else else we want to do something else what we want to do is the following um, what we want to do else is uh, we will make a dictionary uh, we already have a dictionary with the student ID as our key that's our key and at that key what we do is we uh, we pick the marks list and just split it using comma because we are expecting and all the marks they will be saved as a list so that will return a list a list of string values these are not integer values these are string values but all these lists they are tagged by this id so that as a dictionary that will be uh, that will be getting populated on and on and on further if we check if um, for example more students dot lower for example uh, let's call the lower function because the user may enters it in a lower form or if that is equal to let's say no if that is equal to no if this is uh, the case or uh, if that is no enter um, for example no enter no enter no to quit quit insertion insertion enter no to quit insertion so let's say that's your message so wherever the user inserted if that's a no uh, then you return d and that's it otherwise you keep on moving so that's the whole code so you keep on asking the the you keep on asking more and more values if whenever the uh, teacher enters a no then you just return uh, otherwise you keep an, you make another iteration you make another iteration and keep on moving that's how you get the data so the data will be available to you once you are done with that then uh, after that we will see how to once we have this data collected from the user then we will see how to compute marks for each student individually average marks and so on so let's just check whether this function works or not so um, let's say we have uh, our dictionary let's say student uh, student data is equal to get data from user let's just call that function um, let's see what happens okay uh, enter student ID let's say ID is 12 okay enter marks by comma separated values let's say um, 12 one um, let's say uh, 24 um, comma 65 comma 87 let's say the first student just um, 
the first student just have these uh, three subjects then enter no to quit so I will enter something else and oh what's the problem there is a problem um, if more students dot lower is more student is not defined uh, more student that's I guess more students more student here oh the spelling mistakes that's a huge mistake so I just copy there these bugs are there that's part of life part of programming life actually so I guess now it will work so let's do the process again so 12 let's see and the marks are 56 comma 45 comma uh, let's say a bad subject with let's say 13 uh, into no to quit um, no I will enter something else and I will keep on moving the other student is uh, the student ID is 45 let's say um, and the marks that this student uh, has gained uh, actually let's say this student has uh, has registered has already registered seven subject or let's say five subjects and the marks are let's say 44 55 66 77 and uh, let's say a bad subject let's say four okay uh, then into no to quit no I want to insert one more so do anything else other than no uh, so student ID let's say now the student ID is 12 again let's say let's say I want to insert another ID again um, and uh, whatever the marks let's say 45 and 45 again let's say now um, enter no to quit uh, no something else um, but now uh, the the message is there the 12 is already inserted because the ID the, the the key value in dictionary cannot repeat and so is the student value so uh, it does not insert it the because this may be my mistake so it asks again so now let's say I enter uh, ID let's say 23 that's the ID or maybe a different ID uh, that's the ID and the marks are let's say uh, 45 comma 45 let's say and into no to quit so let's say I enter no and uh, that's it so now I have received the student data if I show you the student data that student data is student data that's a dictionary that's a dictionary with uh, with a uh, key 12 and that's a list but this list contains all the values that are string type you will see how to handle that that's a 45 as a key value that's ID and that's the marks list and that's the ID and that's marks list okay great now we have student data let's write another function that helps us uh, uh, working on the student data basically we want to find out the average marks of each student and then we want to print those so let's define another function get average marks of each student and that uh, function actually receives this dictionary let me call it as D um, any any variable that's a local variable okay so what we want to do with that is the following um, average marks for each student so we will define another dictionary let's say average marks dictionary let's say that is empty in the beginning maybe and then what we do for x in uh, d let's iterate over x and d what we really do is uh, um, we go to we, we find out the list of uh, located at l uh, located at x so l is basically d sub x so let's say that's our uh, list that's our list that is located there so then what we do for i um, in l so for all i that is in l or let me call it for marks marks in l in this particular list what you do is um, you actually have this uh, sum Oh, sum is equal to zero right now there is no mark so what you do is s plus equals to uh, marks 
but convert the marks to integer because they are already in string format. Uh, we have we have saved everything in string, string format. So you populate all the list. Once you are done with this loop, the S will contain the sum of all the marks. Then what you do is uh, you compute the average and just save that average in AVG marks dict dictionary, let's say, or average marks. Just, just don't use the word dict, for example. You can, but uh, let's stay casual and at x you just write the average marks and the average marks can can be computed by s divided by length of the list whatever the list is so that's what the list is um yeah so that's the average marks um and once you have and and one by one all the average marks will be populated and once we receive all these we will then uh, we can then uh, we can then just display by populating the average marks. So let's see, let's call that function. So um, let's call that function. So avg marks, for example, equals to get avg marks, and let's put the student data inside. And if there is no error, then it will return everything then just print the average marks for each student for x in avgm uh, print let's say um, student and then print x got average marks as then you just print ok uh, avgm of x um, X and that will display everything. Oh, if there is an error, none type object is not iterable. None type object, why none type object? Um, we have done some mistake, yes. Maybe, uh, let's see. Let's see, for example, when we have run this. So let's run this and create a cell. Let's run using Alt Enter. It will create a cell average m what is that thing oh that is nothing why oh we haven't returned anything that's a bad programming really bad programming we have not returned actually the the value that we need so the default value is none great actually not so great okay great yes this and now we have something in average marks yes this is um, and now we can just populate that and we have the student 12 got average marks 38 student 45 got average marks 90 49.2 and student uh, 23 got average marks as 45.0 okay great so that was just a review of a split function of string uh, type conversion through int and functions in general input function and uh, and dictionary and list and all that stuff so although it was just a tiny problem but uh, it it gives a good flavor of uh, the data structures and strings and all that stuff okay um, that's about uh, the data structures from the next video we are actually diving into the data science packages and we will start from numpy and uh, we will spend some time on numpy and uh, then we will be moving towards pandas which is very very powerful built on top of numpy and after that we'll be moving towards uh, matplotlib and we will also try to give you uh, some snapshots of uh, uh, scikit-learn as well so uh, hope to see you in the next video Okay, uh, the next few videos will uh, I will discuss NumPy, which is the which is the very very popular package for numerical Python. Um, actually, NumPy is like List, but uh, it is much much faster than List. Um, one one restriction: if we restrict the List, uh, remember a List actually is a collection of a lot of data objects. 
that was so abstract as we saw in uh, previous videos. If for example we restrict a list that all the objects they must have same type all the elements in the list for example they have same type then uh, that list with all the same type there is uh, what the numpy looks like but numpy is way 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 more faster and the reason is even if you define a list with all the elements that are let's say of same type uh, yeah but because list in abstract way uh, can handle heterogeneous kind of objects the functions that we will apply on these uh, items they will no longer be faster further to store each element we have to store the information or metadata for that element in numpy it is both i mean uh, it is efficient with respect to memory because if the type is same we need not to save information about each element because we, we need just to save the information about the type because the type is same for all elements further when the type is same we can write functions that are much more faster than 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 list so numpy is very very popular it has very very fast um, uh, universal functions available the methods that are available in numpy and it's a package i mean it's a, it's a whole directory structure containing a lot of packages inside a lot of modules and so much uh, at the end of the day it's uh, it's it's uh, simply or in layman terms it is like a list with all the same type objects and it is much more useful when all these objects are numeric type although you can have a, a numpy array with uh, with string data types i mean all the strings or all uh, general objects as well but the the most the, the power mil, the power of numpy array will be will become much more evident when we will be working on numeric type data so in this particular um, uh, in, in this particular uh, course we will focus more on numeric data uh, than other kind of data so um, uh, that's how you you write import uh, numpy is installed or if you if you have installed python using anaconda numpy is already installed there uh, it is in the site packages kind of a built-in package so import numpy we can stay as it is but we can rename this numpy just np that's most popular name we can write any other name but if you see the books or internet or somewhere this np somehow becomes much more popular okay now we can define an array for example np dot array that's array is just a method of np kind of function and we can define uh, an array using list this is the list of uh, several numbers or we can define array as as a tuple as well so whether we give a tuple whether we give a list an array is defined and then we can see the contents of this array uh, this np array so uh, let, let's just go to our friend Jupyter notebook and get our hand uh, well gripped on on this numpy so first of all we need to import numpy package and we may rename as for future use as uh, np so let's say that is imported so now let's say a is an array let's say np dot array and that's a function and we may have a list inside let's say one two three five seven let's say that's a that's array we can also define the array using a tuple rather than a list it's our choice uh, which way we define the array either way um, two three five let's say that's a that's another array for example so if we print for example a it will give us uh, uh, a but uh, if we just see the type of a it will no longer be a list it will be an nd array numpy dot nd array that's a n dimensional array okay great so um, there are so many attributes of this a and this b uh, uh, same similarly if we see the type of b although we have defined this b using a tuple but the type is the same the, it's a numpy object rather than a list or a tuple um, so that's how you can create the uh, the array um, one, 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 one more thing that is that is important is to to check the attributes of a for example a dot d type that will tell us the data type uh, in a so for example a stores all the data that is integer 32 
at define time for example we can we can specify the data type if we want we can specify d type if we want for example integer uh, that means a is integer here we can here we can define for example d type as uh, float for example so data type becomes float there are several other um, other options that are available to define the data type uh, but um, even if we don't define uh, the data type can be defined automatically based on contents um, that's what the dynamic typing means so if we now define type that's this if we if we now check the type of a that is an, again in integer 32 but if we check the type of uh, b d type that a, that might be a float number yes that's float 32 again there are 64 bit support as well i mean we can define here there are several options here available so that's the that's how we can define the numpy array that's just a getting started with numpy array in the next video we will play with these arrays a bit more so hope to see you uh, in the next video okay uh, in the last video i introduced numpy uh, and uh, we actually declared a numpy array using a list as well as a tuple um, in this particular video we will be seeing some of the properties of uh, the numpy array variable or sometimes called the object that variable so there are um, several properties but i will discuss for example last time i discussed one property which is d type a dot d type and that store actually the in, that actually stores the information of the data type uh, of the elements of the array of np array remember np array all the elements of np array they must have same data type uh, it cannot store heterogeneous arrays as it is okay now uh, there is another uh, property sometimes called the dimensions or ndim um, that tells uh, actually what are the dimensions of 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 the array uh, i need to explain this uh, term dimensions um, with with the following example let's say for example that's uh, that's that's an array J just consider that's a list for example one two three that's one list um, and if it is if it is an array for example if np dot if this is np dot array uh, with that list we will say that array as a one dimensional array because we only need one index to access that for example if you need to access any element in this array you only need one index either zero one or two only one index that's okay so uh, in this case we have just one dimensional array on the other hand for example if you see here that's one array or one list that's another array another list um, and that's another list that contains lists inside for example um, let's say um, that's array one and that's array two and that is simply an array of two different arrays that's a, that's an array and that's an array uh, for example a1 is this array and a2 is this array now if we need to access any element in this particular array we need two indices first of all we have to locate whether we are going to talk about a1 or a2 we need one index for that for example if we want to locate a1 that means we are going to access with element 0 let's say this uh, this whole array is a so first of all we say okay 0 means uh, we are going to access uh, from from a1 and a2 one of those so 0 means the first one okay now a1 now inside a1 which element this is the zeroth element this is the first element this is the second element let's say we want to access the first element so that means we are going to talk about we are talking about uh, this so very loosely speaking the total number of indices that are required to access an element inside the array is called dimension of the array uh, and ndim that actually uh, that actually defines um that that actually describes the this property the total number of dimensions consider for example this is a 2d array or two dimensional array let's say that's a two dimensional array a1 and let that's another two dimensional array a2 that's another two dimensional array a3 for example and let's say this is an array of two dimensional arrays uh, let's say np dot array now that's th that whole array whatever that array is a three dimensional array and the reason is to access any element we need three indices 
uh, first index will define which one of these we are selecting. For example, let's say we are selecting that. So one index is needed. That index is one, for example. Uh, then inside this structure, like so, we need two more indices to locate a particular, uh, particular index. For example, uh, because it, A2 is a two-dimensional array, it has two one-dimensional arrays. So which one-dimensional array you are uh, it has more, it has many one dimensional arrays. So which one dimensional array you want to pick? Let's say the sixth one with index, with index five. Now you have located the fifth, a sixth array. Now in that array, what element? Let's say the eighth element. So we need three indices to access a particular element. So the dimensions of this array is three. So um, let, let's play with that in Jupyter Notebook just to get um, more comfortable with with the term dimensions so let's say for example we have an array a let's say a is uh, np dot array and let's say it contains um, a, a list let's say one two three um, and then we have another array one dimensional array, array let's say four five um, and six that's another array and that is an array of these two arrays so that is basically a two-dimensional array uh, it is array of arrays list of lists equivalently so that's a for example oh what's the problem oh we haven't imported numpy we should have so uh, um, import import numpy as np um, Okay, we need not to import that every time. Actually, uh, I'm recording this video after a few after a few hours, and I'm re I have restarted all these things, so I have to import now for the first time. But once imported in the notebook, um, as long as the notebook is running, you, you need not re-import anything. Okay, so a dot for example n dim, a dot n dim. So that is two here because there are two dimensions. Uh, for example, if I want to access uh, element number three this element so this element is located in the first array of the two arrays which has so the first array there are two arrays with index zero or one so I am going to look into the first array which is one two three and in that array I'm going to look for the element number two element with index two so that's how you can access the elements of uh, multi-dimensional arrays or arrays with more um, more kind of dimensions. Let's say we have another array just to just to get more familiar with np array let's say and we have a list and that list actually contains um, that list actually contains three one-dimensional arrays not only that actually it, oh I'm, I'm confusing you a lot let me let me just let's say we have one, two, three. Let's say we have three one-dimensional arrays. Let's say uh, we have another uh, two, four, five, nine. The the sizes of arrays maybe maybe uh, uh, maybe uh, I mean uh, maybe different. Yeah, is that true? Maybe different. Yes or no? Let's see. For example, the first array has size uh, three, and the second array has total size. Is that okay? I guess uh, yes. And now, if you want to access, for example, um, an element of uh, an element with, uh, let's say, I want to access this element five. So that is in the second array, indexed with one, and then in that array, it has index two. So I've accessed this element. Oh, why not? Too many indices for an array. Why? Um, why is that? Why too many indices uh, for for an array uh, B? So let's say B dot n dims, and then that is one. Why one dimensional? I have two. Uh, I have this one dimensional array, and this is another one dimensional array, and I have made a list out of it. I mean, this is one D array and another one D array. I've concatenated them together. So I should have accessed this element. 
The problem is when you are going to uh, define multi-dimensional arrays, the, the number of elements for each dimension, they should stay consistent. For example, if the first array has three elements, the second array must have three elements. Or if the second array has four elements, then the first must have four elements. If that is not the case, uh, the array will not be defined like a multi-dimensional array. For example, if we, for example, extend our first array with, let's say, minus one, now B will be having two dimensions, no problem. And now we will be able to access, uh, for example, this element five, uh, like so. So we will go to B again. We will say, okay, select array number two. And in that array, uh, select uh, index, select the value indexed by two, which is uh, five. So accessed, no problem. And that stays true if, you, if you're going to define, for example, a three-dimensional array. Let me just give you an example of three-dimensional array. Let's say C equals NP dot array. And let's say we have one, two, and three. And then we have another array, for example, um, four, five, six. Remember, all, so let's say that's, uh, that's uh, we can have one more, for example. We can have one more list. Why not? So let's say we have a zero, zero, minus one, let's say. And that is, that is, that is a two-dimensional array. Yeah, that's a two-dimensional array. Great. Let's say we have another two-dimensional array. Let's say we have another two-dimensional array with same kind of uh, consistency, the number of elements and stuff. Uh, let's say these elements are all minus of the, the other ones. Let's say this minus, 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 and this is plus one. And now we have this, if, if you see this thing, that's a 2D array, that's a two-dimensional array, that is also a two-dimensional array. An array of two-dimensional arrays is basically a three-dimensional array. Now that's a three-dimensional array, this one, C. So if you, uh, oh, we have some, Oh, uh, I, I should have defined this with commas rather than rather than spaces. Actually, yeah. The reason I did that is uh, MATLAB. I, I worked in MATLAB also. Um, so MATLAB allows this uh, space separated list, but I just confused the, the things with, with Python as well. But Python requires comma there. Okay. Uh, with, with MATLAB, by the way, just, just as a side note, MATLAB allows you to have commas as well as spaces, but this uh, Python is just restricts everything to comma. That's great. Uh, okay, that is C. So now if you check C dot and then, that is uh, three. If you, for example, want to access this particular element, what should you do? First of all, you select the, the one of the 2D arrays. There are two 2D arrays. So this is the first 2D array, and that's the second 2D array. And if you, for example, want to access this particular element, this particular element, which is minus three, if you want to access that, you first have to access one of the two two-dimensional two arrays. So let's say I access the second one with the index one. Now you are in this particular 2D array. In that array, which list, which 1D array you are talking about? So I'm talking about the very first 1D array. So the very first 1D array is indexed by zero. And in that 1D array, which element you are talking about? So I'm talking about this element that has index two in this particular array. So now if you press enter, you will get minus three. Wow. So that is basically uh, how, and, and by the way, you can make a four dimensional array. A four dimensional array will be an array of three dimensional arrays and so on. You can make, uh, you can make for example, n dimensional arrays and that's one reason why we call this as nd array uh, n dimensional array now, the the type of c is nd array n dimensional array uh, you can add as many dimensions as you want great uh, we will continue exploring this numpy more and more uh, in in the upcoming videos in particular i will talk about this shape uh, property of this uh, uh, NumPy. We have already discussed D type. We have discussed NDIM. Uh, in the next video, we will talk about shape, and we will discuss more about uh, about the num 
uh, NumPy. So hope to see you in the next video. Okay, in the last video we discussed this uh, number of dimensions or NDIM property of any, any NumPy array. And we also saw an example of defining a three-dimensional array in Jupyter Notebook. Um, let, let's discuss another uh, property which is, which is the shape property. Let's see uh, what, what this shape actually represents. So let's go to Jupyter Notebook and see what actually this shape represents. For example, you have seen this C as, uh, in, in the last video, we defined this C as a three-dimensional array that contains two arrays of 2D and each 2D array contains three 1D arrays and each 1D array contains three elements. So what do we mean by shape? So if we just say shape, what is that thing? So shape is two, three, three, and let me tell you what that means. Uh, the, the return is tuple, so that's a tuple that is returned, two, three, and three. This two means how many two-dimensional arrays are there? Here we have two. So in each two-dimensional array, how many 1D arrays are there? Well, three. In each 1D array, how many um, elements are there? Well, three. So basically this c dot shape zero tells you the total number of two-dimensional arrays, that is two. And this shape, for example, one tells you in each 2D array, how many 1D arrays are there? These many. And this shape, for example, two tells you in each 1D array, how many elements are there? Well, three, great. That's awesome, uh, yeah. Uh, can, can I tell you one, one, one strange kind of thing? You can you can define a NumPy array, for example, a as np dot array with just one element. Let's say two. That's an array. Great. What's the number of dimensions here? What do you think? What is that? Uh, is that a one D array? Uh, uh, what are the number of dimensions? Strange. It's a one D array. Yeah, it is. Um, see another thing, uh, for example, b is equal to np dot array, and you define it with let's say three. And what are the dimensions of b? It looks like the same. The dimension of b should be one, as as there the dimension of a is one. It looks like the dimension of b is also one. Um, no, it's zero because that's an array. If you pass it as, as a list, it's an array of 1D. If you just define just one number that can be defined as an array, NumPy allows you that, but that one number is just a 0D array. Now, if you concatenate a lot of 0Ds, you get 1D. If you concatenate a lot of 1Ds, you get a 2D. If you concatenate a lot of 2Ds, you get a 3D and so on. Get a look and feel? Yeah, so that's what it is. So, um, yes, in this video, uh, I discussed the shape. Uh, th there is another, there, is, there are so many properties. Let me, let me discuss some properties. Let's say size. That actually tells the total number of elements, complete total number of elements in the array. So how many elements are there? That is size. Um, there is also, I guess, n bytes property. That tells the how many, total number of bytes that, that this structure is taking inside the memory. And there are several other, I mean, properties. If you just apply a tab and get certain things, you will see a lot of functions and you can you can check a lot of properties that some of these functions uh, we will explore later on. Sometimes they are called the universal functions. We will see them because they are very, very fast. And th these functions, the vectorized implementations of these functions, that is the reason why NumPy is so, so fast and why it is so popular. Anyways, so in the next video, we will go to um, explore the NumPy a bit more um, and we'll show you uh, more fun stuff with, with NumPy. So hope to see you in the next video. NumPy actually provides a lot of functions to create arrays, special kind of arrays just for testing and sometimes just for, um, um, I mean, there are a lot of ways to create arrays um, uh, from scratch. For example, if, what if you want to uh, create an array containing all zeros? So there is a function in NumPy, np.zeros, 
that tells you how to do that. Similarly, if you want to generate a lot of um, generate an array containing a lot of ones or all ones, there is a function to do that and, and stuff like so. Um, there are some functions that are actually used a lot and I want to discuss those. Uh, one function is np.arrange. Actually, this is a single R. This is not a two R's. This is a single R. np.arrange with one R. Um, and np.arrange function, what it does is uh, it creates an array. For example, if you say np.arrange, it creates an array. For example, if you say, okay, 100. So it creates an array that it, it creates a 1D array that starts from uh, the, the values in that array starts from 0, 1, 2, all up to 99. So that's an array. That, that's a quick way to create an array with all the numbers uh, till 100. Um, yeah. So let, let's see, uh, let's see a running example of this uh, MP arrange method in Jupyter Notebook just to get a better look and feel of how it works. So let's see. So let's say we have a equals np dot arrange, um, and let's say hundred. So that's it. If you want to see what is inside a, you can see this is an array with all the values starting from zero up till ninety nine. Um, maybe you want to to create an array um, that starts from a particular number, ends at a particular number. Um, maybe those two numbers are different and uh, maybe this arrange function actually allows that. And let's say I want to start with 20 and I want to end at 100 and I want to cre create all the array that does that. So let's say this. So that's okay. Start from 20 and at 100 but the last element, last index is not included. That's possible. Uh, last but not the least, if you want for example to start from 20 and at 100 and uh, let's say you want to take a jump of 3 that's possible remember uh, does this does this resemble with something that you know already remember that yeah let me pause for a minute well, not for a minute just for some seconds let me pause uh, do you remember this arrange np.arrange function it looks like something like what Remember that for i in range, yes, for i in range, for example, start from 20, go to 100, take a jump of 3. Remember that? So it has some resemblance uh, with range function, yeah, uh, although range is an iterator. Uh, what's an iterator? Why well, I'm telling you that? Okay, let me tell you an iterator as well here, just, 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 just spend a uh, few seconds on on this range function um, you may, you might be thinking when we call this range let's say starting from uh, let's say range 10 you might be thinking that it returns a list of numbers starting from 0 to 9 but that doesn't happen it returns nothing actually when you actually call it when you actually call it, it it returns just an object when you call it in a for loop or somewhere it progressively returns one by one element one by one so it returns an element then it iterates and return another element that it never creates a list of elements uh, it never creates a list for you that's awesome actually uh, it, it, it generates numbers it generates the next number and the next number as you move on so it saves a lot of memory and these kind of uh, objects they are called iterators that iterate um, they, they never create but if you want for example to to get a list if you really want to get a list then what you can do is you can call the range let's say the same way and you can just write a list so provide me a list don't just provide me uh, an iterator and that will give you a list how cool is that great anyways uh, that was just a side note uh, it has nothing to do with this arrange function anyways so np.arrange it actually returns an array it is not it is not like an iterator it returns an array complete array the way you want um, so that's what this arrange is. It has resemblance with this built-in range function that mostly used in, in for loops. Okay, next let's discuss this np.random.permutation. np.random is a package. np is a package. It has a lot of sub packages inside. Random is a package. Random has a lot of modules. One module is permutation. There are a lot of other modules. So let's see this uh, random. 
let's see what it does. So for example, let's say a equals np dot random dot uh, permutation, let's say permutation. And what I do is I say, okay, np dot uh, arrange, let's say uh, 10. What it does is uh, this np dot arrange will return an array containing all the values 0 to 9. These are 10 values. And then this permutation function that resides in the package np dot random that is in the random package of np, it actually shuffles all the values and rearrange all the values in random fashion. And a will now be an array containing the same elements but in a different order, in a different random order. So let me now print this A. It will be having all the elements from 0 to 9, but in a really shuffled way. And that shuffling is completely random. Yeah. You see that? Um, sometimes you, you, may, you may call some function. You may want to write some function on arrays. And you may want arrays uh, that, are, that, that do not have a particular ordering that are just random arrays. Just to test your code, just to test how it works on any kind of array. In that case, one way of uh, getting a shuffled kind of array, one quick way is to just use np.random.permutation function. Um, the np.random package does not only have this permutation, there are a lot of other functions, np.random, for example, np.random, random.rand int, for example, rand int, that creates a random integer. That's, uh, for example, if I, th that, that's, uh, that, let me call this, and we have, uh, how can it be used? Okay, you, we can give a low value from where we start, we can give a high value, we, I mean, and, and it creates uh, actually uh, random integer starting from low, ending at high. Um, so that's how it can be used. For example, let me call it as np.random.randint create a random number between uh, 20 and 30. Create some random integer and it will return some random integer between 20 and 30. If you call it again, it may return some other, uh, oh, it is, it is returning uh, 30 again, uh, 29 again and again. Now it returns 29, 22. Maybe we want to, uh, maybe we want to generate random integer between 20 and 30. Uh, so it creates a random integer. One thing that you might be noticing, what is the what is the return value? The return value is v, for example. What should be the type of v? What do you think? Is this v is an array? No, it is a number. It's an integer. The type of v should be an integer because it is returning a random integer. It is returning an integer, but it is selecting that integer randomly from 20 to 300. So it should be integer. And it is. Yes. Wow. Um, yeah, so we will be exploring some more functions in the random package of NP uh, and then we will be moving towards this fascinating functions call, function called reshape. Uh, so there is more to come for NumPy, so hope to see you in the next video. Okay, in the last video we saw uh, a range function that's uh, a very useful function to just create a test, testing array and just see uh, uh, see uh, output of a particular operation or algorithm just on different kind of arrays. Further we saw uh, permutation functions, uh, permutation function in np.random package and uh, uh, we saw that uh, this, this permutation function actually it, it reshuffles, it shuffles different kind of, uh, or if, if array is applied to this permutation function it actually shuffles all the all the elements of that array in, in a random way, in a completely random way. Uh, today we will explore this random package a bit more and then we will see a reshape function, what that reshape does. Uh, basically this reshape, uh, um, for example, if we have an array, let's say, array uh, is, let's say, we have an array with, let's say, uh, 10 elements. And if we call a dot reshape, and we give let's say two by five. So it will make a two dimensional array out of A, uh, which is B, and that will be a two by five uh, matrix or that will be an array or, or a matrix with two rows and five columns. 
um, and and now we can we can just work with this B just like it's a two-dimensional array and we can just um, uh, we can just treat this P as a two-dimensional array and work with that. It is it becomes handy sometimes if, for example, we want to uh, we want to test certain operations on on matrices. A quick way to make a matrix is just to call it a range function and then whatever the result is, just reshape it into the desired order matrix and test the algorithm. So let's go to the uh, uh, let's go to Jupyter Notebook and check this uh, random package a bit more and then see the reshape function. So Let's go to Jupyter Notebook, yes. So there are a lot of uh, ways to generate these random numbers. One, for example, we already have seen rand int. Another way, for example, array and array A can be generated like np.random.rand function. So now <clears throat> if we create this, uh, if we create, let's if we pass, let's say, a thousand, uh, a random value array will be generated in A, and a, each value of A will be a random number between uh, between zero and one. So all these numbers are just random between zero and one. Each number is uh, zero and one random number, and and this distribution basically is the distribution of this random number is all the distribution is uniform. If for example we want to plot uh, the histogram, uh, the histogram or the, the distribution of A, it will look like uniform. Uh, let, let me just give you, uh, give you one or two plots uh, using matplotlib package, although we will see matplotlib package uh, later on, but let's uh, assume that uh, this is just a plotting package. This is just a package that uh, helps us plotting. Just import that, import matplotlib.pyplot as plt. Uh, import that and after importing that uh, you just uh, plot a histogram plt dot hist for example and pass a and you can see the histogram is roughly uniform um, I mean um, everything is equally likely we can make more bins for example we can have uh, bins equals let's say 100 and we can see um, um, almost all the bins they are uh, I mean just look like uniform if we make more and more data set then they will all look uniform um, <clears throat> one more thing we can we can have for example this uh, uh, n let's say b equals np dot random dot rand n and that generates normal random numbers or Gaussian random numbers let's say which which the distribution of the numbers are is the bell-shaped curve, for example. So let's just plt dot hist um, b and bins, let's say equals to 200, and we can see a bell-shaped curve because the distribution of this data is is Gaussian distribution. It looks like so. So um, this this random package is uh, this np dot random is really important package. It has uh, different it can create different kind of random numbers from following from different distributions. And doing in, in machine learning or in statistics, sometimes we need to generate these kind of random numbers uh, for sometimes for testing purposes, sometimes for adding noise of a particular type to test our model and stuff like so. So it is good to have a good grip on np.random package. Okay, um, next we see reshape function. Uh, one more thing, for example, if you want to create, for example, a two-dimensional array of just random numbers, let's say you can call np, np.random.rand, and you can just call, you can just pass two arguments, for example, two by three, and this C will be a two by three matrix. Uh, if you see the C, it will be a two by three matrix of all random values. If you see C dot N dim, it will be having uh, the dimensions are two and it's a two dimensional array. Uh, further, we can create, for example, a four dimensional array. C equals NP dot random dot rand, uh, maybe two by three by four by two. And that's a four dimensional array um, with this particular order. So if you see this C dot N dim, that will be um, that will be this, um, yeah. So let me let me just uh, give you an interpretation of what that thing is. There are two arrays that are three dimensional, 
and there are two of those okay now each three-dimensional ha array has three two-dimensional arrays wow so each uh, two-dimensional array has four one-dimensional arrays and each one-dimensional array has two elements in it so that's what the structure is um, yeah get a good look and feel uh, so let's see the reshape function for example let's say we have uh, d equals np dot arrange uh, let's say we have a hundred values and then we say reshape these hundred values to let's say um, um, let's say 4 by 25 so this D will be a 4 by 25 matrix so if we just uh, get the shape of D so that will be a 4 by 25 matrix or a two-dimensional array uh, with four rows and 25 columns um, yeah so sometimes we want to work on matrices and we just we can just uh, plug in these arrange function to generate some, a bunch of numbers and then we can reshape those and build a matrix quickly and then just test the performance of our algorithm or, or stuff like so uh, <clears throat> uh, so not only the reshape not only returns the uh, uh, the, I mean you can you can reshape a matrix and you can reshape an array into more than two dimensional array if you want to for example arrange 100 let's say dot reshape maybe oh, as 4 by 5 by 5 it's a three dimensional array now this uh, D will be a three dimensional array containing different values uh, yeah so now you can access it and, and and do whatever you want to do so not only the reshape arrange and permit uh, random there, there are other functions as well np dot zeros for example if you press z and you just see the zeros and then you just press a question mark you will know what that function is how can we use it and so on similarly you can have several other function there is an important function once for example you can call that function and that will generate an array of all ones uh, you can see how to call that function here uh, there is np.empty there is np.empty like there are so many functions just to create some matrices very quickly uh, and you want to test your code or algorithms uh, based on those so um, yeah so there are a lot of functions that we want to that, that we can work on so um, next so so there are a lot of functions uh, that can quickly create a np array and an n-dimensional array um, we can quickly create an array test our algorithm or use that array wherever we want to like uh, wherever we want to uh, use and we can move on um, just a few functions like arrange ones zeros they are there uh, or, or random dot rand random dot rand uh, n and other functions they are available um, from, uh, in the next video we will be seeing uh, we will be seeing uh, the indexing or slicing inside numpy array and we will also be seeing the difference of that indexing with or slicing from the ordinary list or 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 the ordinary data structures uh, what is the difference in uh, what is the difference of slicing in numpy with the for example with the list we will see that in the in the next video hope to see you in the next video okay um, here is my favorite topic in numpy slicing actually um, indexing or slicing in numpy is uh, the, the way you access sub arrays is just the same as the way you access substrings or sub lists and you already have seen uh, how can we uh, how can we use this slicing or indexing uh, in, in lists and in strings the difference here in numpy is in in list for example if you slice you get for example let's say b equals a uh, 1 colon 5 if you slice that thing uh, from numpy then b is not a copy it is actually uh, accessing the same memory view as in a now if you change any element in b the corresponding element in A will change as long as A is a NumPy array. However, if A is a list or any other data structure, ordinary data structure, then uh, the, the slicing, this, this kind of slice, 
gives a copy rather than a view. So that's an important difference we need to know that rest of the indexing technique is almost the same. Um, you do this kind of indexing, that is how you can reverse. Uh, this is start, end step, all, all the things are same except uh, how can play how can we play with the two dimensional arrays uh, let's see, let, let, let's see that let, let's see some examples of indexing one by one in uh, in jupyter notebook and see how the slicing actually creates a, a view rather than a copy so let's go to our jupyter notebook and see how can we play with different indices let's say a is np dot range np dot arrange let's say a hundred and let's shuffle them uh, let's stay as it is let's say that's a now a let's say um, let's print some certain things let's say b equals uh, a uh, pick all the elements starting from index 3 ending at index 9 uh, so 10 is not included that's b let's print b let's see what's b so b is this array okay now what i'm going to do is i'm ch changing the co uh, contents of b uh, this numpy array is mutable you can change the elements inside no problem so i'm going to change the uh, elements uh, let's say one element in b let's say i'm going to change uh, element number zero in b which is three and i'm just placing that element as minus hundred minus twelve hundred that's it that's the case okay now the contents of p has been changed yeah but now let's see the contents of a the contents of a also has changed that's a big uh, difference between uh, slicing an ordinary list or an ordinary data structure or slicing a list when you slice a list you get us you get another label but that label or that variable is accessing the same memory. The memory actually is not copied. Um, there is one memory view and these two different names, whether you access those elements using B or you access those elements using A, the same memory is being accessed. If you change the memory uh, using B or A, you will see the effect in both of the variables. So that's one difference. Now, uh, after having knowledge of this difference, if we really want uh, this behavior to not happen, one thing that we can call is we can say, okay, A, for example, A, uh, let's say three to 10, and then we can call our famous function, remember that, copy. You can copy that, and now B is completely a different array. It's, has, it, it's a different memory view. If you change B now, the, the effect will not be seen in A. So copy function is there whenever you need copy. One thing, if you are not going to change elements, the NumPy supplies you very fast implementation of slicing by not changing the memory view. If, if you are aware your algorithm is not going to change the elements, slicing will give you much, much efficient access to the elements or the, uh, or the sub blocks or sub arrays without actually making the copies inside the memory, which can take time and space both. So this is one plus of NumPy um, uh, over, over, the, over the other data structure that we have seen so far in Python. Okay, let's play with indices. Let's say, what do you think? What is that thing? Uh, colon, colon, two, what? Or colon, colon, let's say five. What it will do? It will start from the very first index, which is uh, zero. It will go to the last index, but it will pick every fifth element. So let's see. So it picks zero, then five, then 10, then 15, because the jump is five, great. What do you think, what this will do? Uh, let, me just, let me just teach you by example, what this will do. Yeah, what it will do. Uh, remember, if you apply a minus here, the end and uh, the start and end, they just get swapped, and this becomes a step from, from the end. So what will happen is the same kind of impact. You start from the very end, then you take the step of minus one from the end and you just um, paste every element. So this is kind of reversing the array with, with kind of steps starting at the end, great. So uh, another way of reversing the array is if you want to reverse the array as a whole, just apply minus one, which means start from the end and pick every element from the end till the beginning and the, in, and the array will be reversed. 
uh, this element is there remember that this is there let's change that element uh, let's change that element so um, so a uh, at position so I want to find out the index where this minus uh, 1200 is located so idx is equal to a dot uh, index uh, I guess there is a function index yes yes and no index oh there is no index there um, is there an np dot index np dot index I want to find out the index where um, um, so index there is no index function indices or something I want an index function is there any index function I want to find out the index where minus 200 is located there are several ways but I want to find one so for example um, for example um, let me see whether there is an index function or not available in NumPy or not um, no it is no longer there but there is indices function I guess so indices what that does I guess that does the same job um, let me see np dot indices returns an array representing the indices of a grid okay so I, I have to give a grid and then it returns for example the indices of all that grid how can I use that well it, it becomes it becomes difficult there may be a find function or how can I locate the index where the minus 200 is uh, is located how can I how can I do that hmm um, yeah very difficult seems like very difficult oh why don't I rather than finding out a function why don't I just play with uh, play with the uh, numpy why not so let's say a equal equals minus 1200 that gives me a boolean array uh, comparing each and every element with minus 1200 so the array the returning array let me call the index array or the boolean array let's say b that array is true or false array or zero or one array uh, wherever there is minus 1200 that index is one that value is one otherwise it is zero completely zero and then what I do is I just um, multiply that with the uh, with the np dot arrange np dot arrange uh, with with saying that a dot um, a dot a dot size so whatever the size of a is so because these are the indices okay then what that's the pointwise multiplication great so uh, when I will multiply them together what I will get is uh, is uh, what I will get uh, after multiplication I will get um, how can I how can I find out I actually actually I'm lost here literally how can I find out um, how can I find out um, the the index where uh, where uh, am I am, so, so that will give me what let's see uh, what is B now the B is uh, B is just an array B is just an array and there is this three uh, that is located so how can I find out where is this three uh, how can I f again the, the problem is finding out the index okay that's that's really a bad thing can I call this a dot indices and just give a minus 1200 and everything just worked out no there is an error there is an error oh I'm lost here literally I'm lost here uh, I need to know how to find out the index where this particular element minus 1200 lies so that's a question for you as well I'm also lost so let's see you in the next video and we first will solve this problem to finding out the index of a particular element or maybe a lot of elements um, and then uh, we will continue from there onwards to see more indexing okay uh, great so 
Hope to see you in the next video by first solving the problem how to find out the index of a particular element in a NumPy array or maybe more than one elements in a NumPy array and then we will be practicing more about these uh, slicing examples. Okay, hope to see you in the next video. Okay, let's say uh, this element is uh, there and uh, let's say we want to we want to locate that element in the array. Uh, we want to just know where this element is in the array. So array A has this element. Uh, let's let me print array A as it is. Uh, this array A has this particular element, and we want to know where uh, what is the index uh, of this element inside the array. There are several ways of doing this. One way is to find out that index is simply you call the function argvar, argvar, for example, argvar a is equal to minus 1200. And that will return a 2D array. And uh, if you just want any one index, then you return that kind of thing. So if you write this thing, you will get the index uh, exactly of uh, the element that is there. So the index is three. If you want to change that value, for example, the value should be three here. If you want to change that value, what you can do is you can write, okay, A IDX, is equal to uh, 3 and A is reversed to its position uh, wherever it was created. Okay, great. Now uh, let's play with uh, two dimensional indices. Let's say two dimensional arrays. Let's say we have uh, A equals um, np dot random dot uh, rand. Let's say. Um, let's say we have. Uh, five by four matrix, let's say a two dimensional array. Let's round all the values by multiplying them to 10. What it does is because all the values, this RAND function, all the values it generates are the values between zero and one. What this multiplied by 10, what it does is uh, it actually uh, scales up all the values to 10 and then round function actually uh, round downs or actually rounds the, the values to the integers. Now A will be, uh, what's the problem? Uh, round method. Round method is no longer there. Okay, maybe there is np.round. Maybe that np.round. Maybe np.round is there. Yes, np.round. So round function of np. So this A is... Uh, a is this array, for example. That's a five by four array, four, five rows and four columns. So let's say I want to access the second row. Uh, first of all, let's say I want to access this particular entry. This particular entry is second row and third column, which means the index is one comma two because uh, second row means the row, row first has index zero, row two has index one. Similarly, column one has index zero, column two has index two, one, and column three has index two. So that is what this particular entry is. What if we want uh, to access the whole second row? For example, we want the second row. So that's how you call, that's how you slice. Uh, a normal meaning of this is you, the, the row should be one and the columns, all the columns. So that's how you access the whole second row. If you want to, for example, access the whole uh, third row, for example, or whole second column, let's say. That means you say this, okay, the column number second and all the rows, which means the whole second column that is accessed. Um, and that, if you see, that's the whole second column, six, four, two, 10, and one. That's what the second column is. Um, further, uh, once you have, a, you can, you can, for example, access a sub matrix. Let's say you want, um, you want row number one to row number three, uh, not including three. And then of these rows, you want column number two to column number, um, four, let's say. Um, and if you do that, you access the whole sub matrix. Uh, first it, it actually picks. Uh, row number two and row number three because row number two starts from one and then of those rows it picks these columns and you can just pick the pick the sub matrix inside. 
Um, more, uh, you can you can do a lot of processing on these matrices. For example, this is matrix A. If you just type A dot transpose, that T is for transpose, the matrix just is taken transpose of it. Further, there is a complete library, uh, linear algebra library in NumPy, for example, if you just import NumPy, NumPy dot linear algebra as LA, for example, then this linear algebra library in NumPy has a lot of functions, eigenvalues, Cholsky decomposition, computing determinant of a matrix, finding out inverse of a matrix and, and what not. For example, let's say we have um, LA dot inverse and here is NP dot random dot rand, let's say some three by three matrix. So what it returns is, it returns the inverse of this matrix. And this linear algebra library, and, and there are other libraries as well, but this is one scientific library that uh, maybe most of data science experts who uh, actually want to do research, they might be thinking this linear algebra library um, that uh, that specifies a lot of functions related to uh, related to these uh, matrices or two dimensional arrays. So that is there. Okay. So that's about uh, indexing. Um, we can play with these indices a lot if we want. Uh, one more thing, uh, just uh, just one one last thing. Let's say this is our A, and what we want to do is let's say we want to sort this A with respect to the columns. We want each column to be sorted individually. What we can do is we can call sort function, and we can pass x is equals zero x is equal zero that means sort all the columns individually and the result will be um, if you see the result the result will be every column is sorted individually if we want to sort for example every row individually we will say okay sort x is equals one and every row will be sorted individually um, and if this is a multi-dimensional array, more than three, uh, more than two dimensions, then x's can be two, x's can be three. So which, with respect to whatever x's you want, your sorting can happen, uh, it can do that. If a is one dimensional array, then dot sort function without an axis just sorts, just sorts the one dimensional array from uh, beginning to the end. And if you want a descending order sort, just sort them, sort it first and then reverse it using indexing. Great, uh, I mean, there is a lot to discuss. There is a lot to discuss. I'm ending this slicing here. In the next video, I'm going to show you a kind of masking or sometimes called the fancy indexing that is uh, much more powerful and useful in a lot of uh, different contexts. So hope to see you in the next video with more NumPy indexing. Okay, there is uh, another way of indexing a NumPy array. Uh, in the last video we saw, we can uh, we can do slicing notation, for example, start from here, end at here, and stuff like so. Uh, there is another way of accessing a NumPy array as we have an array A, and we can just give the give an index array inside. For example, let's say A is one dimensional array, and then we just give one, four, six. That means pick the element at index one, pick the element at index four, pick the element at index six. So this kind of uh, array inside can be a list or an array that is called an index array. And you can just pick the elements that you want to pick. For example, you want to pick all odd elements. You want to pick first element, fifth element, and 17th element. You can just create an index array and pass it and, in, and index your and access your elements using that index array. That's possible in NumPy array. Further, you can access uh, uh, different elements using a Boolean mask as well. So Boolean array, for example, true, true, false, false. Wherever there is a true, pick that element. Wherever there is a false, don't pick that element and return the elements that are picked. For example, assuming here that you have uh, an array A, which is one dimensional array, let's say, assume that has eight elements, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight elements. Now you pass a Boolean mask inside where, uh, with, with obviously eight elements, eight true or false values, wherever there is true. So pick the very first value, pick the second value, pick the, don't pick the third value, don't pick the fourth value, pick the fifth value, pick the sixth value, pick the seventh value, and don't pick the 
last value. So that is also possible in, um, in NumPy. One thing that is important is uh, if you do this kind of indexing, which is sometimes called masking, if you do that, if you, do, if you supply an array index or index in a Boolean form, you by default get a copy as, as, as compared to slicing. In slicing, you get a view that's a separate copy. You need not to call a dot copy function. It is by default a different copy. Um, and, and this is a difference between the ordinary slicing that you do, for example, start from one, go till 50, take a jump of, let's say two, uh, if that is your um, indexing style that is called a slicing, the return value is a different view having the same memory. However, if you do the, if you use the array index or the Boolean array called masks, then you get a copy of, rather than so, so which means if you if you get a new array, you change the elements in the new array using the array indices, uh, you're not getting that change happen to the original array. Uh, so that's the difference between slicing and, and masking. Okay, this kind of Boolean indexing becomes really handy. For example, what if you want to accept, what if you want to get all the elements that are smaller than eight? One way to do that is just write A and then apply a condition, A is less than eight. Well, a is less than eight will create a Boolean array and everywhere where the element is smaller than eight, there will be a true, other, otherwise it will be a false. Now you, the inside array is a Boolean array and you access all the elements with respect to that condition. So it will return all the elements that are smaller than eight. How, how fancy is that? Further, you can, you can have these conditions in, in a combined way. Um, um, uh, uh, there is one difference. There is an AND operator, A and D AND, and there is an AND operator in a different way. So I'm going to discuss the difference of this AND and this AND as well in this uh, um, in this whole uh, in in this video. So let's go to uh, Jupyter Notebook, our friend, and see how can we play with this masks. So let's say A is again np dot range range. Uh, let's say a hundred. Let's say that's our A. And what we now do is we access um, the elements of A, we access, for example, the third element and the fifth element and the sixth element. Let's say we want to do that. And that's our B. Yeah, so that happens, let's say. So what B is, B is this. Something that you need to know is if you change the elements of B now because that's a copy, uh, let's say minus four, that change does not happen in A. That happens in B for sure, but that doesn't happen in A. A does not contain any value that is minus four because using these kind of indices, the array index, by default, the result is a copy rather than a view. Further, let's say you have this A and you want to access all the elements that are smaller than, let's say, that are smaller than, let's say, 40. Access all the elements that are smaller than 40. So that is possible. Now B will contain only the elements that are smaller than 40, all the elements, wow. Further, um, if you want to access all the elements that are, um, that are smaller than 40, that are smaller than 40, and they are bigger than, uh, they are smaller than 40, and they are bigger than 30. Let's say you want to access all the elements that are between 30 and 40. You can just access those elements like so. There is a problem. A dot any, a dot all. Uh, what's the problem here? Um, um, the truth value of an array with more than one element is ambiguous. Use a dot any or a dot all. Uh, okay, this a is less than 40, is a Boolean array. A is greater than 40, that's a Boolean array. So what's the problem? Why, why can't we not use this? Oh, what's the problem? We should have used that. So use and, and yeah, I guess we were missing these, uh, we were missing these brackets because it might be confusing this 40 with this A and stuff like so. So use parenthesis, great. Uh, now B contains only the elements that are between 30 and 40. Now one thing, what's the difference between this particular and and this symbol and? Uh, the difference is this and, A and D and operator, it is used when both of the sides of this and has one, is, is one object and it has one true value, either true or false. 
And this particular symbol is used when the left side and the right side can be arrays and each element of that array can be true or false and so. So you can think of uh, this and is used in arrays. However, this is used when both the sides are single objects. So that's the difference. Other variants of and, I mean, the and is like this, that these are, these are the same things. But remember the use, this is used for arrays, this is used for single objects. Similarly, uh, there are other symbols like uh, or that is used this way or or that is used that way similarly there is a not not for arrays is used like this way and not for otherwise uh, is used like that way so uh, remember these the left side kind of symbols they are used for arrays the right kind of symbols they are used for single objects that has true or, or false values so these this kind of masking is really really powerful later we will see in pandas uh, accessing different kind of uh, data with particular kind of conditioning that becomes really handy if we, if we are comfortable with these kind of indexing and that's really powerful indexing. Okay, um, so um, I have told you the difference here between and and and. I've told you that this is copy rather than a view. So just bear with me um, some more time on NumPy and I will tell you some more uh, truths about NumPy and then we will move towards another package called Pandas. So before Pandas, more NumPy is coming. Um, hope to see you in the next video. Okay, in the last video we saw masking, uh, which is uh, sometimes called the fancy indexing as well. Um, and, and here we are going to discuss one more feature of NumPy, which is a very powerful feature called broadcasting. Uh, think for example, uh, you have an array, let's say two, three, a matrix, let's say two dimensional array, two, three, five, and nine, and you want to add, uh, in every element you want to add a number, let's say five. So one way to do that is create another array with five, 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 and just apply this add operator and you are done. Great. But this NumPy allows you to just write, let's say this is array A, NumPy allows you to just do this particular thing and this five is automatically broadcasted to match with the dimensions of its other operand and the addition happens, you need not to do this explicitly. And this broadcasting is not just one scalar value. For example, if you have uh, one variable, let's say A is this, and you want to add, for example, this particular column, let's say one, three, you want to add this particular column in the first column as well as in the second column. But then you need this one three to be copied again and make a bigger array and then you do that. Well, broadcasting allows you if you just write this as a plus one three, it will be automatically broadcasted to match the size of the other operand. Wherever the broadcasting is possible, there are certain rules to uh, to know when broadcasting is possible. It is not possible each and every time. Um, for example, if you have this matrix two, three, nine, and you have four, two, one, let's say this matrix, and you want, uh, for example, two, one, and uh, six, two, for example, if you want to do that, the broadcasting may not happen because uh, uh, in this way, uh, if I want to broadcast this structure, this structure should be, if, if this structure is broadcasted to in horizontal way, the, the two columns will be added and the addition cannot happen. If it uh, expands to a vertical way, still the addition cannot happen. So this, here you will get an error because broadcasting is cannot happen. But in several cases, when you want to add, for example, a scalar multiplier with a particular thing, uh, wherever possible, this broadcasting is possible. And broadcasting is just, uh, I mean, it's just a feature of NumPy that allows you to not repeat to match the dimension of the other operand to apply a particular operator. It does it by itself. Great. Next, we see uh, some more important functions to know. Uh, one is horizontal stack. That means if you want to concatenate two different array, two arrays that are that can be concatenated together horizontally, you can you can call edge stack function and that will concatenate the two arrays together and returns another array. Similarly, v stack is uh, if you want to 
um, are concatenate two arrays vertically if they can be concatenated vertically. Vertically. Similarly, there, in a, there is another powerful function sort, and there are a lot of other functions. These kind of functions they are called universal functions, and they are very, very, very powerful, uh, very, very fast. Their implementation is vectorized. Vectorized means the implementation, the all loop kind of layer is deferred to at the compile time and the things are, are really faster when you do a vectorized code. So having said that, it is always recommended to not use explicitly for loops to achieve these kind of uh, um, to, uh, to achieve these kind of results whenever a universal function is available use that because the efficiency of that universal function will be way 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 more than than whatever loop loop uh, or whatever function you will be writing other than the universal function so and by the way there is another function concatenate as well in which you can specify x says and it will either act as horizontal stack or either act as vertical stack depending upon whether the axis value is zero or one, whatever. So let's just um, get comfortable with these uh, these three functions. Just quickly in Jupyter Notebook and see an example of, uh, let's say, uh, broadcasting as well. So let's say we have a function, let's say we have an array A. A is, let's say, np.random.rand let's say that is uh, 2 by 3 um, and then I just multiply this with 10 remember the this thing and then we just uh, np dot round we just round everything so that it becomes uh, it becomes whole uh, in this particular way okay that's a let's say so that's our a that's the now if we say a plus 3 the three will be added everywhere in A and that happens through broadcasting. Wow. If we if we do for example A um, plus for example NP dot uh, arrange let's say just two values and then we just reshape it reshape it to um, uh, reshape it to let's say a two by one matrix. If you do that then still um, what what will happen is just apply the parentheses just to show that this should happen first what what will happen is there will there will be a column that will be added to every column in a and that again will be happened through through the broadcasting so broadcasting is that powerful next let's see the um, stack so let's say this is a uh, let's say we have b that's another array let's say np dot random dot rand let's say that new array is 2 by 2 and again let's say it is uh, multiplied by 10 and np dot round just to avoid the decimal points let's say this is b now a is a 2 by 3 array b is a 2 by 2 array if i just concatenate them horizontally i will get another array which will be 2 by 5 so c equals np dot H stack horizontal stack H um, stack and I will call these uh, A and B uh, one thing that you need to know is if you if you want to call this H stack horizontal stack or vertical stack these arguments A and B that you want to concatenate you have to give them in a tuple uh, or you may you may want to give several values to concatenate together maybe you have maybe you have 10 matrices to concatenate together horizontally you have to give all these as a tuple inside okay great now similarly we can do a vertical stack if we want uh, i mean one on top of the other and we can call a concatenate function as well if you we want third is a sort function uh, for example if you want um, if you want to use np dot uh, let's say a is np dot random dot permutation let's say np dot arrange let's say the 10 values let's say that's our a let's say this is a and we want to sort this array um, oh this is already sorted why uh, is it sorted no it is not sorted uh, one fourth it is not sorted yeah let's say we want to sort it a dot sort one way of doing that is just call a dot sort and you are done that's the value of a Another way, which is uh, sometimes more readable, 
right? although exactly the same is to use a universal function using np dot that thing that also is the same thing now sort by default sorts in ascending order if you want to sort in descending order then what you can do is you can sort a dot sort for example you do that in ascending order then what you do is you just reverse it minus one and just copy that in a again now a will be sorted wow sorted in descending order yeah great um one more just 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 to give you one more flavor if you create an array for example np dot array of strings for example a b c and another string is how are you and maybe we have another string um, u785 and maybe we have another string 13er let's say that's a string that is possible um, as long as all the objects have same type you can create an np array now you might be wondering what will do this sort function on a because these are all strings well the answer is it will sort the strings according to the alphabetic order whatever the alphabetic order is whatever string according to the alphabetic order should become first that will become first and the other strings they will they will just join yeah so yeah so that's uh, about something that is not uh, that is not the um, numeric value okay great um, there is a, a, a few more things to come about numpy array and then we will be moving towards pandas library that is built on top of numpy array for better processing of data hope to see you in the next video okay in the last video um, we saw horizontal concatenation vertical concatenation sort function we also saw some uh, broadcasting and stuff like so um, universal functions um, it, it should be speed here uh, sorry it should be speed speed universal functions are really really speedy uh, I, I always I'm talking about numpy whenever I start numpy I said it is fast it is fast it is fast I never show you how fast that is so let me give you an example let me let me just create an, an numpy array with a lot of numbers and then just apply an ordinary function let's say i want to add all the numbers in this array b let's apply an ordinary function that is not in numpy and then let's use a universal function dot sum and see how speed difference is there if for example we apply a apply a universal function to achieve a particular task how speedy that universal function is because the vectorized implementation as I told you is much faster how faster let's check that out in new Jupyter notebook that's a magic command time it that will tell us how much time this particular task has has taken and if you run this command it will it will call this function again and again several times and then will report an average value that will be much more stable than just calling once um, after that we will also we will also write our own sum function using loop and we will see whether that is even closer to a universal function speed or not let us just check the speed of universal functions that will give you a look and feel of how much numpy implementation is faster so let's say we have an array let's say b np dot random dot rand and let's say that array is huge really huge that's it that's the case now what we do is we let's say we we call a function sum so let's say we call a function sum that's a built-in function in numpy that's a built-in function uh, that's a built-in function in python not a numpy function and then let's say we do the same task using numpy universal function np.sum that's the same as np.sum is the same as uh, if we if we write for example b.sum so whether you write b.sum or you use np.sum and b passed and pass as an argument both these things are roughly the same um, so let's run it it will take a while it will take a time because uh, okay the sum function takes 307 milliseconds that is not a universal function in numpy that's python function uh, that is not written in numpy that is not a vectorized code nothing it takes 307 milliseconds to perform to take the sum of the elements of this array uh, and it does that by uh, applying 
seven runs, I mean seven loops. However, the universal function takes just around three milliseconds, I mean 2.7 min milliseconds. How, will, how are you going to compare this 307 with three? How much faster you are? Around, um, around 100 times you're faster. I mean, yeah. I mean, this NumPy is literally faster. NumPy, the universal function, the faster. Maybe you attempt to know that, okay, this sum function might be too slow. Let me write my own function to do that. Let me define my sum and my sum just take a, an argument, let's say something, let's say G. And what it does is for, let's say S equals zero, what it does is uh, for x in g s plus equals to x uh, x x plus equals to x and then just return uh, s let's say that's your function let's say you think that this is really a great function let's do that okay let's compute the time for this time it my sum and let's pass the array b and see how faster this is um, this is roughly the same as you're calling the sum function but this np dot sum or the universal function is way way faster way way faster so use universal functions avoid for loops avoid your own functions if the same task has been a, can be achieved through universal functions Whenever possible, avoid loops when you are working with NumPy. That's a serious suggestion. Follow that because the, the universal function written in NumPy, they follow the vectorized code, all the interpreted slowness that is deferred to the compilation layer and the NumPy becomes really, really faster and shows its power when you are working on large arrays using the universal functions. So um, I can speak more about NumPy, but I have told you uh, some basics of NumPy. And um, we end the NumPy here, and from the next video, we will be moving towards a very, very fancy and beautiful kind of package called Pandas to handle data. Um, and by the way, the Pandas library, the Pandas package, completely is built on top of NumPy. Everything that is there in Pandas is built inside, is built on top of NumPy. So all the indexing and all kind of stuff, slicing and speed, all is there in Pandas that is due to the NumPy. So uh, we will see one more package uh, after Pandas, which is matplotlib for, for plotting afterwards. And we'll do a project uh, at the end using scikit-learn as well just to wrap up all these things together. But for now, I'm ending NumPy here, and in the next video, we will start Pandas. Hope to see you in the next video. Okay, welcome to Pandas, um, a data science package that is very, very powerful of handling data, manipulating data, and used a lot in data munging, and data cleaning, and data pre-processing, and whatnot. Uh, this pandas basically is built on top of NumPy, so most of the features of NumPy is also available in pandas. Um, let's let's dive in. I mean, this pandas is a very very fancy library, very very fancy package that you can handle very large amounts of data in in CSV files or in Excel files, wherever the data is located. The missing entries are there. You can handle all the data, you can manipulate all the data, you can prepare all the data in just a few lines of codes using this pandas uh, package. So let's just start pandas package. Uh, there are two most important uh, objects of pandas. One is series, another is data frame that we will see later on. There is one more index, but uh, the most important one is, uh, or the useful one is, the, uh, is series and data frame. So let's just define, uh, first of all, you need to import pandas package import pandas and you can rename this as pd that's a that's the most popular renaming although you can rename it any and then you just say okay pd dot series and then just like a numpy array you pass the data that you want and you can create your own indices for example uh, like just like dictionary this a is a key value 
this A is a key or index for this 0.25, this B is index for 0.5, C is index for 0.75 and D is index for one. So you can you can you can supply your explicit indices as well. If you do not supply the indices, the default indices are zero, one, two, and three. But you can define your own own indices in the way you want. Now, once this uh, data object is created, you can call the data values and you will find out the values. You can call data dot index and you will find out the indices. Let's see uh, in the Jupyter notebook just to get comfortable with uh, pandas first of all import pandas as pd maybe or something else um, so okay let's that's imported maybe we can check what version we, we are working in pd dot version uh, the version of pandas we are working in right now is 0 0.2 4 4.2 fine great so let's create a data or whatever variable let's say a as pd dot series pz dot series and there we just give a list of some values two three four five let's say these are the values and then we can give index as another list let's say the indices are a maybe the indices need not to be strings um, any anything a b c and let's say the index of 5 is let's say d so now the series object or the pandas object series is created series basically handles one dimensional arrays later on we will see data frame handles multi-dimensional arrays I mean more than one dimensions normally typically two dimensional arrays but um, okay a dot values so let's call the values uh, values and you will get all the values inside the series um, and by the way this values array that you get let's check what's the type of that array what's type of that array a dot values what is that thing uh, that's an umpy array wow and what's the type of a itself that will be a pandas object. Great, so everything inside pandas, uh, the numpy is playing all the role inside pandas. Um, great, so now uh, let's check the index a dot index. Uh, that's <clears throat> also an numpy, uh, that's also an array of index type. That's a different, uh, diff actually index is also an object in pandas. That's an index type object with these kind of indices. We can access, for example, this A, just like we are working with dictionary. For example, A of A, that returns a value. We can change the values, we, we can add different, we can add more key value pairs. So just think like uh, these, uh, just think this data just like the dictionary object that we saw this these are the keys and these are the values and this is uh, one one very good way of remembering what the series does and manipulating series the way we want okay one we we can access a uh, like this we also can do slicing let's say we want to access from a to let's say c let's say we want to access all these uh, one difference is when you access like this in in the normal slicing using implicit indices for example one two three or zero the final index is not included but if you access like so uh, using explicit indices that are there the final index is also included so that is one more fancy way of indexing using uh, in, in this pandas um, okay great that's a series object by the way we can create a series object um, by first creating a dictionary for example let's let's go back to our slides and see this example let's create a dictionary for example of grades let's say we have a lot of students with grade a grade a minus grade b grade b minus and let's create that dictionary then we can just create a series object or pandas object by just passing this dictionary inside we can make another dictionary for example and we can make another series object so uh, one way of uh, defining the series object is just to is just to pass the data as well as index another way is to just first create the dictionary and just pass the dictionary variable inside and the series object will be created okay that was uh, just the introduction to series 
we will move on and see more features of pandas as we as we explore it more and more in the f upcoming videos hope to see you in the next video okay let's say we have um, two different dictionaries let's say we have a lot of students and uh, the a grade is defined to be 4 and the a minus grade defined to be 3.5 the B grade a has a number three, the B minus grade has a number with a numeric value that is 2.5 and similarly B grade has a numeric value that's a two. And then we create just a series object using this dictionary. Let's say rather than just a numeric values as a GPS or something like so, let's say A grade also is defined at 85 marks in total. A minus grade is defined at 80 marks in total and similarly these, and then we create another series object let's say named with mark marks using these uh, pd dot series so let's go to jupyter notebook and just uh, play a little with these dictionaries and build the series object let's say marks or let's say grades dictionary equals let's say a grade is uh, has has a grade has number value 4 or gpa value 4 let's say Let's say we have a B grade with GPA value, let's say um, B is, let's say it's 3.5. Let's say we have C grade with GPA value, let's say three. And let's say finally we have D grade with GPA value, let's say um, 2.5. Let's say that's a dictionary. Okay, what we do now is we create a grades series object let's say using pd dot series and just pass this grades underscore dict now this uh, capital a capital b capital c and capital d they will act as indices and this 4 3.5 3 and 2.5 they will act like values so for example if we call that and just now call grades dot grade dot values so we will get for example, uh, oh, what is that? That just values. Let's say we get this grades dot values, and we get all the values that are available. Similarly, if we find grades dot index, we will find out A, B, C, and D. Let's define another dictionary. For example, marks dictionary dict, and that is let's say again A. Uh, the total marks are 85 for the A grade, let's say for B grade, the total marks are let's say 75. Let's say for C grade, the total marks are let's say 65. And for D grade, let's say the total marks are 55, let's say. So let's say that's another dictionary. Now uh, let's create a series objects, a series object PD dot series series let's say marks dictionary yeah so uh, now again we have if we just write this marks just like so um, you will see uh, the marks a is 85 b is 75 c is 65 d is 55 and all the values they are integer 64 kind of values now we can access um, now we can play with this marks for example if we just want to access, for example, what are the marks? What are the marks between, let's say, uh, um, for example, what are the marks given a, at at a? We can access that. We can change that. We can just play like a dictionary. What if we, rather than using the index uh, a, we use, for example, slicing? We want to start from the very beginning. And let's say we want to go to two. What will happen? Let's see. Um, yeah, so the slicing is there. For example, if you want, these are explicit indices, A, B, C, D. These are explicit indices and they are there. For example, if you can slice the, you can slice the data using explicit indices that you are given, that you are given, or implicit indices that are the default indices, the first value indexed at zero, the second value is indexed at two, one, and so on. So you can do that as well. One catch here, for example, uh, that we will see later on, there may be a problem that your explicit indices, they are also numeric. And then you do the slicing like so. 
then the, the series object may be confused whether I have to use the explicit indices or implicit indices inside. We will see how to resolve that issue, but um, by this, this panda is allowed to use explicit indices as well as the uh, implicit indices. Okay, um, we were here, uh, uh, sorry, I just, so uh, yeah, so we were here, so uh, we have created these uh, grades, a series object, this marks as a series object. Um, these, the series object is good for one dimensional arrays or data with just one dimensional list or dictionary uh, kind of with just one dimensions. Later, we will see a data frame that actually is, uh, is actually the extension of, can be, looks like, can be looked like as an extension of series towards more than one dimension. We may have, for example, two dimensional arrays or two dimensional data structures, something like so. Um, and, and we will be seeing this data frame, which is much more powerful, uh, particularly for reading f data from files and manipulating it and stuff like so. Uh, we will see that in the next video data frame, that running form of data frame in the next video. Hope to see you in the next video. Okay, uh, in the last video we were discussing uh, series and I told you that data frame is basically if, if, if the data has, uh, if the data is in a form of different columns, for example, a record as an array, then you have another record, then you have another record, and each element in that record is a different attribute. So this particular way of two-dimensional data is very well handled using data frame inside pandas rather than series. So, uh, but you can make these data frame object using different series objects. For example, you have a grade object that grades object that we created last time. You have a marks object that we created last time. Let's build a data frame using these two and see what it looks like in, in Jupyter Notebook. Let's see that. So remember we have a marks uh, series object and we have a grades series object. Let's now make a grades. Uh, maybe, maybe the name is grades. Okay, the name is like grades. Okay, so grades object, this one. Let's make a data frame. Uh, let's say uh, D or maybe whatever name you want to do, data frame with again that data frame can also be defined using a dictionary again now we have let's say marks is the key for data marks and grades is the key for data grades let's say let's say we define a data frame like so and now if you see if we just display this d we get a very beautiful look and feel of, I mean, this uh, A is the index, um, A is the explicit index, A at index A, the marks, the marks is 85, the grades are four, at index B, the marks are 75, the grades are 33.5 and so on, that, that looks like so. Not only that, you can just transpose it like you have transposed the NumPy array and you will get the flipped version or the transposed version if you want, great. So, um, that's how, and you can have, for example, more dictionaries to concatenate together and more columns will be added here. And that's what the real data looks like. I mean, it has a lot of columns, which normally are attributes. And each row is basically one record or one sample of the data that you want to work on. So this data frame is really, really ideal data structure for working with files, um, having a lot of records and you want to manipulate date, that data um, and, and stuff like so. So um, yeah, so one more thing, uh, let's, let's access the uh, D for example, let's print D, that's the, that's the D. Let's uh, access the values inside D other than no. So what are the values? So the values inside D is completely again, a two dimensional array that is completely like so. So for example, if you want to access this particular element 65, that is row number three and column number one, uh, excluding the indices, that's row number three and column number one. So we can access that particular value, d.values, 
just assuming that's a two-dimensional NumPy array, row number three is two, index with two, and column number one is index with that, and we will be able to access 65. Wow, great. So that is there. There are more things that are available. D dot, for example, columns, uh, D dot columns, columns. It will give us what are the columns. Um, the, the, the columns are marks and grades. Um, there and, and there are other properties and there are other several properties that we, we need to know. RS, for example, this uh, there we define this as uh, dd dot index and stuff like so. Okay, um, one more thing that you need to know is we can we, we right now we have let's say d that is this one, that's the d. Let's say we want to add another column here. Just we want to add another column here, and that is the 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 name of that column is scaled marks, and the scaled marks are what if we have computed marks rather than from 100, what if we have computed marks out of 90? What are the scaled marks out of 90? So one way to do that, and very quick way to do that, is just like a dictionary, again like a dictionary. You just add a new key, let's say scaled marks, that's a new key, and the value is simply uh, all the marks column divided by 90, so is, is that true? No. Um, um, divided by 90, uh, if, if we have just computed all the marks by 90, and then how can we, how can we compute the marks from 90? It is rather than 100, it is from 90. I, I guess, um, um, how can we compute the marks from 90? Uh, if you want to compute the marks from 90, um, I guess they will look like divided by 90 uh, and maybe 100 is multiplied here. I guess maybe the formula, uh, no, I guess that, that that's what it is, I guess. Let's see. So now if you see D, um, there will be another column that is there and oh, the, the, it does something else. Anyways, <laughs> I mean it does something that, uh, yeah. So something, anyways, so we have, see, we have just, I mean, we've just uh, computed this. We we just, uh, we just found, we, we just inserted that column inside that, I mean, that is a processed for, you know, these kind of values. Maybe we have added this column in a very wrong way and later on we suggest that, okay, we should delete that column. Well, that's very simple, again using the concepts again, just like the dictionaries. Delete this, and this column is deleted from data, and you're again with the data that you had. So you can add columns, you can delete columns, and indexing is really fine. I mean, indexing like, like masking, let's say you want to pick, for example, all you want to pick the data frame such that you want to pick all the records such that the marks are the marks are the marks are greater than let's say greater than let's say 70 you want to pick all the records where the where the marks are greater than 70 this is that simple all the data will be will be copied into g with this condition and this condition can be arbitrarily complex using ands and ors and combinations and all that stuff and you have seen this kind of stuff in NumPy as well. I mean, this is called masking. Great, so that's available in Pandas as well. Okay, so um, that's how you can index. Um, in, the, in, the next, uh, in the next video, I'm going to basically uh, show you uh, one type of uh, problem that normally happens in real data, that is the missing value problem. Sometimes uh, you, you read a data and some of the attributes or some of the row column pair values, they, they are just missing. I mean, they're not available due to certain reasons. How can, you, how can you handle those values and how actually Pandas suggest you to handle those kind of um, missing values, which is sometimes called NAND values or none type values also. They, they mostly used interchangeably 
in pandas so in the next video we are going to handle or see how to handle missing data in in pandas hope to see you in the next video okay in the last video we saw data frame object and uh, we, we we saw actually how to add and remove columns how to process data how to index um, how to actually mask or how to apply conditions and selections in in pandas we, we we saw that very briefly but in this particular video we are going to see one kind of missing value sometimes called nan or not a number or or maybe not anything or sometimes this none type none which is the default return type of any function in in python this none type is also sometimes a, in pandas uh, is treated as nan or nan is treated as none or interchangeably any anything let me give you what do we mean by that let's say we we have two dictionaries let's say one dictionary is a with key value a and the value is one then b and the value is two okay the other dictionary is b and c so for example that is one record with columns a and b so a and b are the columns on the first record the value of a is one and the value of b is two now let's say we want to insert another record in the same data frame now the value of b is available in the second time the value of b is available which is three and the value of c is available which means a c column is added now but for the value c the first row value is not available so we will say this value is missing here but in the second row we have four similarly the value of a is missing for for the second row and that is a missing value which is sometimes called nan so these are missing values and they are typical when you are working with data um, and you're reading data and you're getting data from uh, from out from somewhere or large files and stuff like so so pandas uh, give some methods to handle these kind of uh, these kind of uh, uh, i mean um, uh, th this kind of situation let's say let's say a equals pd dot data frame data frame again a dictionary let's say we have a um, one and b let's say four that's the first row or record the second record let's say is another dictionary let's say b is uh, minus three and c is let's say uh, nine let's say let's say that's our data frame a so now if you print this a if you see the data inside a you will see oh uh, what's the problem a is this and b uh, have we have we applied something in a wrong way uh, let's see oh we have to create a list that's the okay we have to create a list of it you have to create a list of dictionaries that's the proper way of calling it so we we missed just the syntax list of that okay right so now we have this a we just call that a and this value is missing and that value is missing and in large data files this is typical i mean there are a lot of values that can be missing one uh, way that panda supplies to handle these missing values is to just fill these missing values with some some fixed number for example there is a fill na function uh, fill na function and let's say you supply a zero that means wherever there is a not available or not a number value fill that with zero or maybe any any value you want to fill that with so that is one way to do that and now if you see the value of a is all the non values are filled with that another kind of uh, function that is available in pandas that is sometimes used it, that is drop na that that function drop na what that does is it drops all the records that contain a missing value um sometimes if that is feasible i mean dropping all the records that contain uh, missing values if that is feasible then go for that but uh, if if the if the missing values are a lot and they are spread over a lot of rows then dropping all those kind of uh, records they will create a lot of uh, i mean data loss and 
and and and then uh, it become really uh, really important how to how to handle these missing values however you can fix uh, you can fill the missing values using uh, fix value or you can drop them and later on we will see in uh, scikit learn that there are other ways of handling the missing values as well you can fill the each column missing values in each column using an average or so using for example a regression there are ways to to handle these missing values uh, but in pandas uh, these two functions are right away there you can fill all them with a fixed value for example or you can drop them and you are ready to go okay great um, uh, next uh, uh, we, we are going to see oh, oh, as as I mentioned earlier what is a what is a confusion between what if there is a confusion between implicit and explicit indices and uh, that I will discuss in the next video basically um, ju just to give you a look and feel what if the explicit indices you supply they are 1 3 and 5 and what if you call this this particular command 1 colon 3 will it call the implicit index or the explicit index that's a problem so we will see because 1 1 colon 3 1 and 3 they are also explicit indices and whether this one colon three is referring to the implicit indices that are default indices or they are referring to these indices so this confusion is there and we will see how to handle that confusion uh, using this uh, lock loc function and index lock ilc function we will see that in the next video hope to see you in the next video okay in the previous video i mentioned uh, a confusion that can be there if you have supplied the explicit indices that can conflict with implicit indices in particular for example if this is the series object or maybe a data frame object if you want to if for indices let, let's just think about the series object uh, it has these values a b c with index 1 3 and 5 if we for example access a particular element let's say data with index 1 that means the explicit index for sure but if for example we slice the values for example 1 colon 3 the default behavior of slicing if you give the numeric indices that is to use implicit indices and by implicit indices we mean by we mean that what is at index 1 at index 1 this is b so b will be printed for example or b will be fetched and then you move to 2 which is c then c will be fetched and these are the values that will be printed but the behavior might be different you might be expecting to use explicit indices which means access 1 colon 3 and when the explicit indices are used the last index is also included and in that case you might be expecting the index 1 is of a so a should be printed and index 3 is of b and b should be printed and this confusion might be there if uh, if this is there so to handle that there is uh, there are two functions one is called loc and another method is called ILOC whenever you call LOC that means you are using explicit indices I mean you're forcing to use explicit index and whenever you call ILOC that means you're accessing elements using the implicit index what whatsoever so let's let's practice this um, and see the confusion see the detail of this kind of confusions in in here Jupyter notebook so let's say we have a series object let's say a equals pd dot series <clears throat> and uh, let's say it has values as uh, a b and c that's the value these are the values and index as let's say one three and five let's say these are the indices let's say this is a okay let's say we access a using one that means uh, that means the explicit index and that is this let's say we access using a slicing operator now this will use implicit indices and it will access uh, I mean it will access these B and C because one colon three using indices implicit indices results that um, and we might we might be expecting that use this kind of stuff so if we are really interested in using explicit indices what should we do is we should call the lock function a lock 
and then one colon three. That means use explicit indices. That is to remove the confusions. Now it will use the explicit index one and three. And if, for example, we are interested in using implicit indices, then it is good to use ilog function. Yeah, now one, one colon three is to use implicit indices. Uh, and the implicit indices are like these. So, um, and, and like in series objects, you can you can you can do the same in data frame objects. Um, once you are using lock and i lock, then the further indexing inside these square brackets is exactly the same like NumPy. So whether you use lock or i lock. The, the indexing mechanism is exactly the, the slicing mechanism is exactly the same like like you 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 have used in in numpy i mean all indexing that stays the same lock means uh, you are using explicit index i lock means you are using explicit um, implicit index let's say for example we have our data frame i guess d that's our data frame available to us let's say i want to access d dot i lock Let's say I want to access um, the second row completely. The second record, com oh, the record that is indexed at, look at, indexed at two, which is the third row completely. Let's say I want to access that. Now this two is acting as, uh, this two is acting as, uh, for example, if you see the, the second row or, or, the, or the row at the second index, which is the third row, that is completely this, and it returns that. Once you have used iLock, for example, and mostly uh, people use iLock, sometimes lock is also required, but iLock is just to explicitly mentioning that I'm using, I'm going to use the implicit indexing scheme. Again, uh, you can consider whole that thing as a matrix, and once you have applied this iLock, then you're free to play with the indices like you play with two-dimensional arrays. For example, um, I want to, for example, um, uh, I want to reverse, for example, all the rows, and um, I want to reverse all the all the all the structure. For example, let's say I want to do that, um, and and you can see everything is reversed. I mean, all the indexing, like like NumPy, all the indexing is there in 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 pandas. I mean, once you have used iLock inside, is just just remember the NumPy indexing and everything like so. Okay, so that's the um, lock and I lock function. In the next video, um, we are actually going to um, going to just practice the pandas um, to to actually uh, to actually work on a data file that is saved as a CSV file. Um, so we will we will show you how to how to actually how to actually manipulate, read, and write the data and play with the data, the data, the real data that is there in, in some CSV file and how Pandas will help you to, uh, to manipulate the data very efficiently and very quickly. So hope to see you in the next video. Okay, um, in this particular video, I will be talking about a real data set. Uh, the data set I have chosen just to show you some uh, some functions that are available in pandas to work on real data set the the data set i've chosen as a covid 19 data set uh, that was available in kaggle and uh, it's a real data set that contains uh, information of uh, victims uh, recovered the total number of recovered people in per country per province the total number of uh, died people and the total number of reported people uh, per date available that that data is available. Let, let's see the look and feel of that data in a file Just to just to see what kind of data we are talking about. So let's say this is our data This is a serial number column that uh, contains the just the um, Record number that's uh, that's a column called observation date. That's a date. That's a province or state That's a country or a region. That's the up, last updated when the record is updated what's the time and how many confirmed cases were there at that date and how many deaths at that date and how many recovered at that date as the date is moving on and on you will be seeing that the number of confirmed cases and the number of um, recovered cases they will be uh, increasing maybe the number of deaths they also increase 
So uh, let's see this data. Let's read that data using pandas and do uh, some manipulation of this data and see the look and feel of that data um, in, in Jupyter Notebook. Let's go to um, Jupyter Notebook and see. So first of all, I need this uh, pandas library and put it that. Maybe somewhere I need this NumPy library as well. Um, uh, I'm also loading a scikit-learn, sklearn library because I want to I want to use the impute function just to handle the missing values. It, it is just more powerful to use the, I mean, the sklearn library that is also a data science library, a package that uh, is particularly a machine learning library or, or a package that actually gives a better support or, or a larger support of handling missing data. Although uh, here I have used this uh, sklearn function just for an example, um, and, but but I, I could have used this uh, data frame fill na function or something like so, but I'm just using that one. Okay, after importing all these, what I did is I just called pd.readcsv function and I load that uh, data and then I did this stuff one by one. Let's, let's, let's spend some time on all these commands one by one. Uh, in, and, and let's see in Jupyter Notebook what is happening. Let, let's go to Jupyter Notebook and actually read that file and do whatever we are doing here. So uh, first of all, import NumPy that is already imported. Import, uh, for example, uh, uh, Pandas that is also already imported. Then from sklearn.impute, import simple imputer. So let's let's use that or, or let's okay let's do that um, from sklearn dot impute sklearn dot impute import simple imputer okay import that because that's a new thing we need to import that now uh, read the data for example uh, data frame in df. So df equals pd dot read csv. Uh, there is a csv file, read csv, and it contains the path of the file. The path is located in my directory. It is located at this particular location, covid, and the name of that is uh, covid underscore 19 underscore data. So covid underscore 19 underscore data dot csv so let's read that file uh, the file will be read if you just see that some of there is a function let's say head that gives the top records or the records that appear just in the very top that's that's what the data file that i was showing you in excel uh, it is showing just the first five records uh, I, ca I can show the first 10 records, for example, just by calling the head function in this particular way. Okay, great. Um, let's say I, I just want to remove this serial number because I, I think that is not required. And let's say I want to remove this particular column uh, because that is also not required. There are multiple ways of doing that. I can call a DEL function on this and I can call DEL function on that. But there is another uh, way of doing that by df dot uh, drop, df dot drop, and in that you just give um, the columns that you want to drop. One column is serial number, I guess. What's the column name? That's s and no. So you want to you want to drop that column, and then you want to drop this particular column with heading last update. So that is uh, last update. So that is, I guess, what is there. Uh, X is one in place true. So X is one is just men mentioning do, do that stuff with columns. In place equals true. That actually is, uh, is telling that whatever this operation you are going to do, uh, reflect the changes in this DF. Uh, frame. If we do not write in place true, it will do everything and uh, return onto a temporary variable or underscore variable or whatever we are saying. But the DF, the data frame will stay unchanged. So in place true means do that changing in DF variable itself. So now if we see DF uh, dot head, let's say 
it will no longer be showing us the serial number column and the last updated column. Uh, what next we can do, we, we, may, we may want to rename uh, this, this name to just date, for example, this to maybe another, let, let's rename all these columns um, using, using a rename function, df.rename columns equals to, and then we have that dictionary again in place equals true. So let's use, uh, let's use this rename function, df.rename. Let's say that, and here we have columns, columns, if I spell right, columns, and then that is dictionary. What columns you want to change? I want to change observation date. I want to con change that to simply uh, date, let's say. And I also want to change province uh, slash state to simply um, simply state uh, or, or province province let's say simply that and I al also want to change this country slash region to simply country so maybe I want to change this country slash region to simply to to country C O U N T R Y country, and I want all that should be happen in place. So in place equals true. So after that, if you run that uh, on this particular step, and now if you see the state of df, uh, you will get like so. Okay, these many. Uh, so date, province, country, confirmed, deaths, and so on. So um, uh, this is much nicer form than earlier. Um, moreover, uh, we may have a lot of missing values. Oh, one way, this date format, the date format is not in a format that Pandas uh, internal date format. So let's convert the date format into, into, into the internal uh, Pandas date format using two, two PD2 date time function. So let's say df date equals to pd to date time and convert this df date in that particular format. And now if you run this uh, df dot head, you might be seeing the date format in a different way. You see that? That's the that's a that's a date format that the uh, pandas is expecting. Now uh, we we that that is just showing showing some records. If you want to see more records, we can see those. Um, let's say I want to uh, just um, I want to just uh, count or, or or let's say let's just describe all the data. df dot describe. There is a describe function that describe all most of the statistics of the data. I mean, uh, the total count of confirmed cases are these, the deaths are these, recovered are these, these many columns are there, these many values are there. The mean is that, and standard deviation is that, the minimum 25, and these are the statistics. Let's say uh, there is another function, info, df dot, um, df dot, info. If you call that function, info, it will give us the more information about um, the null entries and the non -null entries and so on. For example, if you see uh, the total number of data columns are six, the total number of records are six, one, six, two, the date entries is always available. The province entries are only 3,700 available. The rest entries are null entries. So province entries are most of the entries are null entries and they are there. Maybe we want to drop those or maybe we want to impute those entries and stuff like so. But there are null entries that are available in the province column. Um, some of the province uh, some of the province values are no longer available. Let's see that here. For example, this is not available, this is not available, this is not available. And that's what the real state of the data is. This is not available, this is not available, and so on. So this can happen. Okay, next what we do is uh, we, we actually... Uh, we actually use this simple imputer just to impute the missing values. 
One way is to do that using simple and pure form sklearn. Another way is, at, as we already know, just df.fillna, fill na with, let's say, uh, with, let's say, not available, with, let's say, string, some string, not available. Let's say that string. And with that, uh, if you fill that, fill na using that, now after that we will be having all that data the missing values will be filled according to let's see some missing values because in the province there were some missing values now you can see for example let me go on yeah yeah so not available not available we can we can use that or we can use a fancy kind of thing that is available by scikit-learn and so on okay after that if you now see the information info now you will not be seeing any null value. All the columns are there. Oh, uh, this was not in place. Uh, so dot fill na that is, and let's change the df with it. So this doesn't happen in place. So df just change the df. Okay, df changes. Now uh, if we now call the info, there is no null value anymore. Um, yeah. So uh, I end this video here. Uh, in the next video, I will show you this group by command to just see these uh, kind of stuff in a more detailed way uh, because this, this particular video is getting lengthier and lengthier. We, I'm stopping here in this particular uh, location. Next time, I will show you the group by command in the, in the Pandas data frame and I will show you what that does. So um, we will explore all that code that is written here and um, we will uh, in 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 the, in the upcoming videos when we will see the plotting and uh, matplotlib we will be using the same data file to to work more and to get more insight how the how this pandas and matplotlib and numpy and combination how they can actually um, how they can actually uh, play a very important role in analyzing a very very large real data files um, okay, so I end this video here. I will start the next video right from this command and uh, will tell you what is happening. What is this group by command? So hope to see you in the next video. Okay, in the last video we were discussing this uh, COVID-19 file and uh, we reached here but we didn't use this sklearn imputer. We just used the fill na function of data frame. Um, now let's discuss this group by command um, or a query in, uh, in Pandas that is uh, much more feasible. Let's say our goal is now, for example, if you go to go back to uh, Jupyter, if you see your data df.head or all, that's a df.head, let's say 10 records. If you want to see that, there are so many records, let's just see 10. Let's say what you want to do is you want to just see how many uh, how many total confirmed cases are there in each country regardless of their date and for example you want to just see uh, all the all the con all the confirmed cases all the deaths and all the recovered cases uh, in each country for all the dates and for all the provinces combined together one way to do that is to write a group by command for example let's say df Two equals df dot group by and in group by what you see is for what kind of uh, columns you want to you want to group all these all this data so for example you want to group by country country so that's your grouping now after grouping um, what do you want to see what kind of what kind of uh, what kind of, uh, for example, the, the values you want to see because now you're grouping. Well, after grouping, I really want to see because date is gone once I group all the dates, they are grouped together, all the provinces that are grouped together. So what I really want to see is just the country. Uh, and I want to see the confirmed cases. So pick all these records, confirmed. And then I want to see deaths and recovers, for example, if I want to, deaths. Uh, and let's say then I want to see the recovered cases, RE. And just I want uh, a pick, 
group all the countries together, group all these things together, and add all the records under each country. So sum all of them, and maybe we want to reset any index if it is there. So for example, reset, reset index. So that thing. So after this query, for example, this group by query, what will happen is this DF2 will contain a summary of the data with respect to each country and the total, for example, in this particular country, the total confirmed cases are these, all the confirmed cases till now, and the deaths are these and recovered as these for this country. For each country now, each country is describing Australia, for example, uh, in all, till till now, Australia has total these confirmed cases, these total uh, deaths, and these are recovered cases, and so on. So that is if we want to group all these with respect to country. What if we want to group all these with respect to country and then date, for example? So first we want to group them by country, so country, and then for each country, display all the dates, and then do the the same stuff. Um, the the query will stay almost the same. A group by command will stay almost the same, with one kind of uh, uh, with one kind of. Let's say we want to first group by country. Once the it is grouped by the country, then I want to group them by date. And now I want to see all the results in the form of uh, I want to see the date as well. And what will happen now is for each country, it's trend with respect to all the dates that will be displayed here. So let's see DF2 now, DF2. So if you see DF2 now, you can see, for example, this particular country it has just one record, then this country it has one record, then this country for this date has this record, for the same country another date has same record, and all, the date is also sorted. I mean, now you can see all the records in a very incremental way. So that may give you a very good look and feel of what is happening or, or for example. Another thing, what if you want to, uh, what if you want to, for example, find out all the records all the records. You just want to find out all the records. That's DF3, for which the um, the confirmed cases, for example, the confirmed cases are um, are more than a uh, hundred. Let's find out all the records. Let's 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 get just let's just pick all the records for which the confirmed cases are larger than hundred, and let's copy all these records just those records in this. So if we do that, we have DF3 available and we have DF3 um, this. I mean, these are just the records in which the confirmed cases are for sure larger than 100, just those. Um, yeah, so we can do, I mean, a lot of a lot of data analysis, the real data analysis, a lot of a lot more. I've just shown you a very small snapshot of uh, what we can do with pandas on on the real data set. I mean, there is a lot more that we can do with this pandas library um, on on real data sets, on multiple data files, combining them together, joining them together, seeing their correlation, a lot of stuff. And this pandas really is a very very fancy and very high level library very high level package to work with data. So um, due to time limitations, I'm just ending this uh, pandas here, although there is much more to explain in that. But um, um, in, in the next video, we will be jumping towards matplotlib. Just we will see some, some functions of matplotlib and we will see very briefly how can we plot, how can we analyze data using visual uh, graphs or stuff like so. So that, that sometimes this visualization of uh, different attributes of the data give very good insight uh, to the data. Uh, wherever possible, uh, wherever possible, uh, you, uh, if, if the visualization is possible, if the data dimensionality in a way or the visualization techniques are in a way that you can visualize the trends in the data, 
that gives you much more much better insight than the numbers or statistical results but it completely depends in what situation you can visualize the data there are situations high dimensional data for example is not always visualizable so in in those cases the statistical results or the numbers may play a more important role but in more and many cases visualization give a very good initial insight into the data and the design process can become very very fast if you know something about the data um, whether you get that information by visualization or by other statistics or whatever so um, in the next video i will be just um, explaining some very few functions of matplotlib and then we will be uh, then we will be exploring the same file and we will be doing some stuff um, doing some stuff using the plots and matplotlib and doing seeing the trends of death rates seeing the trends of i mean we will be playing with this file a bit more using matplotlib as well so hope to see you in the next video okay in this video i'm going to discuss matplotlib a very powerful package for plotting graphs and scattered plots line plots and 3d plots and plots on the globe and whatnot i mean very very powerful tool uh, the most important uh, module in this matplotlib or the most popular module or the most uh, used module is pyplot. So we can import matplotlib.pyplot as plt. Another way of writing the same kind of stuff is uh, we, can, we can write like uh, from matplotlib from matplotlib import pyplot as plt so either way is fine whether we write this as a dot notation or that one that is fine so np is for numpy so let's create some points um, just 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 make our first plot let's let's make some points starting from zero let's say all the points starting from zero till 10 and let's create a thousand points in between one way to do that is to use built-in function or or a method in numpy which is lin space or linearly spaced points starting from zero ending at 10 and there are a thousand of those points let's say this is our x and this is our let's say y which is np dot sign this sign function is actually will apply element by element on this numpy array and then this plt will plot will actually plot uh, x comma y all the points in front of you so um, let's go to jupyter notebook and actually see this matplotlib in running form for the very first time oh we have seen this matplotlib when we saw np dot random we we, <clears throat> we plotted a histogram wow so this is not the first time we actually have seen this once 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 before so import matplotlib dot by plot as plt that's your import command for example now plt is available let's say x is np.lin space let's say start from zero go to 10 and generate let's say a thousand points let's say that's your x y might be your np dot sign x let's say that's your y and then what you do is you say okay plt dot plot x comma y point by point and then you press shift enter that's it oh this plot is there in front of you that simple I mean that simple can you imagine this is that simple um, yeah this is that simple um, so I mean plotting th this is a line plot for example if we want a scatter plot we can say okay plt dot scatter there is a scatter function uh, that allows us to uh, plot all these in points form rather than rather than these uh, line form these are oh these are a lot of points that's why you you're not seeing these scatter so let me let me uh, let me take this n uh, x as fewer let's say let's take x as uh, let's just take a um, few points let's say just um, just just 30 points and let's see the corresponding 30 points see the remember the indexing of numpy arrays i'm just using that so now use the scatter plots and you have this oh that's a uh, that's scatter maybe we want to use let's say uh, start from uh, the very beginning go to end and pick every let's say 10th point 
and do the same with y just to just to see a plot in a better way um, just sample some points so that's the scatter plot it is just like I mean the points and so on uh, it is not a it is not a continuous plot like the line plot it's a scatter plot we can annotate the scatter plot we can change these colors to any color we want for example we can we can have a pro property for example color is equal to let's say red and everything will become red uh, yeah so that's red we can have I mean we can label it we can X label it we can Y label there are a lot of properties um, but but the but the main point is plotting is that simple plotting is that quick using matplotlib so um, yeah this matplotlib is really really powerful we have just seen a snapshot just a plot function and a scatter function there are there are a lot of properties to be set there are a lot of things to be considered um, and we will see we will see actually one one lengthier code use uh, on this COVID-19 uh, file and we will we will actually analyze the death trends and the confirmed trends and some trends that um, and, and we will plot them and see the trends uh, really using matplotlib so um, but before that let me let me show you that if you call for if you call this plot multiple times for example uh, maybe with different colors then you will be having a lot of curves on the same uh, on the same plot for example so for example let's see plt dot plot um, x comma y let's say with co with color let's say color equals to blue uh, you can write blue the whole or you can like write just b that's fine plt dot plot uh, x and let's say np dot cause x and the color you are interested in let's say the color is uh, let's say green and that's perfectly okay and that will give you two plots in the same figure sort of and you can just good to go well um, yeah so that more you can for example you can plot with a green uh, green color and you want the solid line or you want a, for example cyan color in a dashed line or you want a dash and dot black line or or maybe you want a completely dotted line in red color so there are several things that are available in matplotlib um, this is just a very few very simple snapshot and I have given you a very quick start in in actually actually the whole point is using MATLAB is that quick I mean you can you, you have your data you just plug in their data you just call the plot function and you're good to go for analysis okay um, uh, in in the next video we are, we are we will actually walk through the we will actually walk through the COVID-19 data set and we'll actually analyze the trends and uh, the death rate trends for each country individually and then we will see the death confirmed and uh, the recovery trend of the overall world till the 16th of March till the day till the date the data is available so next video will be actually the you will see the running form of uh, uh, pandas and matplotlib together so hope to see you in the next video okay uh, uh, I already have shown you the COVID-19 file and here I have uh, a notebook on that that uses matplotlib and pandas to to find out the deaths confirmations and uh, recovery trends uh, using using different plots so um, let me import uh, all the packages that I need I need a plot pi plot function from matplotlib I need pandas somewhere I need numpy and I'm using a simple computer here for missing values so let's run this uh, let's run this command and yes everything is imported now let's load the data that I have shown you earlier the data is available now and let's run this uh, thing that is uh, the first 50 records yeah remember that um, yeah so that's the data that is available if if you just want uh, another view uh, another view of the data that's the data file which is COVID-19 file and it has observation date province country last update confirmed to date death to date and recover to date for each country and for each province individually okay great so that's what uh, we have now what we can do is 
Now let's drop the serial numbers and last update uh, using in place that we and rename the columns that we did already in a previous video as well. Uh, let's convert the date into the pandas built-in date uh, frame. Okay, let's uh, use the scikit-learn imputer, uh, sklearn imputer uh, using the constant strategy. There are a lot of strategies there. Let's use a constant strategy. And this pd dot data frame uh, impute dot fit transform that will help uh, imputing all the missing values with a constant strategy imputer. So that's there. Okay, next let's apply this group by command and group all the all the records using country for each country and for all the dates. Let's sum all the records. Let's sum all the values of recovered deaths and confirmed. Um, using this but now let's first country and then all its state then the second country then all its states and so on uh, we have seen that in one of our previous videos just running that again just for a double check so that's what the data state is so country one all its states country two all its states so this country has a lot of dates then another country and so on next let's see how many countries are there uh, in total how many unique countries are there so what I, what I do is I find the column, I, I actually pick the column with country and call a unique function on that. And that gives me all the countries without repetition. And I just compute the length. Length of countries tell me how many unique countries are there in this uh, data file. There are 171 countries. So um, now my goal is for each country, I want to see what is the trend of uh, with respect to the date as the date is moving from the first day till 16th of March? What is the trend of uh, death uh, patients? What is the trend of recovered patients? And what is the uh, trend of confirmed patients as the date moves on? So because we have 171 countries, so let's loop over each country again. Again and again, let's loop over. What we do is for IDX in the range of uh, this, that's a loop, you remember that. And what I do is let's find out the indices where the country is like this. Let's find out the index, all the indices where the country is like that. Then what I do, I make a scatter plot that uh, with starting from this and that, I just pick the confirmed cases and all the confirmed cases for this one country, I just pick those and I plot, I do that using this scatter plot. Then I use another scatter plot just to get all the conf recovered cases. Then I do another scatter plot to get all the death um, uh, cases. And then the title of the uh, title of my um, figure becomes the country name. The X label is the days uh, days since the first suspect. The Y label is the total number of cases. The legend command actually will be there that will show what eat that is. So these kind of labels that are we writing here, they will appear in the figure. Then we force them to show that in each iteration, show the show the for. So this will show uh, the trends of confirms, recovers, and deaths for all uh, 171 countries one by one. So if we run this command, we'll be having 171 plots in front of us. Let's see all of those one by one. So, yeah, so this is for the country. It has just one such thing. This is for that. This is for Afghanistan. As days moves on, the confirmed cases that are written in blue, they are moving up. These are the number of cases. These are the number of days since the first day. And the green is the number of recovered cases. For Albania, that's the trend. For Algeria, that's the trend. I mean, these are each and everything is a separate that is for Argentina, that is for America. This is for America till the 16th March, by the way. Uh, today, um, the news says that America is really in a uh, dangerous position. Anyways, that's for Australia till till the date we have the data. That is for Austria. Um, yeah, so these are all the trends for all the countries. You see, I mean, the matplotlib, how powerful that is. Uh, although I walked through this code very quickly, but uh, you, you can see this video again and again and check how that happens. Uh, yeah, so that's what uh, this is for Finland. Oh, Finland is also in trouble. So France, okay. Hmm. So that is for Germany and yeah. 
So all the countries that are available in data set, they have these kind of plots. Uh, this is for Hong Kong, and this is for India, and this is for Italy, so Italy is, uh, yeah. So that's it. So that is for uh, each country individually. What if we want um, the overall trend or the overall confirm and the deaths and the recover trend for all the world together? So what I do is I pick, I group all the data with date. So I pick the first date and add all the records, then the second date for all the records for all the countries and so on. And then I plot the trend using the scatter plot again, confirm, recover, and that's for all over the world and see the trend where the world is moving. So that's the trend of the world. Um, as the days are going on, these are the death trend. That's a recovery trend and that's a confirmation trend that is moving on. Um, although I, I walk through over this notebook, the notebook will be available to you. Uh, I walk over this notebook very quickly, but um, the goal was really to show you the, the I, I mean, that was a file, um, may not be that informative if you see that in Excel, but now it makes much more sense when you see these plots, you know what is happening and you have an insight in the data. And later on, we may, we may want to predict, we may want to make predictions and the next date, what is going to happen, we may, we may want to predict using this plot or using some machine learning library like scikit-learn or, or TensorFlow or something like that. Okay, so um, that's it. Um, I, I can talk much more about Pandas, NumPy, uh, Matplotlib, uh, there are so many other data science packages, very important packages. One of those is sklearn. Uh, we, we can, that is for machine learning, basic machine learning. Then there are other packages like TensorFlow for deep learning, PyTorch for deep learning. There are a lot of packages with a lot of specialities in data science and stuff. I just discussed a few of those, the most important of those to, to manipulate the data, to make predictions, to make classification or regressions. Uh, for uh, one one way is to go to sklearn or scikit-learn and if the data is huge and you have a lot of lot amount of data and you have good expertise over deep learning then you should go to either tensorflow or pytorch these are the python packages that are available for predictions classification regression and a lot more but either way whether you are going to use scikit-learn whether you are going to use um, tensorflow or pytorch uh, either way, you have to use Pandas, NumPy, and, and sometimes Matplotlib to pre-process the data and to make the data ready for, for these kind of libraries to, to perform predictions, um, either, either in the form of classification or in the form of regression. So, um, so, so this whole course was about, uh, for, for beginners um, who, want to, who want to learn Python, uh, specifically, uh, I, I discussed a lot about uh, the in, in, a lot about Python in general. Then, uh, then, then I spent some time, uh, not a lot amount of time, sometimes on exploring the the data science packages as well. Um, but I mean, there is no end. We can explore more. We can talk about the the packages more. We can talk about other features of Python more a lot of, uh, I mean, input formatting, output formatting, modules, packages, uh, standard template library, um, um, file handling, internet access, database. Uh, I mean, this is a whole universe. I have discussed a few things for beginners, uh, but, but these few things were very carefully selected for data scientists. Um, the if, if you have this course available to you as you have gone through all the course, you now have a very, very good understanding and now you can you can move towards further advanced uh, courses towards data science and you will be ready to implement the concepts in Python using, using the packages I have discussed so far. So um, I thank you all and good luck.